These works are classified public domain works in the USA. These works may or may not be in the public domain in your particular country. Spend a little time familiarizing yourself with the public domain laws of your particular country before using or listening to this work, and be sure to understand how you can use public domain materials in your own life. Cobbett's advice to young men. And, incidentally, to young women, in the middle and higher ranks of life. In a series of letters, addressed to a youth, a bachelor, a lover, a husband, a father, a citizen, or a subject. By William Cobbett. From the edition of, London Henry Friday Oxford, Horace Hart Printer to the University. Introduction. It is the duty, and ought to be the pleasure, of age and experience to warn and instruct youth and to come to the aid of an experience. When sailors have discovered rocks or breakers, and have had the good luck to escape with life from amidst them, they, unless they be pirates or barbarians as well as sailors, point out the spots for the placing of poison of lights, in order that others may not be exposed to the danger which they have so narrowly escaped. What man of common humanity, having, by good luck, missed being engulfed in a quiet mire or quicksand, will withhold from his neighbors a knowledge of the peril without which the dangerous spots are not to be approached. The great effect which correct opinions and sound principles, imbibed in early life, together with the good conduct, at that age, which must naturally result from such opinions and principles, the great effect which these have on the whole course of our lives is, and must be, well known to every man of common observation. How many of us, arrived at only forty years, have to repent, nay, which of us has not to repent, or has not had to repent, that he did not, at an earlier age, possess a great stock of knowledge of that kind which has an immediate effect on our personal ease and happiness, that kind of knowledge, upon which the cheerfulness and the harmony of our homes depend. It is to communicate a stock of this sort of knowledge, in particular, that this work is intended, knowledge, indeed, relative to education, to many sciences, to trade, agriculture, horticulture, law, government, and religion, knowledge relating, incidentally, to all these, but, the main object is to furnish that sort of knowledge to the young which but few men acquire until they be old, when it comes too late to be useful. To communicate to others the knowledge that I possess has always been my taste and my delight, and few, who know anything of my progress through life, will be disposed to question my fitness for the task. Talk of rocks and breakers and quagmires and quicksands, who has ever escaped from amidst so many as I have. Thrown, by my own will, indeed, on the white world at a very early age, not more than eleven or twelve years, without money to support, without friends to advise, and without book learning to assist me, passing a few years dependent solely on my own labor for my subsistence, then becoming a common soldier and leading a military life, chiefly in foreign parts, for eight years, quitting that life after really, for me, high promotion, and with, for me, a large sum of money, marrying at an early age, going at once to France to acquire the French language, thence to America, passing eight years there, becoming bookseller and author, and taking a prominent part in all the important discussions of the interesting period from to, during which there was, in that country, a continued struggle carried on between the English and the French parties, conducting myself, in the ever active part which I took in that struggle, in such a way as to call forth marks of unequivocal approbation from the government at home. Returning to England and, resuming my labors here, suffering, during these twenty-nine years, two years of imprisonment, heavy fines, three years self-banishment to the other side of the Atlantic, and a total breaking of fortune, so as to be left without a bed to lie on, and, during these twenty-nine years of troubles and of punishments, writing and publishing, every week of my life, whether in exile or not, eleven weeks only excepted, a periodical paper, containing more or less of matter. Worthy of public attention, writing and publishing, during the same twenty-nine years, a grammar of the French and another of the English language, a work on the economy of the cottage, a work on forest trees and woodlands, a work on gardening, an account of America, a book of sermons, a work on the corn plant, a history of the Protestant Reformation, all books of great and continued sale, and the last unquestionably the book of greatest circulation in the whole world, the Bible only excepted. Having during these same twenty-nine years of troubles and embarrassments without number, introduced into England the manufacture of straw plat, also several valuable trees, having introduced, during the same twenty-nine years, the cultivation of the corn plant, so manifestly valuable as a source of food, having, during the same period, always, whether in exile or not, sustained a shop of some size, in London, having, during the whole of the same period, never employed less, on an average, than ten persons, in some capacity or other, exclusive of printers, bookbinders, and others, connected with papers and books, and having, during these twenty-nine years of troubles, embarrassments, prisons, fines, and banishments, bred up a family of seven children to man's and woman's state. If such a man be not, after he has survived and accomplished all this, qualified to give advice to young men, no man is qualified for that task. There may have been natural genius, but genius alone, not all the genius in the world, could, without something more, have conducted me through these perils. During these twenty-nine years, I have had for deadly and ever watchful foes, a government that has the collecting and distributing of sixty millions of pounds in a year, and also every soul who shares in that distribution. Until very lately, I have had, for the far greater part of the time, the whole of the press is my deadly enemy. Yet, at this moment, it will not be pretended, that there is another man in the kingdom, who has so many cordial friends. For as to the friends of ministers and the great, the friendship is towards the power, the influence, it is, in fact, towards those taxes, of which so many thousands are giving to get at a share. And, if we could, through so thick a veil, come at the naked fact, we should find the subscription, now going on in Dublin for the purpose of erecting a monument in that city, to commemorate the good recently done, or alleged to be done, to Ireland, by the Duke of Wellington, we should find, that the subscribers have the taxes in view, and that, if the monument shall actually be raised, it ought to have selfishness, and not gratitude, engraven on its face. Nearly the same may be said with regard to all the praises that we hear bestowed on men in power. The friendship which is felt towards me is pure and disinterested, it is not founded in any hope that the parties can have, that they can ever profit from professing it, it is founded on the gratitude which they entertain for the good that I have done them, and, of this sort of friendship, and friendship so cordial, no man ever possessed a larger portion. Now, mere genius will not acquire this for a man. There must be something more than genius, there must be industry, there must be perseverance, there must be, before the eyes of the nation, proofs of extraordinary exertion, people must say to themselves, what wise conduct must there have been in the employing of the time of this man? How sober, how sparing in diet, how early riser, how little expensive he must have been. These are the things, and not genius, which have caused my labors to be so incessant and so successful, and, though I do not affect to believe, that every young man, who shall read this work, will become able to perform labors of equal magnitude and importance, I do pretend, that every young man, who will attend to my advice, will become able to perform a great deal more than men generally do perform, whatever may be his situation in life, and, that he will, too, perform it with greater ease, and satisfaction than he would, without the advice, be able to perform the smaller portion. I have had, from thousands of young men, and men advanced in years also, letters of thanks for the great benefit which they have derived from my labors. Some have thanked me for my grammars, some for my cottage economy, others for the woodlands and the gardener, and, in short, for every one of my works have I received letters of thanks from numerous persons, of whom I had never heard before. In many cases I have been told, that, if the parties had had my books to read some years before, the gain to them, whether in time or in other things, would have been very great. Many, and a great many, have told me, that, the long at school, and though their parents had paid for their being taught English grammar, or French, they had, in a short time, learned more from my books, on those subjects, than they had learned, in years, from their teachers. How many gentlemen have thanked me, in the strongest terms, for my woodlands and gardener, observing, just as Lord Bacon had observed in his time, that they had before seen no books, on these subjects, that they could understand. But, I know not of anything that ever gave me more satisfaction than I derived from the visit of a gentleman of fortune, whom I had never heard of before, and who, about four years ago, came to thank me in person for a complete reformation, which had been worked in his son by the reading of my two sermons on drinking and on gaming. I have, therefore, done, already, a great deal in this way, but, there is still wanting, in a compact form, a body of advice such as
And, when we consider in how great a degree the happiness of all the remainder of a man's life depends, and always must depend, on his taste and judgment in the character of a lover, this may well be considered as the most important period of the whole term of his existence. In my address to the husband, I shall, of course, introduce advice relative to the important duties of masters and servants, duties of great importance, whether considered as affecting families or as affecting the community. In my address to the citizen or subject, I shall consider all the reciprocal duties of the governors and the governed, and also the duties which man owes to his neighbor. It would be tedious to attempt to lay down rules for conduct exclusively applicable to every distinct calling, profession, and condition of life, but, under the above described heads, will be conveyed every species of advice of which I deem the utility to be unquestionable. I have thus fully described the nature of my little work, and, before I enter on the first letter, I venture to express a hope that its good effects will be felt long after its author shall have ceased to exist. Letter I. To the youth. You are now arrived at that age which the law thinks sufficient to make an oath, taken by you, valid in a court of law. Let us suppose from fourteen to nearly twenty, and, reserving, for a future occasion, my remarks on your duty towards parents, let me here offer you my advice as to the means likely to contribute largely towards making you a happy man, useful to all about you, and an honor to those from whom you sprang. Start, I beseech you, with a conviction firmly fixed on your mind, that you have no right to live in this world, that, being of hale body and sound mind, you have no right to any earthly existence, without doing work of some sort or other, unless you have ample fortune whereon to lie clear of debt, and, that even in that case, you have no right to breed children, to be kept by others, or to be exposed to the chance of being so kept. Start with this conviction thoroughly implanted on your mind. To wish to live on the labor of others is, besides the folly of it, to contemplate a fraud at the least, and, under certain circumstances, to meditate oppression and robbery. I suppose you in the middle rank of life. Happiness ought to be your great object, and it is to be found only in independence. Turn your back on Whitehall and on Somerset House, leave the customs in excise to the feeble and low-minded, look not for success to favor, to partiality, to friendship, or to what is called interest, write it on your heart, that you will depend solely on your own merit and your own exertions. Think not, neither, of any of those situations where gaudy abilments and sounding titles poorly disguise from the eyes of good sense the mortifications and the heartache of slaves. Answer me not by saying that these situations must be filled by somebody, for, if I were to admit the truth of the proposition, which I do not, it would remain for you to show that they are conducive to happiness, the contrary of which has been proved to me by the observation of a now pretty long life. Indeed, reason tells us that it must be thus, for that which a man owes to favor or to partiality, that same favor or partiality is constantly liable to take from him. He who lives upon anything except his own labor is incessantly surrounded by rivals, his grand resources that servility in which he is always liable to be surpassed. He is in daily danger of being outbidden, his very bread depends upon caprice, and he lives in a state of uncertainty and never ceasing fear. This is not, indeed, the dog's life, hunger, and idleness, but it is worse, for it is idleness with slavery, the latter being the just price of the former. Slaves frequently are well fed and well clad, but slaves dare not speak, they dare not be suspected to think differently from their masters, hate his acts as much as they may, be he tyrant, be he drunkard, be he fool, or be he all three at once, they must be silent, or, nine times out of ten, affect approbation, though possessing a thousand times his knowledge, they must feign a conviction of his superior understanding, though knowing that it is they who, in fact, do all that he is paid for. Doing, it is destruction to them to seem as if they thought any portion of the service belonged to them. Far from me be the thought, that any youth who shall read this page would not rather perish than submit to live in a state like this. Such a state is fit only for the refuse of nature, the halt, the half-blind, the unhappy creatures whom nature has marked out for degradation. And how comes it, then, that we see and even clever youths voluntarily bending their necks to the slavery, nay, pressing forward in eager rivalship to assume the yoke that ought to be insupportable? The cause, and the only cause, is, that the deleterious fashion of the day has created so many artificial wants, and has raised the minds of young men so much above their real rank and state of life, that they look scornfully on the employment, the fare, and the dress, that would become them, and, in order to avoid the state in which they might live free and happy, they become showy slaves. The great source of independence, the French express in a precept of three words, vivre de poo, which I have always very much admired. To live upon little is the great security against slavery, and this precept extends to dress and other things besides food and drink. When Dr. Johnson wrote his dictionary, he put in the word pensioner thus, pensionary slave of state. After this he himself became a pensioner. And thus, agreeably to his own definition, he lived and died a slave of state. What must this man of great genius, and of great industry too, have felt at receiving this pension? Could he be so callous as not to feel a pang upon seeing his own name placed before his own degrading definition? And what could induce him to submit to this? His wants, his artificial wants, his habit of indulging in the pleasures of the table, his disregard of the precept fever de poo. This was the cause, and, be it observed, that indulgences of this sort, while they tend to make men poor and expose them to commit mean acts, tend also to enfeeble the body, and more especially to cloud and to weaken the mind. When this celebrated author wrote his dictionary, he had not been debased by luxurious enjoyments, the rich and powerful had not caressed him into a slave, his writings then bore the stamp of truth and independence, but, having been debased by luxury, he who had, while content with plain fare, been the strenuous advocate of the rights of the people, became a strenuous advocate for taxation without representation, and, in a work under the title of Taxation No Tyranny, defended, and greatly, assisted to produce, that unjust and bloody war which finally severed from England the great country the United States of America, now the most powerful and dangerous rival that this kingdom ever had. The statue of Dr. Johnson was the first that was put into S.T. Paul's Church. A signal warning to us not to look upon monuments in honor of the dead is a proof of their virtues, for here we see S.T. Paul's Church holding up to the veneration of posterity a man whose own writings, together with the records of the pension list, prove him to have been a slave of state. Endless are the instances of men of bright parts and high spirit having been, by degrees, rendered powerless and despicable, by their imaginary wants. Seldom has there been a man with a fairer prospect of accomplishing great things and of acquiring lasting renown, than Charles Fox, he had great talents of the most popular sort, the times were singularly favorable to an exertion of them with success, a large part of the nation admired him and were his partisans, he had, as to the great question between him and his rival, pit, reason, and justice clearly on his side, but he had against him his squandering and luxurious habits, these made him. Dependent on the rich part of his partisans, made his wisdom subservient to opulent folly or selfishness, deprived his country of all the benefit that it might have derived from his talents, and, finally, sent him to the grave without a single sigh from a people, a great part of whom would, in his earlier years, have wept at his death as at a national calamity. Extravagance in dress, in the haunting of playhouses, in horses, in everything else, is to be avoided, and, in youths and young men, extravagance in dress particularly. This sort of extravagance, this waste of money on the decoration of the body, arises solely from vanity, and from vanity of the most contemptible sort. It arises from the notion that all the people in the street, for instance, will be looking at you as soon as you walk out, and that they will, in a greater or less degree, think the better of you on account of your fine dress. Never was notion more false. All the sensible people that happen to see you will think nothing at all about you. Those who are filled with the same vain notion as you are will perceive your attempt to impose on them and will despise you accordingly. Rich people will wholly disregard you, and you will be envied and hated by those who have the same vanity that you have without the means of gratifying it. Dress should be suited to your rank and station. A surgeon or physician should not dress like a carpenter. But there is no reason why a tradesman, a merchant's clerk, or clerk of any kind, or why a shopkeeper or manufacturer, or even a merchant, no reason at all why any of these should dress in an expensive manner. It is a great mistake to suppose that they derive any advantage from exterior decoration. Men are estimated by other men according to their capacity and willingness to be in some way or other useful, and though, with the foolish and vain part of women, fine clothes frequently do something, yet the greater part of the sex are much too penetrating to draw their conclusion solely from the outside show of a man, they
The great misfortune of the present day is, that everyone is, in his own estimate, raised above his real state of life, everyone seems to think himself entitled, if not to title and great estate, at least to live without work. This mischievous, this most destructive, way of thinking has, indeed, been produced, like almost all our other evils, by the acts of our septennial and unreformed parliament. That body, by its acts, has caused an enormous debt to be created, and, in consequence, a prodigious sum to be raised annually in taxes. It has caused, by these means, a race of lowmongers and stock jobbers to arise. These carry on a species of gaming, by which some make fortunes in a day, and others, in a day, become beggars. The unfortunate gamesters, like the purchasers of blanks in the lottery, are never heard of, but the fortunate ones become companions for lords, and some of them lords themselves. We have, within these few years, seen many of these gamesters get fortunes of a quarter of a million in a few days, and then we have heard them, though notoriously amongst the lowest and basest of human creatures, called honorable gentlemen. In such a state of things, who is to expect patient industry, laborious study, frugality, and care, who, in such a state of things, is to expect these to be employed in pursuit of that competence which it is the laudable wish of all men to secure? Not long ago a man, who had served his time to a tradesman in London, became, instead of pursuing his trade, a stock jobber, or gambler, and, in about two years, drove his coach and four, had his townhouse and country house, and visited, and was visited by, peers of the highest rank. A fellow apprentice of this lucky gambler, though a tradesman in excellent business, seeing no earthly reason why he should not have his coach and four also, turned his stock and trade into a stake for the change, but, alas, at the end of a few months, instead of being in a coach and four, he was in the Gazette. This is one instance out of hundreds of thousands, not, indeed, exactly of the same description, but all rising from the same copious source. The words speculate and speculation have been substituted for gambling and gambling. The hatefulness of the pursuit is thus taken away, and, while taxes to the amount of more than double the whole of the rental of the kingdom, while these cause such crowds of idlers, every one of whom calls himself a gentleman, and avoids the appearance of working for his bread, while this is the case, who is to wonder, that a great part of the youth of the country, knowing themselves to be as good, as learned, and as well-bred as these gentlemen, who is to wonder, that they think, that they, also ought to be considered as gentlemen. Then, the late war, also the work of the septennial parliament, has left us, amongst its many legacies, such swarms of titled men and women, such swarms of serfs and their ladies, men and women who, only the other day, were the fellow apprentices, fellow tradesmen, or farmers' sons and daughters, or indeed, the fellow servants, of those who are now in these several states of life, the late septennial parliament war has left us such swarms of these, that it is no wonder that the heads of young people are turned, and that they are ashamed of that state of life to act their part well in which ought to be their delight. But, though the cause of the evil is an acts of the septennial parliament, though this universal desire in people to be thought to be above their station, though this arises from such acts, and, though it is no wonder that young men are thus turned from patient study and labor, though these things be undoubted, they form no reason why I should not warn you against becoming a victim to this national scourge. For, in spite of every art made use of to avoid labor, the taxes will, after all, maintain only so many idlers. We cannot all be knights and gentlemen, there must be a large part of us, after all, to make and mend clothes and houses, and carry on trade and commerce, and, in spite of all that we can do, the far greater part of us must actually work at something, for, unless we can get at some of the taxes, we fall under the sentence of holy writ, he who will not work shall not eat. Yet, so strong is the propensity to be thought gentlemen, so general is this desire amongst the youth of this formerly laborious and unassuming nation, a nation famed for its pursuit of wealth through the channels of patience, punctuality, and integrity, a nation famed for its love of solid acquisitions and qualities, and its hatred of everything showy and false, so general is this really fraudulent desire amongst the youth of this now speculating nation, that thousands upon thousands of them are, at this moment, in a state of half starvation, not so much because they are too lazy to earn their bread, as because they are too proud. And what are the consequences? Such a youth remains or becomes a burden to his parents, of whom he ought to be the comfort, if not the support. Always aspiring to something higher than he can reach, his life is a life of disappointment and of shame. If marriage befall him, it is a real affliction, involving others as well as himself. His lot is a thousand times worse than that of the common laboring pauper. Nineteen times out of twenty a premature death awaits him, and, alas, how numerous are the cases in which the death is most miserable, not to say ignominious. Stupid pride is one of the symptoms of madness. Of the two madmen mentioned in Don Quixote, one thought himself Neptune, and the other Jupiter. Shakespeare agrees with Cervantes, for, Mad Tom, in King Lear, being asked who he is, answers, I am a tailor run mad with pride. How many have we heard of, who claim relationship with noblemen and kings, while of not a few each has thought himself the son of God? To the public journals, and to the observations of everyone, nay, to the county lunatic asylums, things never heard of in England till now, I appeal for the fact of the vast and hideous increase of madness in this country, and, within these very few years, how many scores of young men, who, if their minds had been unperverted by the gambling principles of the day, had a probably long and happy life before them, who had talent, personal endowments, love of parents, love of friends, admiration of large circles, who had, in short, everything to make life desirable, and who, from mortified pride, founded on false pretensions, have put an end to their own existence. As to drunkenness and gluttony, generally so called, these are vices so nasty and beastly that I deem anyone capable of indulging in them to be wholly unworthy of my advice, and, if any youth unhappily initiated in these odious and debasing vices should happen to read what I am now writing, I refer him to the command of God, conveyed to the Israelites by Moses, in Deuteronomy, chapter XXI. The father and mother are to take the bad son and bring him to the elders of the city, and they shall say to the elders, This our son will not obey our voice, he is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of the city shall stone him with stones, that he die. I refer downright beastly gluttons and drunkards to this, but indulgence short, far short, of this gross and really nasty drunkenness and gluttony is to be deprecated, and that, too, with the more earnestness because it is too often looked upon as being no crime at all, and as having nothing blameable in it. Nay, there are many persons who pride themselves on their refined taste in matters connected with eating and drinking, so far from being ashamed of employing their thoughts on the subject. It is their boast that they do it. S. T. Gregory, one of the Christian fathers, says, it is not the quantity or the quality of the meat, or drink, but the love of it that is condemned, that is to say, the indulgence beyond the absolute demands of nature, the hankering after it, the neglect of some duty or other for the sake of the enjoyments of the table. This love of what are called good eating and drinking, if very unamiable and grown-up persons, is perfectly hateful in a youth, and, if he indulge in the propensity, he is already half-ruined. To warn you against acts of fraud, robbery, and violence, is not my province, that is the business of those who make and administer the law. I am not talking to you against acts which the jailer and the hangman punish, nor against those moral offenses which all men condemn, but against indulgences, which, by men in general, are deemed not only harmless, but meritorious, but which the observation of my whole life has taught me to regard as destructive to human happiness, and against which all ought to be cautioned even in their boyish days. I have been a great observer, and I can truly say, that I have never known a man, fond of good eating and drinking, as it is called, that I have never known such a man, and hundreds I have known, who was worthy of respect. Such indulgences are, in the first place, very expensive. The materials are costly, and the preparation still more so. What a monstrous thing, that, in order to satisfy the appetite of a man, there must be a person or two at work every day. More fuel, culinary implements, kitchen room, what? All these merely to tickle the palate of four or five people, and especially people who can hardly pay their way. And, then, the loss of time, the time spent in pleasing the palate, it is truly horrible to behold people who ought to be at work, sitting, at the three meals, not less than three of the about fourteen hours that they are out of their beds. A youth, habituated to this sort of indulgence, cannot be valuable to any employer. Such a youth cannot be deprived of his table enjoyments on any account, his eating and drinking form the momentous
In short, a youth thus pampered is worth nothing as a person to be employed in business. And, as to friends and acquaintances, they will say nothing to you, they will offer you indulgences under their roofs, but the more ready you are to accept of their offers, and, in fact, the better taste you discover, the less they will like you, and the sooner they will find means of shaking you off, for, besides the cost which you occasion them, people do not like to have critics sitting in judgment on their bottles and dishes. Water drinkers are universally laughed at, but, it has always seemed to me, that they are amongst the most welcome of guests, and that, too, though the host be by no means of a at, dollar number at dollar at, at turn. The truth is, they give no trouble, they occasion no anxiety to please them, they are sure not to make their sittings inconveniently long, and, which is the great thing of all, their example teaches moderation to the rest of the company. Your notorious lovers of good cheer are, on the contrary, not to be invited without due reflection, to entertain one of them is a serious business, and as people are not apt voluntarily to undertake such pieces of business, the well-known lovers of good eating and drinking are left, very generally, to enjoy it by themselves and at their own expense. But, all other considerations aside, health, the most valuable of all earthly possessions, and without which all the rest are worth nothing, bids us, not only to refrain from excess in eating and drinking, but bids us to stop short of what might be indulged in without any apparent impropriety. The words of Ecclesiastes ought to be read once a week by every young person in the world, and particularly by the young people of this country at this time. Eat modestly that which is set before thee, and devour not, lest thou be hated. When thou sittest amongst many, reach not thine hand out first of all. How little is sufficient for man well taught? A wholesome sleep cometh of a temperate belly. Such a man riseth up in the morning, and is well at ease with himself. Be not too hasty of meats, for excess of meats bringeth sickness, and cholera disease cometh of gluttony. By surfeit have many perished, and he that dieteth himself prolongeth his life. Show not thy valiantness in wine, for wine hath destroyed many. Wine measurably taken, and in season bringeth gladness and cheerfulness of mind, but drinking with excess make bitterness of mind, brawlings and scoldings. How true are these words? How well worthy of a constant place in our memories? Yet, what pains have been taken to apologize for a life contrary to these precepts? And, good God, what punishment can be too great, what mark of infamy sufficiently signal, for those pernicious villains of talent, who have employed the talent in the composition of Bacchanalian songs, that is to say, pieces of fine and captivating writing in praise of one of the most odious and destructive vices in the black catalogue of human depravity. In the passage which I have just quoted from chapter XXXI of Ecclesiasticus, it is said, that wine, measurably taken, and in season, is a proper thing. This, and other such passages of the Old Testament, have given a handle to drunkards, and to extravagant people, to insist, that God intended that wine should be commonly drunk. No doubt of that. But, then, he could intend this only in countries in which he had given wine, and to which he had given no cheaper drink except water. If it be said, as it truly may, that, by the means of the sea and the wines, he has given wine to all countries, I answer that this gift is of no use to us now, because our government steps in between the sea and the wines in us. Formerly, indeed, the case was different, and, here I am about to give you, incidentally, a piece of historical knowledge, which you will not have acquired from Hume, Goldsmith, or any other of the romancers called historians. Before that unfortunate event, the Protestant Reformation, as it is called, took place, the price of red wine, in England, was fourpence a gallon, Winchester measure, and of white wine, sixpence a gallon. At the same time the pay of a laboring man per day, as fixed by law, was fourpence. Now, when a laboring man could earn four quarts of good wine in a day, it was, doubtless, allowable, even in England, for people in the middle rank of life to drink wine rather commonly, and, therefore, in those happy days of England, these passages of scripture were applicable enough. But, now, when we have got a Protestant government, which by the taxes which it makes people pay to it, causes the eighth part of a gallon of wine to cost more than the pay of a laboring man per day, now, this passage of scripture is not applicable to us. There is no season in which we can take wine without ruining ourselves, however measurably we may take it, and I beg you to regard, as perverters of scripture and as seducers of youth, all those who cite passages like that above cited, in justification of, or as an apology for, the practice of wine drinking in England. I beseech you to look again and again at, and to remember every word of, the passage which I have just quoted from the book of Ecclesiasticus. How completely have been, and are, its words verified by my experience and in my person. How little of eating and drinking is sufficient for me. How wholesome is my sleep. How early do I rise, and how well at ease am I with myself. I should not have deserved such blessings, if I had withheld from my neighbors a knowledge of the means by which they were obtained, and, therefore, this knowledge I have been in the constant habit of communicating. When one gives a dinner to a company, it is an extraordinary affair, and is intended, by sensible men, for purposes other than those of eating and drinking. But, in general, in the everyday life, despicable are those who suffer any part of their happiness to depend upon what they have to eat or to drink, provided they have a sufficiency of wholesome food, despicable is the man, and worse than despicable the youth, that would make any sacrifice, however small, whether of money or of time, or of anything else, in order to secure a dinner different from that which he would have had without such sacrifice. Who, what man, ever performed a greater quantity of labor than I have performed? What man ever did so much? Now, in a great measure, I owe my capability to perform this labor to my disregard of dainties. Being shut up two years in Newgate, with a fine on my head of a thousand pounds to the king, for having expressed my indignation at the flogging of Englishmen under a guard of German bayonets, I ate, during one whole year, one mutton chop every day. Being once in town, with one son, then a little boy, and a clerk, while my family was in the country, I had during some weeks nothing but legs of mutton, first day, leg of mutton boiled or roasted, second, cold, third, hashed, then, leg of mutton boiled, and so on. When I have been by myself, or nearly so, I have always proceeded thus, given directions for having every day the same thing, or alternately as above, and every day exactly at the same hour, so as to prevent the necessity of any talk about the matter. I am certain that, upon an average, I have not, during my life, spent more than thirty-five minutes a day at table, including all the meals of the day. I like, and I take care to have, good and clean victuals, but, if wholesome and clean, that is enough. If I find it, by chance, too coarse for my appetite, I put the food aside, or let somebody do it, and leave the appetite to gather keenness. But the great security of all is, to eat little, and to drink nothing that intoxicates. He that eats till he is full is little better than a beast, and he that drinks till he is drunk is quite a beast. Before I dismiss this affair of eating and drinking, let me beseech you to resolve to free yourselves from the slavery of the tea and coffee and other slop kettle, if, unhappily, you have been bred up in such slavery. Experience has taught me, that those slops are injurious to health, until I left them off, having taken to them at the age of, even my habits of sobriety, moderate eating, early rising, even these were not, until I left off the slops, sufficient to give me the complete health which I have since had. I pretend not to be a doctor, but, I assert, that to pour regularly, every day, a pint or two of warm liquid matter down the throat, whether under the name of tea, coffee, soup, grog, or whatever else, is greatly injurious to health. However, at present, what I have to represent to you is the great deduction, which the use of these slops makes, from your power of being useful, and also from your power to husband your income, whatever it may be, and from whatever source arising. I am to suppose you to be desirous to become a clever and a useful man, a man to be, if not admired and revered, at least to be respected. In order to merit respect beyond that which is due to very common men, you must do something more than very common men, and I am now going to show you how your course must be impeded by the use of these slops. If the women exclaim, nonsense. Come and take a cup, take it for that once, but hear what I have to say. In answer to my representation regarding the waste of time which is occasioned by the slops, it has been said, that let what may be the nature of the food, there must be time for taking it. Not so much time, however, to eat a bit of meat or cheese or butter with a bit of bread. But, these may be eaten in a shop, a warehouse, a factory, far from any fire, and even in a carriage on the road. The slops absolutely demand fire in a congregation, so that,
You could get this lodging for several shillings a week less than another at the next door, but there they keep a servant, who will get you your breakfast, and preserve you, benevolent creature as she is, from the cruel necessity of going to the cupboard and cutting off a slice of meat or cheese and a bit of bread. She will, most likely, toast your bread for you too, and melt your butter, and then muffle you up, in winter, and send you out almost swaddled. Really such a thing can hardly be expected ever to become a man. You are weak, you have delicate health, you are bilious. Why, my good fellow, it is these very slops that make you weak and bilious, and, indeed, the poverty, the real poverty, that they in their concomitants bring on you, greatly assists, in more ways than one, in producing your delicate health. So much for indulgences in eating, drinking, and dress. Next, as to amusements. It is recorded of the famous Alfred, that he devoted eight hours of the twenty-four to labor, eight to rest, and eight to recreation. He was, however, a king, and could be thinking during the eight hours of recreation. It is certain, that there ought to be hours of recreation, and I do not know that eight are too many, but, then observe, those hours ought to be well chosen, and the sort of recreation ought to be attended to. It ought to be such as is at once innocent in itself and in its tendency, and not injurious to health. The sports of the field are the best of all, because they are conducive to health, because they are enjoyed by daylight, and because they demand early rising. The nearer that other amusements approach to these, the better they are. A town life, which many persons are compelled, by the nature of their calling, to lead, precludes the possibility of pursuing amusements of this description to any very considerable extent, and young men in towns are, generally speaking, compelled to choose between books on the one hand, or gaming in the playhouse on the other. Dancing is at once rational and helpful, it gives animal spirits, it is the natural amusement of young people, and such it has been from the days of Moses, it is enjoyed in numerous companies, it makes the parties to be pleased with themselves and with all about them, it has no tendency to excite base and malignant feelings, and none but the most grovelling and hateful tyranny, or the most stupid and despicable fanaticism, ever raised its voice against it. The bad modern habits of England have created one inconvenience attending the enjoyment of this healthy and innocent pastime, namely, late hours, which are at once injurious to health and destructive of order and of industry. In other countries people dance by daylight. Here they do not, and, therefore, you must, in this respect, submit to the custom, though not without robbing the dancing night of as many hours as you can. As to gaming, it is always criminal, either in itself, or in its tendency. The basis of it is covetousness, a desire to take from others something, for which you have given, and intend to give, no equivalent. No gambler was ever yet a happy man, and very few gamblers have escaped being miserable, and, observe, to game for nothing is still gaming, and naturally leads to gaming for something. It is sacrificing time, and that, too, for the worst of purposes. I have kept house for nearly forty years, I have reared a family, I have entertained as many friends as most people, and I have never had cards, dice, a chessboard, nor any implement of gaming, under my roof. The hours that young men spend in this way are hours murdered, precious hours, that ought to be spent either in reading or in writing, or in rest, preparatory to the duties of the dawn. Though I do not agree with the base and nauseous flatterers, who now declare the army to be the best school for statesmen, it is certainly a school in which to learn experimentally many useful lessons, and, in this school I learned, that men, fond of gaming, are very rarely, if ever, trustworthy. I have known many clever men rejected in the way of promotion only because he was addicted to gaming. Men, in that state of life, cannot ruin themselves by gaming, for they possess no fortune, nor money, but the taste for gaming is always regarded as an indication of a radically bad disposition, and I can truly say, that I never in my whole life knew a man, fond of gaming, who was not, in some way or other, a person unworthy of confidence. This vice creeps on by very slow degrees, till, at last, it becomes an ungovernable passion, swallowing up every good and kind feeling of the heart. The gambler, as portrayed by Rignard, in a comedy the translation of which into English resembles the original much about as nearly as Sir James Graham's plagiarisms resembled the registers on which they had been committed, is a fine instance of the contempt and scorn to which gaming at last reduces its votaries, but, if any young man be engaged in this fatal career, and be not yet wholly lost, let him behold Hogarth's gambler just when he has made his last throw and when disappointment has bereft him of his senses. If after this sight he remain obdurate, he is doomed to be a disgrace to his name. The theatre may be a source not only of amusement but also of instruction, but, as things now are in this country, what, that is not bad, is to be learned in this school. In the first place, not a word is allowed to be uttered on the stage, which has not been previously approved of by the Lord Chamberlain, that is to say, by a person appointed by the ministry, who, at his pleasure, allows, or disallows, of any piece, or any words in a piece, submitted to his inspection. In short, those who go to playhouses pay their money to hear uttered such words as the government approve of, and no others. It is now just twenty-six years since I first well understood how this matter was managed, and, from that moment to this, I have never been in an English playhouse. Besides this, the meanness, the abject servility, of the players, and the slavish conduct of the audience, are sufficient to corrupt and debase the heart of any young man who is a frequent beholder of them. Homage is here paid to everyone clothed with power, be who or what he may, real virtue and public spirit are subjects of ridicule, and mock sentiment and mock liberality and mock loyalty are applauded to the skies. Show me a man's companion says the proverb, and I will tell you what the man is, and this is, and must be true, because all men seek the society of those who think and act somewhat like themselves, sober men will not associate with drunkards, frugal men will not like spendthrifts, and the orderly and decent shun the noisy, the disorderly, and the debauched. It is for the very vulgar to herd together as singers, ringers, and smokers, but, there is a class rather higher still more blamable, I mean the tavern haunters, the gay companions, who herd together to do little but talk, and who are so fond of talk that they go from home to get at it. The conversation among such persons has nothing of instruction in it, and is generally of a vicious tendency. Young people naturally and commendably seek the society of those of their own age, but, be careful in choosing your companions, and lay this down as a rule never to be departed from, that no youth, nor man, ought to be called your friend, who is addicted to indecent talk, or who is fond of the society of prostitutes. Either of these are used a depraved taste, and even a depraved heart, an absence of all principle and of all trustworthiness, and, I have remarked it all my life long, that young men, addicted to these vices, never succeed in the end, whatever advantages they may have, whether in fortune or in talent. Fond mothers and fathers are but too apt to be over lenient to such offenders, and, as long as youth lasts and fortune smiles, the punishment is deferred, but, it comes at last, it is sure to come, and the gay and dissolute youth is a dejected and miserable man. After the early part of a life spent in illicit indulgences, a man is unworthy of being the husband of a virtuous woman, and, if he have anything like justice in him, how is he to reprove, in his children, vices in which he himself so long indulged? These vices of youth are varnished over by the saying, that there must be time for sowing the wild oats, and that wildest colts make the best horses. These figurative oats are, however, generally like the literal ones, they are never to be eradicated from the soil, and as to the colts, wildness in them is an indication of high animal spirit, having nothing at all to do with the mind, which is invariably debilitated and debased by profligate indulgences. Yet this miserable piece of sophistry, the offspring of parental weakness, is in constant use, to the incalculable injury of the rising generation. What's so amiable is a steady, trustworthy boy. He is of real use at an early age, he can be trusted far out of the sight of parent or employer, while the pickle, as the poor fond parents call the profligate, is a great deal worse than useless, because there must be someone to see that he does no harm. If you have to choose, choose companions of your own rank in life as nearly as may be, but, at any rate, none to whom you acknowledge inferiority, for, slavery is too soon learned, and, if the mind be bowed down in the youth, it will seldom rise up in the man. In the schools of those best of teachers the Jesuits, there is perfect equality as to rank in life, the boy, who enters there, leaves all family pride behind him, intrinsic merit alone is the standard of preference, and the masters are so scrupulous upon this head, that they do not suffer one scholar, of whatever rank, to have more money to spend than the poorest. These wise men know all the mischiefs that
It is no disgrace, but the contrary, to obey, cheerfully, lawful and just commands. None are so saucy and disobedient as slaves, and, when you come to read history, you will find that in proportion as nations have been free has been their reverence for the laws. But, there is a wide difference between lawful and cheerful obedience and that servility which represents people as laying petitions at the king's feet, which makes us imagine that we behold the supplicants actually crawling upon their bellies. There is something so abject in this expression, there is such horrible self-abasement in it, that I do hope that every youth, who shall read this, will hold in detestation the reptiles who make use of it. In all other countries, the lowest individual can put a petition into the hands of the chief magistrate, be he king or emperor, let us hope, that the time will yet come when Englishmen will be able to do the same. In the meanwhile I beg you to despise these worse than pagan parasites. Hitherto I have addressed you chiefly relative to the things to be avoided, let me now turn to the things which you ought to do. And, first of all, the husbanding of your time. The respect that you will receive, the real and sincere respect, will depend entirely on what you are able to do. If you be rich, you may purchase what is called respect, but it is not worth having. To obtain respect worth possessing, you must, as I observed before, do more than the common run of men in your state of life, and, to be enabled to do this, you must manage well your time, and, to manage it well, you must have as much of the daylight and as little of the candlelight as is consistent with the due discharge of your duties. When people get into the habit of sitting up merely for the purpose of talking, it is no easy matter to break themselves of it, and if they do not go to bed early, they cannot rise early. Young people require more sleep than those that are grown up, there must be the number of hours, and that number cannot well be, on an average, less than eight, and, if it be more in winter time, it is all the better, for, an hour in bed is better than an hour spent over fire and candle in an idle gossip. People never should sit talking till they do not know what to talk about. It is said by the country people, that one hour sleep before midnight is worth more than two or worth after midnight, and this I believe to be a fact, but it is useless to go to bed early and even to rise early, if the time be not well employed after rising. In general, half the morning is loitered away, the party being in a sort of half-dressed, half-naked state, out of bed, indeed, but still in a sort of bedding. Those who first invented morning gowns and slippers could have very little else to do. These things are very suitable to those who have had fortunes gained for them by others, very suitable to those who have nothing to do, and who merely live for the purpose of assisting to consume the produce of the earth, but he who has his bread to earn, or who means to be worthy of respect on account of his labors, has no business with morning gown and slippers. In short, be your business or calling what it may, dress at once for the day, and learn to do it as quickly as possible. A looking glass is a piece of furniture a great deal worse than useless. Looking at the face will not alter its shape or its color, and, perhaps, of all wasted time, none is so foolishly wasted as that which is employed in surveying one's own face. Nothing can be of little importance, if one be compelled to attend to it every day of our lives, if we shave but once a year, or once a month, the execution of the thing would be hardly worth naming, but this is a piece of work that must be done once every day, and, as it may cost only about five minutes of time, and maybe, and frequently is, made to cost thirty, or even fifty minutes, and, as only fifteen minutes make about a fifty-eighth part of the hours of our average daylight, this, being the case, this is a matter of real importance. I once heard Sir Johnson Clare ask Mr. Cochrane Johnstone, whether he mean to have a son of his, then a little boy, taught Latin. No, said Mr. Johnstone, but I mean to do something a great deal better for him. What is that, said Sir John. Why, said the other, teach him to shave with cold water and without a glass. Which, I dare say, he did, and for which benefit I am sure that son has had good reason to be grateful. Only think of the inconvenience attending the common practice. There must be hot water, to have this there must be a fire, and, in some cases, a fire for that purpose alone, to have these, there must be a servant, or you must light a fire yourself. For the want of these, the job is put off until a later hour, this causes a stripping and another dressing bout, or, you go in a slovenly state all that day, and the next day the thing must be done, or cleanliness must be abandoned altogether. If you be on a journey you must wait the pleasure of the servants at the end before you can dress and set out in the morning, the pleasant time for traveling is gone before you can move from the spot, instead of being at the end of your day's journey in good time, you are benighted, and have to endure all the great inconveniences attendant on tardy movements. And, all this, from the apparently insignificant affair of shaving. How many pieces of important business has failed from a short delay? And how many thousand of such delays daily proceed from this unworthy cause? Tudor's pride was the motto of a famous French general, and pray let it be yours, be always ready, and never, during your whole life, have to say, I cannot go till I be shaved and dressed. Do the whole at once for the day, whatever may be your state of life, and then you have a day unbroken by those indispensable performances. Begin thus, in the days of your youth, and, having felt the superiority which this practice will give you over those in all other respects your equals, the practice will stick by you to the end of your life. Till you be shaved and dressed for the day, you cannot set steadily about any business, you know that you must presently quit your labor to return to the dressing affair, you, therefore, put it off until that be over, the interval, the precious interval, is spent in lounging about, and, by the time that you are ready for business, the best part of the day is gone. Trifling as this matter appears upon naming it, it is, in fact, one of the great concerns of life, and, for my part, I can truly say, that I owe more of my great labors to my strict adherence to the precepts that I have here given you, than to all the natural abilities with which I have been endowed, for these, whatever may have been their amount, would have been of comparatively little use, even aided by great sobriety and abstinence, if I had not, in early life, contracted the blessed habit, of husbanding while my time. To this, more than to any other thing, I owed my very extraordinary promotion in the army. I was always ready, if I had to mount guard at ten, I was ready at nine, never did any man, or anything, wait one moment for me. Being, at an age under twenty years, raised from corporal to sergeant major at once, over the heads of thirty sergeants, I naturally should have been an object of envy and hatred, but this habit of early rising and of rigid adherence to the precepts which I have given you, really subdued these passions, because everyone felt, that what I did he had never done, and never could do. Before my promotion, a clerk was wanted to make out the morning report of the regiment. I rendered the clerk unnecessary, and, long before any other man was dressed for the parade, my work for the morning was all done, and I myself was on the parade, walking, in fine weather, for an hour perhaps. My custom was this, to get up, in summer, at daylight, and in winter at four o'clock, shave, dress, even to the putting of my sword belt over my shoulder, and having my sword lying on the table before me, ready to hang by my side. Then I ate a bit of cheese, or pork, and bread. Then I prepared my report, which was filled up as fast as the companies brought me in the materials. After this I had an hour or two to read, before the time came for any duty out of doors, unless when the regiment were part of it went out to exercise in the morning. When this was the case, and the matter was left to me, I always had it on the ground in such time as that the bayonets glistened in the rising sun, a sight which gave me delight, but which I often think, but which I should in vain endeavor to describe. If the officers were to go out, eight or ten o'clock was the hour, sweating the men in the heat of the day, breaking in upon the time for cooking their dinner, putting all things out of order and all men out of humor. When I was commander, the men had a long day of leisure before them, they could ramble into the town or into the woods, go to get raspberries, to catch birds, to catch fish, or to pursue any other recreation, and such of them as chose, and were qualified, to work at their trades. So that here, arising solely from the early habits of one very young man, were pleasant and happy days given to hundreds. Money is said to be power, which is, in some cases, true, and the same may be said of knowledge, but superior sobriety, industry, and activity, are a still more certain source of power, for without these, knowledge is of little use, and, as to the power which money gives, it is that of brute force, it is the power of the bludgeon and the bayonet, and of the bird press, tongue, and pen. Superior sobriety, industry, activity, though accompanied with but a moderate portion of knowledge, command respect, because they have great and visible influence. The drunken, the lazy, and the inert, stand abashed before the sober and the active. Besides, all those whose interests are at stake prefer, of necessity, those whose exertions produce the greatest and most
Men are not to be called ignorant merely because they cannot make upon paper certain marks with a pen, or because they do not know the meaning of such marks when made by others. A plowman may be very learned in his line, though he does not know what the letters P-L-O-U-G-H mean when he sees them combined upon paper. The first thing to be required of a man is, that he understand well his own calling, or profession, and, be you in what state of life you may, to acquire this knowledge ought to be your first and greatest care. A man who has had a new built house tumble down will derive little more consolation from being told that the architect is the greatest astronomer, than this distressed nation now derives from being assured that its distresses arise from the measures of a long list of the greatest orators and greatest heroes that the world ever beheld. Nevertheless, book learning is by no means to be despised, and it is a thing which may be laudably sought after by persons in all states of life. In those pursuits which are called professions, it is necessary, and also in certain trades, and, in persons in the middle ranks of life, a total absence of such learning is somewhat disgraceful. There is, however, one danger to be carefully guarded against, namely, the opinion that your genius, or your literary requirements, are such as to warrant you in disregarding the calling in which you are, and by which you gain your bread. Parents must have an uncommon portion of solid sense to counterbalance their natural affection sufficiently to make them competent judges in such a case. Friends are partial, and those who are not, you deem enemies. Stick, therefore, to the shop, rely upon your mercantile or mechanical or professional calling, try your strength in literature, if you like, but, rely on the shop. If Bloomfield, who wrote a poem called The Farmer's Boy, had placed no reliance on the faithless muses, his unfortunate and much to be pitied family would, in all probability, have not been in a state to solicit relief from charity. I remember that this loyal shoemaker was flattered to the skies, and, ominous sign, if he had understood it, feasted at the tables of some of the great. Have, I beseech you, no hope of this sort, and, if you find it creeping towards your heart, drive it instantly away as the mortal foe of your independence and your peace. With this precaution, however, book learning is not only proper, but highly commendable, and portions of it are absolutely necessary in every case of trade or profession. One of these portions is distinct reading, plain and neat writing, and arithmetic. The two former are mere child's work, the latter not quite so easily acquired, but equally indispensable, and of it you ought to have a thorough knowledge before you attempt to study even the grammar of your own language. Arithmetic is soon learned, it is not a thing that requires much natural talent, it is not a thing that loads the memory or puzzles the mind, and it is a thing of everyday utility. Therefore, this is, to a certain extent, an absolute necessary, and indispensable acquisition. Every man is not to be a surveyor or an actuary, and, therefore, you may stop far short of the knowledge, of this sort, which is demanded by these professions, but, as far as common accounts and calculations go, you ought to be perfect, and this you may make yourself, without any assistance from a master, by bestowing upon this science, during six months, only one half of the time that is, by persons of your age, usually wasted over the tea slops, or other kettle slops, alone. If you become fond of this science, there may be little danger of wasting your time on it. When, therefore, you have got as much of it as your business or profession can possibly render necessary, turn the time to some other purpose. As to books, on this subject, they are in everybody's hand, but, there is one book on the subject of calculations, which I must point out to you, The Canvas, by Dr. Kelly. This is a bad title, because, to men in general, it gives no idea of what the book treats of. It is a book which shows the value of the several pieces of money of one country when stated in the money of another country. For instance, it tells us what a Spanish dollar, a Dutch dollar, a French franc, and so on, is worth in English money. It does the same with regard to weights and measures, and it extends its information to all the countries in the world. It is a work of rare merit, and every youth, be a state of life what it may, if it permit him to pursue book learning of any sort, and particularly if he be destined, or at all likely to meddle with commercial matters, ought, as soon as convenient, to possess this valuable and instructive book. The next thing is the grammar of your own language. Without understanding this, you can never hope to become fit for anything beyond mere trade or agriculture. It is true, that we do, God knows, but too often see men have great wealth, high titles, and boundless power heaped upon them, who can hardly write ten lines together correctly, but, remember, it is not merit that has been the cause of their advancement, the cause has been, in almost every such case, the subserviency of the party to the will of some government, and the baseness of some nation who have quietly submitted to be governed by brazen fools. Do not you imagine, that you will have luck of this sort, do not you hope to be rewarded and honored for that ignorance which shall prove a curse to your country, and which will earn you the curses of the children yet unborn. Rely you upon your merit, and upon nothing else. Without a knowledge of grammar, it is impossible for you to write correctly, and it is by mere accident if you speak correctly, and, pray bear in mind, that all well-informed persons judge of a man's mind, until they have other means of judging, by his writing or speaking. The labor necessary to acquire this knowledge is, indeed, not trifling, grammar is not, like arithmetic, a science consisting of several distinct departments, some of which may be dispensed with, it is a whole, and the whole must be learned, or no part is learned. The subject is abstruse, it demands much reflection and much patience, but, when once the task is performed, it is performed for life, and in every day of that life it will be found to be, in a greater or less degree, a source of pleasure or of profit or of both together. And, what is the labor? It consists of no bodily exertion, it exposes the student to no cold, no hunger, no suffering of any sort. The study needs to subtract from the hours of no business, nor, indeed, from the hours of necessary exercise, the hours usually spent on the tea and coffee slops and in the mere gossip which accompany them, those wasted hours of only one year, employed in the study of English grammar, would make you a correct speaker and writer for the rest of your life. You want no school, no room to study in, no expenses, and no troublesome circumstances of any sort. I learned grammar when I was a private soldier on the pay of sixpence a day. The edge of my berth, or that of the guard bed, was my seat to study in, my knapsack was my bookcase, a bit of board, lying on my lap, was my writing table, and the task did not demand anything like a year of my life. I had no money to purchase candle or oil, in winter time it was rarely that I could get any evening light but that of the fire, and only my turn even of that. And if I, under such circumstances, and without parent or friend to advise or encourage me, accomplish this undertaking, what excuse can there be for any youth, however poor, however pressed with business, or however circumstances to room or other conveniences? To buy pen or a sheet of paper I was compelled to forego some portion of food, though in a state of half starvation, I had no moment of time that I could call my own, and I had to read into rediments the talking, laughing, singing, whistling and brawling of at least half a score of the most thoughtless of men, and the two in the hours of their freedom from all control. Think not lightly of the farthing that I had to give, now and then, for ink, pen, or paper. That farthing was, alas, a great sum to me. I was as tall as I am now, I had great health and great exercise. The whole of the money, not expended for us at market, was two pence a week for each man. I remember, and well I may. That upon one occasion I, after all absolutely necessary expenses, had, on a Friday, made shift to have a halfpenny in reserve, which I had destined for the purchase of a red herring in the morning, but, when I pulled off my clothes at night, so hungry then as to be hardly able to endure life, I found that I had lost my halfpenny. I buried my head under the miserable sheet and rug, and cried like a child. And, again I say, if I, under circumstances like these, could encounter and overcome this task, is there, can there be, in the whole world, a youth to find an excuse for the non-performance? What youth, who shall read this, will not be ashamed to say, that he is not able to find time and opportunity for this most essential of all the branches of book learning. I press this matter with such earnestness, because knowledge of grammar is the foundation of all literature, and because without this knowledge opportunities for writing and speaking are only occasions for men to display their unfitness to write and speak. How many false pretenders to erudition, have I exposed to shame merely by my knowledge of grammar? How many of the insolent and ignorant great and powerful have I pulled down and made little and despicable? And, with what ease have I conveyed upon numerous important subjects, information, and instruction to millions now alive, and provided a store of both for millions yet unborn? As to the course to be pursued in this great undertaking, it is, first, to read the grammar from the first word to the last,
It is very becoming in all persons, and particularly in the young, to be civil, and even polite, but it becomes neither young nor old to have an everlasting simper on their faces, and their body sawing in an everlasting bow, and, how many youths have I seen who, if they had spent, in the learning of grammar, a tenth part of the time that they have consumed in earning merited contempt for their affected gentility, would have laid the foundation of sincere respect towards them for the whole of their lives. Perseverance is a prime quality in every pursuit, and particularly in this. Yours is, too, the time of life to acquire this inestimable habit. Men fail much oftener from want of perseverance than from want of talent and a good disposition, as the race was not to the hair but to the tortoise, so the meat of success and study is to him who is not in haste, but to him who proceeds with a steady and even step. It is not to a want of taste or of desire or of disposition to learn that we have to ascribe the rareness of good scholars, so much as to the want of patient perseverance. Grammar is a branch of knowledge, like all other things of high value, it is of difficult acquirement, the study is dry, the subject is intricate, it engages not the passions, and, if the great end be not kept constantly in view, if you lose, for a moment, sight of the ample reward, indifference begins, that is followed by weariness and disgust and despair close the book. To guard against this result be not in haste, keep steadily on, and, when you find weariness approaching, rouse yourself, and remember, that if you give up, all that you have done has been done in vain. This is a matter of great moment, for out of every ten, who undertake this task, there are, perhaps, nine who abandon it in despair, and this, too, merely for the want of resolution to overcome the first approaches of weariness. The most effectual means of security against this mortifying result is to lay down a rule to write or to read a certain fixed quantity every day, Sunday accepted. Our minds are not always in the same state, they have not, at all times, the same elasticity, today we are full of hope on the very same grounds which, tomorrow, afford us no hope at all, every human being is liable to those flows and ebbs of the mind, but, if reason interfere, and bid you overcome the fits of lassitude, and almost mechanically to go on without the stimulus of hope, the buoyant fit speedily returns, you congratulate yourself that you did not yield to the temptation to abandon your pursuit, and you proceed with more vigor than ever. Five or six triumphs over temptation to indolence or despair lay the foundation of certain success, and, what is of still more importance, fixing you the habit of perseverance. If I have bestowed a large portion of my space on this topic, it has been because I know, from experience as well as from observation, that it is of more importance than all the other branches of book learning put together. It gives you, when you possess it thoroughly, a real and practical superiority over the far greater part of men. How often did I experience this even long before I became what is called an author? The adjutant, under whom it was my duty to act when I was a sergeant major, was, as almost all military officers are, or at least were, a very literate man, perceiving that every sentence of mine was in the same form and manner as sentences in print, became shy of letting me see pieces of his writing. The writing of orders, and other things, therefore, fell to me, and thus, though no nominal addition was made to my pay, and no nominal addition to my authority, I acquired the latter as effectually as if law had been passed to confer it upon me. In short, I owe to the possession of this branch of knowledge everything that has enabled me to do so many things that very few other men have done, and that now gives me a degree of influence, such as is possessed by few others, in the most weighty concerns of the country. The possession of this branch of knowledge raises you in your own esteem, gives just confidence in yourself, and prevents you from being a willing slave of the rich and entitled part of the community. It enables you to discover that riches and titles do not confer merit, you think comparatively little of them, and, as far as relates to you, at any rate, their insolence is innoxious. Hoping that I have said enough to induce you to set resolutely about the study of grammar, I might here leave the subject of learning, arithmetic and grammar, both well-learned, being as much as I could wish in a mere youth. But these need not occupy the whole of your spare time, and, there are other branches of learning which ought immediately to follow. If your own calling or profession require book study, books treating of that are to be preferred to all others, for, the first thing, the first object in life, is to secure the honest means of obtaining sustenance, raiment, and a state of being suitable to your rank, be that rank what it may, excellence in your own calling is, therefore, the first thing to be aimed at. After this may come general knowledge, and of this, the first is the thorough knowledge of your own country, for, how ridiculous is it to see an English youth engaged in reading about the customs of the Chinese or of the Hindus, while he is content to be totally ignorant of those of Kent or of Cornwall. Well employed he must be in ascertaining how Greece was divided and how the Romans parceled out their territory, while he knows not, and apparently does not want to know, how England came to be divided into counties, hundreds, parishes, and tithings. Geography naturally follows grammar, and you should begin with that of this kingdom, which you ought to understand well, perfectly well, before you venture to look abroad. A rather slight knowledge of the divisions and customs of other countries is, generally speaking, sufficient, but, not to know these full well, as far as relates to our own country, is, in one who pretends to be a gentleman or a scholar, somewhat disgraceful. Yet how many men are there, and those called gentlemen too, who seem to think that counties and parishes and churches and parsons and tithes and glebes and manors and courts leet and paupers and poorhouses all grew up in England or dropped down upon it immediately after Noah's flood? Surely it is necessary for every man having any pretensions to scholarship to know how these things came, and the sooner this knowledge is acquired the better. For until it be acquired, you read the history of your country in vain. Indeed, to communicate this knowledge is one main part of the business of history, but it is a part which no historian, commonly so called, has that I know of ever yet performed, except in part myself in the history of the Protestant Reformation. I had read Hume's history of England and the continuation by Smollett, but in when I wanted to write on the subject of the non-residence of the clergy, I found to my great mortification that I knew nothing of the foundation of the office and the claims of the parsons, and that I could not even guess at the origin of parishes. This gave a new turn to my inquiries, and I soon found the romancers, called historians, had given me no information that I could rely on, and besides, had done apparently all they could to keep me in the dark. When you come to history, begin also with that of your own country, and here it is my bounden duty to put you all on your guard. For in this respect we are peculiarly unfortunate, and for the following reasons to which I beg you to attend. Three hundred years ago, the religion of England had been, during nine hundred years, the Catholic religion. The Catholic clergy possessed about a third part of all the lands and houses, which they held in trust for their own support, for the building and repairing of churches, and for the relief of the poor, the widow, the orphan, and the stranger. But at the time just mentioned, the king and the aristocracy changed the religion to Protestant, took the estates of the church and the poor to themselves as their own property, and taxed the people at large for the building and repairing of churches and for the relief of the poor. This great and terrible change, effected partly by force against the people and partly by the most artful means of deception, gave rise to a series of efforts, which has been continued from that day to this, to cause us all to believe that the change was for the better, that it was for our good, and that, before that time, our forefathers were a set of the most miserable slaves that the sun ever warmed with his beams. It happened, too, that the art of printing was not discovered, or, at least, it was very little understood, until about the time when this change took place, so that the books relating to former times were confined to manuscript, and, besides, even these manuscript libraries were destroyed with great care by those who had made the change and had grasped the property of the poor in the church. Our historians, as they are called, have written under fear of the powerful, or have been bribed by them, and, generally speaking, both at the same time, and, accordingly, their works are, as far as they relate to former times, masses of lies unmatched by any others that the world has ever seen. The great object of these lies always has been to make the main body of the people believe that the nation is now more happy, more populous, more powerful than it was before it was Protestant, and thereby to induce us to conclude that it was a good thing for us that the aristocracy should take to themselves the property of the poor in the church and make the people at large pay taxes for the support of both. This has been, and still is, the great object of all those heaps of lies, and those lies are continually spread about amongst us in all forms of publication, from heavy folios down to heavy tracts. In refutation of those lies, we have only very few and rare ancient books to refer to, and their information is incidental, seeing that their authors never dreamed of the possibility of the lying generations which were to
This county has now parishes, and the number was formerly greater. But these parishes have now no churches at all, contain less than souls each, and have no parsonage houses. Now, observe, every parish had, in old times, a church and a parsonage house. The county contains, square miles, that is to say, something less than square miles to each parish, and that is, statute acres of land, and the size of each parish is, on an average, that of a piece of ground about one mile and a half each way, so that the churches are, even now, on an average, only about a mile and a half from each other. Now, the questions for you to put to yourself are these, were churches formerly built and kept up without being wanted, and especially by poor and miserable people? Did these miserable people build churches out of, each of which had not a hundred souls belonging to it? Is it a sign of an augmented population, that churches out of have tumbled down and been effaced? Was it a country thinly inhabited by miserable people that could build and keep a church in every piece of ground a mile and a half each way, besides having, in the same county, monastic establishments and free chapels? Is it a sign of augmented population, ease and plenty, that, out of parishes, have suffered the parsonage houses to fall into ruins, and their sites to become patches of nettles and of brambles? Put these questions calmly to yourself, common sense will dictate the answers, and truth will call for an expression of your indignation against the lying historians and the still more lying population mongers. Letter 2. To a young man. In the foregoing letter, I have given my advice to a youth. In addressing myself to you, I am to presume that you have entered upon your present stage of life, having acted upon the precepts contained in that letter, and that, of course, you are a sober, abstinent, industrious, and well-informed young man. In the succeeding letters, which will be addressed to the lover, the husband, the father, and the citizen, I shall, of course, have to include my notion of your duties as a master, and as a person employed by another. In the present letter, therefore, I shall confine myself principally to the conduct of a young man with regard to the management of his means, or money. Be you in what line of life you may, it will be amongst your misfortunes if you have not time properly to attend to this matter, for it very frequently happens, it has happened to thousands upon thousands, not only to be ruined, according to the common acceptation of the word, not only to be made poor, and to suffer from poverty, in consequence of want of attention to pecuniary matters, but it has frequently, and even generally, happened, that a want of attention to these matters has impeded the progress of science, and of genius itself. A man, oppressed with pecuniary cares and dangers, must be next to a miracle, if he have his mind in a state fit for intellectual labors, to say nothing of the temptations, arising from such distress, to abandon good principles, to suppress useful opinions and useful facts, and, in short, to become a disgrace to his kindred, and an evil to his country, instead of being an honor to the former and a blessing to the latter. To be poor and independent, is very nearly an impossibility. But, then, poverty is not a positive, but a relative term. Burke observed, and very truly, that a laborer who learned a sufficiency to maintain him as a laborer, and to maintain him in a suitable manner, to give him a sufficiency of good food, of clothing, of lodging, and of fuel, ought not to be called a poor man, for that, though he had little riches, though his, compared with that of the Lord, was a state of poverty, it was not a state of poverty in itself. When, therefore, I say that poverty is the cause of a depression of spirit, of inactivity, and of servility in men of literary talent, I must say, at the same time, that the evil arises from their own fault, from their having created for themselves imaginary wants, from their having indulged in unnecessary enjoyments, and from their having caused it to be poverty, which would not have been poverty, if they had been moderate in their enjoyments. As it may be your lot, such has been mine, to live by your literary talent, I will here, before I proceed to matter more applicable to persons in other states of life, observe, that I cannot form an idea of a mortal more rigid than a man of real talent, compelled to curb his genius, and to submit himself in the exercise of that genius, to those whom he knows to be far inferior to himself, and whom he must despise from the bottom of his soul. The late Mr. William Gifford, who was the son of a shoemaker at Ashburton in Devonshire, who was put to school and sent to the university at the expense of a generous and good clergyman of the name of Cookson, and who died, the other day, a sort of whipper in the Murray's Quarterly Review, this was a man of real genius, and, to my certain personal knowledge, he detested, from the bottom of his soul, the whole of the paper money and burmongering system, and despised those by whom the system was carried on. But, he had imaginary wants, he had been bred up in company with the rich and the extravagant, expensive indulgences had been made necessary to him by habit, and, when in the year, or thereabouts, he had to choose between a bit of bacon, a scrag of mutton, and a lodging at ten shillings a week, on the one side, and made dishes, wine, a fine house and a footman on the other side, he chose the latter. He became the servile editor of Canning's anti-Jacobin newspaper, and he, who had more wit and learning than all the rest of the writers put together, became the miserable tool in circulating their attacks upon everything that was hostile to a system which he deplored and detested. But he secured the dishes, the wine, the footman, and the coachman. A sinecure as clerk of the foreign streets, gave him L. Year, a double commissionership of the lottery gave him L. Elmore, and, at a later period, his editorship of the quarterly review gave him perhaps as much more. He rolled in his carriage for several years, he fared sumptuously, he was buried at Westminster Abbey, of which his friend and formerly his brother Pamphleteer in defense of Pitt was the dean, and never is he to be heard of more. Mr. Gifford would have been full as happy, his health would have been better, his life longer, and his name would have lived for ages, if he could have turned to the bit of bacon and scrag of mutton in, for his learning and talents were such, his reasoning so clear and conclusive, and his wit so pointed and keen, that his writings must have been generally read, must have been of long duration, and, indeed, must have enabled him, he being always a single man, to live in his latter days in as good style as that which he procured by becoming a sinecurist, a pensioner, and a hack, all which he was from the moment he lent himself to the quarterly review. Think of the mortification of such a man, when he was called upon to justify the power of imprisonment villain. But to go into particulars would be tedious, his life was a life of luxurious misery, than which a worse is not to be imagined. So that poverty is, except where there is an actual want of food and raiment, a thing much more imaginary than real. The shame of poverty, the shame of being thought poor, is a great and fatal weakness, though arising, in this country, from the fashion of the times themselves. When a good man, as in the phraseology of the city, means a rich man, we are not to wonder that everyone wishes to be thought richer than he is. When adulation is sure to follow wealth, and when contempt would be awarded to many if they were not wealthy, who are spoken of with deference, and even lauded to the skies, because their riches are great and notorious, when this is the case, we are not to be surprised that men are ashamed to be thought to be poor. This is one of the greatest of all the dangers at the outset of life, it has brought thousands and hundreds of thousands to ruin, even to pecuniary ruin. One of the most amiable features in the character of American society is this, that men never boast of their riches, and never disguise their poverty, but they talk of both as of any other matter fit for public conversation. No man shuns another because he is poor, no man is preferred to another because he is rich. In hundreds and hundreds of instances, men, not worth shilling, have been chosen by the people and entrusted with their rights and interests, in preference to men who ride in their carriages. This shame of being thought poor, is not only dishonorable in itself, and fatally injurious to men of talent, but it is ruinous even in a pecuniary point of view, and equally destructive to farmers, traders, and even gentlemen of landed estate. It leads to everlasting efforts to disguise one's poverty, the carriage, the servants, the wine, oh, the fatal wine, the spirits, the decanters, the glasses, all the table apparatus, the dress, the horses, the dinners, the parties, all must be kept up, not so much because he or she who keeps or gives them, has any pleasure arising therefrom, as because not to keep and give them, would give rise to a suspicion of the want of means so to give and keep, and thus thousands upon thousands are, yearly brought into a state of real poverty by their great anxiety not to be thought poor. Look round you, mark well what you behold, and say if this be not the case. In how many instances have you seen most amiable and even most industrious families brought to ruin by nothing but this? Mark it well, resolve to set this false shame at defiance, and when you have done that, you have laid the first stone of the surest foundation of your future tranquility of mind. There are thousands of families, at this very moment, who are thus struggling to
Friends to the doctors, this fashionable beverage is the greatest. And, which adds greatly to the folly, or, I should say, the real vice of using it, is, that the parties themselves, nine times out of ten, do not drink it by choice, do not like it, do not relish it, but use it from mere ostentation, being ashamed to be seen even by their own servants, not to drink wine. At the very moment I am writing this, there are thousands of families in the near London, who daily have wine upon their tables, and who drink it too, merely because their own servants should not suspect them to be poor, and not deem them to be genteel, and thus families by thousands are ruined, only because they are ashamed to be thought poor. There is no shame belonging to poverty, which frequently arises from the virtues of the impoverished parties. Not so frequently, indeed, as from vice, folly, and indiscretion, but still very frequently. And as the scripture tells us, that we are not to despise the poor because he is poor, so we ought not to honor the rich because he is rich. The true way is, to take a fair survey of the character of a man as depicted in his conduct, and to respect him, or despise him, according to a due estimate of that character. No country upon earth exhibits so many, as this, of those fatal terminations of life, called suicides. These arise, in nine instances out of ten, from this very source. The victims are, in general, what may be fairly called insane, but their insanity almost always arises from the dread of poverty, not from the dread of want of the means of sustaining life, or even decent living, but from the dread of being thought or known to be poor, from the dread of what is called falling in the scale of society, a dread which is prevalent hardly in any country but this. Looked at in its true light, what is there in poverty to make a man take away his own life? He is the same man that he was before, he has the same body and the same mind, if he even foresee a great alteration in his dress or his diet, why should he kill himself on that account? Are these all the things that a man wishes to live for? But, such is the fact, so great is the disgrace upon this country, and so numerous and terrible are the evils arising from this dread of being thought to be poor. Nevertheless, men ought to take care of their means, ought to use them prudently and sparingly, and to keep their expenses always within the bounds of their income, be it what it may. One of the effectual means of doing this is to purchase with ready money. S.T. Paul says, Oh no man anything, and of his numerous precepts this is by no means the least worthy of our attention. Credit has been boasted of as a very fine thing, to decry credit seems to be setting oneself up against the opinions of the whole world, and I remember a paper in the freeholder of the spectator, published just after the funding system had begun, representing public credit as a goddess, enthroned in a temple dedicated to her by her votaries, amongst whom she is dispensing blessings of every description. It must be more than forty years since I read this paper, which I read soon after the time when the late Mr. Pitt uttered in Parliament an expression of his anxious hope that his name would be inscribed on the monument which he should raise to public credit. Time has taught me that public credit means the contracting of debts which a nation never can pay, and I have lived to see this goddess produce effects in my country, which Satan himself never could have produced. It is a very bewitching goddess, and not less fatal in her influence in private than in public affairs. It has been carried in this latter respect to such a pitch that scarcely any transaction, however low and inconsiderable in amount, takes place in any other way. There is a trade in London, called the tally trade, by which household goods, coals, clothing, all sorts of things, are sold upon credit, the seller keeping a tally, and receiving payment for the goods, little by little, so that the income and the earnings of the buyers are always anticipated, are always gone, in fact, before they come in or earned, the seller is receiving, of course, a great deal more than the proper profit. Without supposing you to descend to so low grade as this, and even supposing you to be lawyer, doctor, parson, or merchant, it is still the same thing, if you purchase on credit, and not, perhaps, in a much less degree of disadvantage. Besides the higher price that you pay there is the temptation to have what you really do not want. The cost seems a trifle, when you have not to pay the money until a future time. It has been observed, and very truly observed, that men used to lay out a one-pound note when they would not lay out a sovereign. A consciousness of the intrinsic value of the things produces a retentiveness in the latter case more than in the former. The sight and the touch assist the mind in forming its conclusions, and the one-pound note was parted with, when the sovereign would have been kept. Far greater is the difference between credit and ready money. Innumerable things are not bought at all with ready money, which would be bought in case of trust. It is so much easier to order a thing than to pay for it. A future day, a day of payment must come, to be sure, but that is little thought of at the time, but if the money were to be drawn out, the moment the thing was received or offered, this question would arise, can I do without it? Is this thing indispensable, am I compelled to have it, or suffer a loss or injury greater in amount than the cost of the thing? If this question were put, every time we make a purchase, seldom should we hear of those suicides which are such a disgrace to this country. I am aware, that it will be said, and very truly said, that the concerns of merchants, that the purchasing of great estates, and various other great transactions, cannot be carried on in this manner, but these are rare exceptions to the rule, even in these cases there might be much less of bills and bonds, and all the sources of litigation, but in the everyday business of life, in transactions with the butcher, the baker, the tailor, the shoemaker, what excuse can there be for pleading a example of the merchant, who carries on his work by ships and exchanges? I was delighted, some time ago, by being told of a young man, who, upon being advised to keep a little account of all he received and expended, answered, that his business was not to keep account books, that he was sure not to make a mistake as to his income, and that, as to his expenditure, the little bag that held his sovereigns would be an infallible guide, as he never bought anything that he did not immediately pay for. I believe that nobody will deny, that, generally speaking, you pay for the same article a fourth part more in the case of trust than you do in the case of ready money. Suppose, then, the baker, butcher, tailor, and shoemaker, receive from you only 100 pounds a year. Put that together, that is to say, multiply 25 by 20, and you will find, that, at the end of 20 years, you have L, besides the accumulating and growing interest. The fathers of the church, I mean the ancient ones, and also the canons of the church, forbade selling on trust at a higher price than for ready money, which was in effect to forbid trust, and this, doubtless, was one of the great objects which those wise and pious men had in view, for they were fathers in legislation and morals as well as in religion. But the doctrine of these fathers and canons no longer prevails, they are set at not by the present age, even in the countries that adhere to their religion. Addison's goddess has prevailed over the fathers and the canons, and men not only make a difference in the price regulated by the difference in the mode of payment, but it would be absurd to expect them to do otherwise. They must not only charge something for the want of the use of the money, but they must charge something additional for the risk of its loss, which may frequently arise, and most frequently does arise, from the misfortunes of those to whom they have assigned their goods on trust. The man, therefore, who purchases on trust, not only pays for the trust, but he also pays his due share of what the tradesman loses by trust, and, after all, he is not so good a customer as the man who purchases cheaply with ready money, for there is his name indeed in the tradesman's book, but with that name the tradesman cannot go to market to get a fresh supply. Infinite are the ways in which gentlemen lose by this sort of dealing. Servants go and order sometimes things not wanted at all, at other times, more than is wanted, at others, things of a higher quality, and all this would be obviated by purchasing with ready money, for, whether through the hands of the party himself, or through those of an inferior, there would always be an actual counting out of the money, somebody would see the thing bought and see the money paid, and, as the master would give the housekeeper or steward a bag of money at the time, he would see. The money too, would set a proper value upon it, and would just desire to know upon what it had been expended. How is it that farmers are so exact, and show such a disposition to retrench in the article of labor, when they seem to think little, or nothing, about the sums which they pay in tax upon malt, wine, sugar, tea, soap, candles, tobacco, and various other things? You find the utmost difficulty in making them understand, that they are affected by these. The reason is, that they see the money which they give to the laborer on each succeeding Saturday night, but they do not see that which they give in taxes on the articles before mentioned. Why is it that they make such an outcry about the six or seven millions a year which are paid in poor rates, and say not a word about the sixty millions a year raised in other taxes? The consumer pays all, and, therefore, they are as much interested in the one as the other, and yet the farmers think of no tax but the poor tax. The reason is, that the latter
In towns, it tends to accelerate your pace along the streets, for the temptation of the windows is answered in a moment by clapping your hand upon your thigh, and the question, do I really want that, is sure to occur to you immediately, because the touch of the money is sure to put that thought in your mind. Now, supposing you to have a plenty, to have a fortune beyond your wants, would not the money which you would save in this way be very well applied in acts of real benevolence? Can you walk many yards in the streets? Can you ride a mile in the country? Can you go to half a dozen cottages? Can you, in short, open your eyes, without seeing some human being, someone born in the same country with yourself, and who, on that account alone, has some claim upon your good wishes and your charity? Can you open your eyes without seeing some person to whom even a small portion of your annual savings would convey gladness of heart? Your own heart will suggest the answer, and, if there were no motive but this, what need I say more in the advice which I have here tendered to you? Another great evil arising from this desire to be thought rich, or, rather from the desire not to be thought poor, is the destructive thing which has been honored by the name of speculation, but which ought to be called gambling. It is a purchasing of something which you do not want either in your family or in the way of ordinary trade, as something to be sold again with a great profit, and on the sale of which there is a considerable hazard. When purchases of this sort are made with ready money, they are not so offensive to reason and not attended with such risk, but when they are made with money borrowed for the purpose, they are neither more nor less than gambling transactions, and they have been, in this country, a source of ruin, misery, and suicide, admitting of no adequate description. I grant that this gambling has arisen from the influence of the goddess before mentioned, I grant that it has arisen from the facility of obtaining the fictitious means of making the purchases, and I grant that the facility has been created by the system under the painful influence of which we live. But it is not the less necessary that I beseech you not to practice such gambling, that I beseech you, if you be engaged in it, to disentangle yourself from it as soon as you can. Your life, while you are thus engaged, is the life of the gamester, a life of constant anxiety, constant desire to overreach, constant apprehension, general gloom, enlivened, now and then, by a gleam of hope or of success. Even that success is sure to lead to further adventures, and, at last, a thousand to one, that your fate is that of the pitcher to the well. The great temptation to this gambling is, as is the case in other gambling, the success of the few. As young men who crowd to the army, in search of rank and renown, never look into the ditch that holds their slaughtered companions, but have their eye constantly fixed on the general in chief, and as each of them belongs to the same profession, and is sure to be conscious that he has equal merit, everyone deems himself the suitable successor of him who is surrounded with its day camps, and who moves battalions and columns by his nod, so with the rising generation of speculators they see. The great estates that have succeeded the pencil box and the orange basket, they see those whom nature and good laws made to black shoes, sweet chimneys, or the streets, rolling in carriages, or sitting in saloons surrounded by gaudy footmen with napkins twisted round their thumbs, and they can see no earthly reason why they should not all do the same, forgetting the thousands and thousands, who, in making the attempt, have reduced themselves to that beggary which, before their attempt, they would have regarded as a thing wholly impossible. In all situations of life, avoid the trammels of the law. Man's nature must be changed before lawsuits will cease, and, perhaps, it would be next to impossible to make them less frequent than they are in the present state of this country, but though no man, who has any property at all, can say that he will have nothing to do with lawsuits, it is in the power of most men to avoid them in a considerable degree. One good rule is to have as little as possible to do with any man who is fond of lawsuits, and who, upon every slight occasion, talks of an appeal to the law. Such persons, from their frequent litigations, contract a habit of using the technical terms of the courts, in which they take a pride, and are, therefore, companions peculiarly disgusting to men of sense. To such men a lawsuit is a luxury, instead of being as it is, to men of ordinary minds, a source of anxiety and a real and substantial scourge. Such men are always of a quarrelsome disposition, and avail themselves of every opportunity to indulge in that which is mischievous to their neighbors. In thousands of instances men go to law for the indulgence of mere anger. The Germans are said to bring spite actions against one another, and to harass their poorer neighbors from motives of pure revenge. They have carried this their disposition with them to America, for which reason no one likes to live in a German neighborhood. Before you go to law consider well the cost, for if you and your suit are poorer than you were before, what do you accomplish? You only imbibe a little additional anger against your opponent, you injure him, but do harm to yourself. Better to put up with the loss of one pound than of two, to which latter is to be added all the loss of time, all the trouble, and all the mortification and anxiety attending a lawsuit. To set an attorney to work to worry and torment another man is a very base act, to alarm his family as well as himself, while you are sitting quietly at home. If a man owe you money which he cannot pay, why add to his distress without the chance of benefit to yourself? Thousands of men have injured themselves by resorting to the law, while very few ever bettered themselves by it, except such resort were unavoidable. Nothing is much more discreditable than what is called hard dealing. They say of the Turks, that they know nothing of two prices for the same article, and that to ask an abatement of the lowest shopkeeper is to insult him. It would be well if Christians imitated Mohammedans in this respect. To ask one price and take another, or to offer one price and give another, besides the loss of time that it occasions, is highly dishonorable to the parties, and especially when pushed to the extent of solemn protestations. It is, in fact, a species of lying, and it answers no one advantageous purpose to either buyer or seller. I hope that every young man who reads this, will start in life with a resolution never to higgle in lying dealings. There is this circumstance in favor of the bookseller's business, every book has its fixed price, and no one ever asks an abatement. If it were thus in all other trades, how much time would be saved, and how much immorality prevented? As to the spending of your time, your business or your profession is to claim the priority of everything else. Unless that be duly attended to, there can be no real pleasure in any other employment of a portion of your time. Men, however, must have some leisure, some relaxation from business, and in the choice of this relaxation much of your happiness will depend. Where fields and gardens are at hand, they present the most rational scenes for leisure. As to company, I have said enough in the former letter to deter any young man from that of drunkards and riding companions, but there is such a thing as your quiet pipe and pop companions, which are, perhaps, the most fatal of all. Nothing can be conceived more dull, more stupid, more the contrary of edification and rational amusement, than sitting, sodding, over a pot and a glass, sending out smoke from the head, and articulating, at intervals, nonsense about all sorts of things. Seven years' service as a galley slave would be more bearable to a man of sense, than seven months' confinement to society like this. Yet, such is the effect of habit, that, if a young man become a frequenter of such scenes, the idle propensity sticks to him for life. Some companions, however, every man must have, but these every well-behaved men will find in private houses, where families are found residing and where the suitable intercourse takes place between women and men. A man that cannot pass an evening without drink merits the name of a sot. Why should there be drink for the purpose of carrying on conversation? Women stand in need of no drink to stimulate them to converse, and I have a thousand times admired their patience in sitting quietly at their work, while their husbands are engaged, in the same room, with bottles and glasses before them, thinking nothing of the expense and still less of the shame which the distinction reflects upon them. We have to thank the women for many things, and particularly for their sobriety, for fear of following their example in which men drive them from the table, as if they said to them, You have had enough, food is sufficient for you, but we must remain to fill ourselves with drink, and to talk in language which your ears ought not to endure. When women are getting up to retire from the table, men rise in honor of them, but they take special care not to follow their excellent example. That which is not fit to be uttered before women is not fit to be uttered at all, and it is next to a proclamation, tolerating drunkenness and indecency, to send women from the table the moment they have swallowed their food. The practice has been ascribed to a desire to leave them to themselves, but why should they be left to themselves? Their conversation is always the most lively, while their persons are generally the most agreeable objects. No, the plain truth is, that it is the love of the drink and of the indecent talk that send women from the table, and it is a practice which I have always abhorred. I like to see young men, especially, follow them out of the room, and prefer their company to that of the sots who are left behind. Another mode of spending a leisure time is that of books. Rational and well informed companions may be still more instructive, but books never annoy,
You hear enough, and you read enough, about the glorious wars in the reign of King Edward III, and it is very proper that those glories should be recorded and remembered, but you never read, in the works of the historians, that, in that reign, a common laborer earned threepence halfpenny a day, and that a fat sheep was sold, at the same time, for one shilling and twopence, and a fat hog, two years old, for three shillings and fourpence, and a fat goose for twopence halfpenny. You never read that women received a penny a day for haymaking or weeding in the corn, and that a gallon of red wine was sold for fourpence. These are matters which historians have deemed to be beneath their notice, but they are matters of real importance, they are matters which ought to have practical effect at this time, for these furnish the criterion whereby we are to judge of our condition compared with that of our forefathers. The poor rates form a great feature in the laws and customs of this country. Put to a thousand persons who have read what is called the history of England, put to them the question, how the poor rates came. And 999 of the thousand will tell you, that they know nothing at all of the matter. This is not history, a list of battles and a string of intrigues are not history, they communicate no knowledge applicable to our present state, and it really is better to amuse oneself with an avowed romance, which latter is a great deal worse than passing one's time in counting the trees. History has been described as affording arguments of experience, as a record of what has been, in order to guide us as to what is likely to be, or what ought to be, but, from this romancing history, no such experience is to be derived, for it furnishes no facts on which to found arguments relative to the existing or future state of things. To come at the true history of a country you must read its laws, you must read books treating of its usages and customs in former times, and you must particularly inform yourself as to prices of labor and of food. By reading a single act of the R.D. year of Edward III, specifying the price of labor at that time, by reading an act of Parliament passed in the T.H. year of Henry VIII, by reading these two acts, and then reading the chronic on Preciosum of Bishop Fleetwood, which shows the price of food in the former reign, you come into full possession of the knowledge of what England was in former times. Diverse books teach how the divisions of the country arose, and how its great institutions were established, and the result of this reading is a store of knowledge, which will afford you pleasure for the whole of your life. History, however, is by no means the only thing about which every man's leisure furnishes him with a means of reading, besides which, every man has not the same taste. Poetry, geography, moral essays, the diverse subjects of philosophy, travels, natural history, books on sciences, and, in short, the whole range of book knowledge is before you, but there is one thing always to be guarded against, and that is, not to admire and applaud anything you read, merely because it is the fashion to admire and applaud it. Read, consider well what you read, form your own judgment, and stand by that judgment in despite of the sayings of what are called learned men until fact or argument be offered to convince you of your error. One writer praises another, and it is very possible for writers so to combine as to cry down and, in some sort, to destroy the reputation of anyone who meddles with the combination, unless the person thus assailed be blessed with uncommon talent and uncommon perseverance. When I read the works of Pope and of Swift, I was greatly delighted with their lashing of Dennis, but wondered, at the same time, why they should have taken so much pains in running down such a fool. By the merest accident in the world, being at a tavern in the woods of America, I took up an old book, in order to pass away the time while my traveling companions were drinking in the next room, but seeing the book contained the criticisms of Dennis, I was about to lay it down, when the play of Cato caught my eye, and having been accustomed to read books in which this play was lauded to the skies, and knowing it to have been written by Addison, every line of whose works I had been taught to, believe teamed with wisdom and genius, I condescended to begin to read, though the work was from the pen of that fool Dennis. I read on, and soon began to laugh, not at Dennis, but at Addison. I laughed so much and so loud, that the landlord, who was in the passage, came in to see what I was laughing at. In short, I found it a most masterly production, one of the most witty things that I had ever read in my life. I was delighted with Dennis, and was heartily ashamed of my former admiration of Cato, and felt no little resentment against Pope and Swift for their endless reviling of this most able and witty critic. This, as far as I recollect, was the first emancipation that had assisted me in my reading. I have, since that time, never taken anything upon trust, I have judged for myself, trusting neither to the opinions of writers nor in the fashions of the day. Having been told by D.R. Blair, in his lectures on rhetoric, that, if I meant to write correctly, I must give my days and nights to Addison, I read a few numbers of the Spectator at the time I was writing my English grammar, I gave neither my nights nor my days to him, but I found an abundance of matter to afford examples of false grammar, and, upon a reperusal, I found that the criticisms of Dennis might have been extended to this book too. But that which never ought to have been forgotten by those who were men at the time, and that which ought to be made known to every young man of the present day, in order that he may be induced to exercise his own judgment with regard to books, is, the transactions relative to the writings of Shakespeare, which transactions took place about thirty years ago. It is still, and it was then much more, the practice to extol every line of Shakespeare to the skies, not to admire Shakespeare has been deemed to be a proof of want of understanding and taste. M.R. Garrick, and some others after him, had their own good and profitable reasons for crying up the works of this poet. When I was a very little boy, there was a jubilee in honor of Shakespeare, and as he was said to have planted a mulberry tree, boxes, and other little ornamental things in wood, were sold all over the country, as having been made out of the trunk or limbs of this ancient and sacred tree. We Protestants laugh at the relics so highly prized by Catholics, but never was a Catholic people half so much duped by the relics of saints, as this nation was by the mulberry tree, of which, probably, more wood was sold than would have been sufficient in quantity to build a ship of war, or a large house. This madness abetted for some years, but, towards the end of the last century it broke out again with more fury than ever. Shakespeare's works were published by Waddell, an alderman of London, at a subscription of five hundred pounds for each copy, accompanied by plates, each forming a large picture. Amongst the madmen of the day was M.R. Ireland, who seemed to be more mad than any of the rest. His adoration of the poet led him to perform a pilgrimage to an old farmhouse, near Stratford upon Avon, said to have been the birthplace of the poet. Arrived at the spot, he requested the farmer and his wife to let him search the house for papers, first going upon his knees, and praying, in the poetic style, the gods to aid him in his quest. He found no papers, but he found that the farmer's wife, in clearing out a garret some years before, had found some rubbishy old papers which she had burnt, and which had probably been papers used in the wrapping up of pig's cheeks to keep them from the bats. Oh, wretched woman, exclaimed he, do you know what you have done? Oh dear, no, said the woman, half frightened out of her wits, no harm, I hope, for the papers were very old, I dare say as old as the house itself. This threw him into an additional degree of excitement, as it is now fashionably called, he raved, he stamped, he foamed, and at last quitted the house, covering the poor woman with very term of reproach, and hastening back to Stratford, took post chase for London, to relate to his brother madman the horrible sacrilege of this heathenish woman. Unfortunately for M.R. Ireland, unfortunately for his learned brothers in the metropolis, and unfortunately for the reputation of Shakespeare, M.R. Ireland took with him to the scene of his adoration a son, about sixteen years of age, who was articled to an attorney in London. The son was by no means so sharply bitten as the father, and, upon returning to town, he conceived the idea of supplying the place of the invaluable papers which the farmhouse even had destroyed. He thought, and he thought rightly, that he should have little difficulty in writing plays just like those of Shakespeare. To get paper that should seem to have been made in the reign of Queen Elizabeth, and ink that should give the writing the appearance of having the same age, was somewhat difficult, but both were overcome. Young Ireland was acquainted with the son of a bookseller, who dealt in old books, the blank leaves of these books supplied the young author with paper, and he found out the way of making proper ink for his purpose. To work he went, wrote several plays, some love letters, and other things, and having got a Bible, extant in the time of Shakespeare, he wrote notes in the margin. All these, together with sonnets in abundance, and other little detached pieces, he produced to his father, telling him he got them from a gentleman, who had made him swear that he would not divulge his name. The father announced the invaluable discovery to the literary world, the literary world rushed to him, the manuscripts were regarded as genuine by the most great and learned doctors, some of whom, and amongst these were doctors Parr
After all these jubilees and pilgrimages, after Boydell's subscription of L for one single copy, after it had been deemed almost impiety to doubt of the genius of Shakespeare surpassing that of all the rest of mankind, after he had been called the immortal bard, as a matter of course, as we speak of Moses and Aaron, there having been but one of each in the world, after all this, comes a lad of sixteen years of age, writes that which learned doctors declare could have been written by no man. But Shakespeare, and, when it is discovered that this laughing boy is the real author, the doctors turn round upon him, with all the newspapers, magazines, and reviews, and, of course, the public at their back, revile him as an imposter, and, under that odious name, hunt him out of society, and doom him to starve. This lesson, at any rate, he has given us, not to rely on the judgment of doctors and other pretenders to literary superiority. Every young man, when he takes up a book for the first time, ought to remember this story, and if he do remember it, he will disregard fashion with regard to the book, and will pay little attention to the decision of those who call themselves critics. I hope that your taste would keep you aloof from the writings of those detestable villains, who employ the powers of their mind in debauching the minds of others, or in endeavors to do it. They present their poison in such captivating forms, that it requires great virtue and resolution to withstand their temptations, and, they have, perhaps, done a thousand times as much mischief in the world as all the infidels and atheists put together. These men ought to be called literary pimps, they ought to be held in universal abhorrence, and never spoken of but with execration. Any appeal to bad passions is to be despised, any appeal to ignorance and prejudice, but here is an appeal to the frailties of human nature, and an endeavor to make the mind corrupt, just as it is beginning to possess its powers. I never have known any but bad men, worthless men, men unworthy of any portion of respect, who took delight in, or even kept in their possession, writings of the description to which I here allude. The writings of Swift have this blemish, and, though he is not a teacher of lewdness, but rather the contrary, there are certain parts of his poems which are much too filthy for any decent person to read. It was beneath him to stoop to such means of setting forth that which would have been far more brilliant without them. I have heard, that, in the library of what is called an illustrious person, sold some time ago, there was an immense collection of books of this infamous description, and from this circumstance, if from no other, I should have formed my judgment of the character of that person. Besides reading, a young man ought to write, if he have the capacity and the leisure. If you wish to remember a thing well, put it into writing, even if you burn the paper immediately after you have done, for the eye greatly assists the mind. Memory consists of a concatenation of ideas, the place, the time, and other circumstances, lead to the recollection of facts, and no circumstance more effectually than stating the facts upon paper. A journal should be kept by every young man. Put down something against every day in the year, if it be merely a description of the weather. You will not have done this for one year without finding the benefit of it. It disburdens the mind of many things to be recollected, it is amusing and useful, and ought by no means to be neglected. How often does it happen that we cannot make a statement of facts, sometimes very interesting to ourselves and our friends, for the want of a record of the places where we were, and of things that occurred on such and such a day? How often does it happen that we get into disagreeable disputes about things that have passed, and about the time and other circumstances attending them? As a thing of mere curiosity, it is of some value, and may frequently prove of very great utility. It demands not more than a minute in the twenty-four hours, and that minute is most agreeably and advantageously employed. It tends greatly to produce regularity in the conducting of affairs, it is a thing demanding a small portion of attention once in every day, I myself have found it to be attended with great and numerous benefits, and I therefore strongly recommend it to the practice of every reader. Letter 3. To a lover. There are two descriptions of lovers on whom all advice would be wasted, namely, those in whose minds passion so wholly overpowers reason as to deprive the party of his sober senses. Few people are entitled to more compassion than young men thus affected, it is a species of insanity that assails them, and, when it produces self-destruction, which it does in England more frequently than in all the other countries in the world put together, the mortal remains of the sufferer ought to be dealt with in as tender a manner as that of which the most merciful construction of the law will allow. If Sir Samuel Romilly's remains were, as they were, in fact, treated as those of a person laboring under temporary mental derangement, surely the youth who destroys his life on account of unrequited love, ought to be considered in his mild delight. Sir Samuel was represented, in the evidence taken before the coroner's jury, to have been inconsolable for the loss of his wife, that this loss had so dreadful an effect upon his mind, that it bereft him of his reason, made life insupportable, and led him to commit the act of suicide, and, on this ground alone, his remains and his estate were rescued from the awful, though just and wise, sentence of the law. But, unfortunately for the reputation of the administration of that just and wise law, there had been, only about two years before, a poor man, at Manchester, buried in crossroads, and under circumstances which entitled his remains to mercy much more clearly than in the case of Sir Samuel Romilly. This unfortunate youth, whose name was Smith, and who was a shoemaker, was in love with a young woman, who, in spite of all his importunities and his proofs of ardent passion, refused to marry him, and even discovered her liking for another, and he, unable to support life, accompanied by the thought of her being in possession of anybody but himself, put an end to his life by the means of a rope. If, in any case, we are to presume the existence of insanity, if, in any case, we are led to believe the thing without positive proof, if, in any case, there can be an apology in human nature itself, for such an act, this was the case. We all know, as I observed at the time, that is to say, all of us who cannot wait to calculate upon the gains and losses of the affair, all of us, except those who are endowed with this provident frigidity, know all well what youthful love is, and what its torments are, when accompanied by even the smallest portion of jealousy. Every man, and especially every Englishman, for here we seldom love or hate by halves, will recollect how many mad pranks he has played, how many wild and ridiculous things he has said and done between the age of sixteen and that of twenty-two, how many times a kind glance has scattered all his reasoning and resolutions to the winds, how many times a cool look has plunged him into the deepest misery. Poor Smith, who was at this age of love and madness, might, surely, be presumed to have done the deed in a moment of temporary mental derangement. He was an object of compassion in every humane breast, he had parents and brethren and kindred and friends to lament his death, and to feel shame at the disgrace inflicted on his lifeless body, yet, he was pronounced to be a fellow to or self-murderer, and his body was put into a hole by the wayside, with a stake driven down through it, while that of Romilly had mercy extended to it, on the ground that the act had been occasioned by temporary mental derangement caused by his grief for the death of his wife. To reason with passion like that of the unfortunate Smith, is perfectly useless, you may, with as much chance of success, reason and remonstrate with the winds or the waves, if you make impression, it lasts but for a moment, your effort, like an inadequate stoppage of waters, only adds, in the end, to the violence of the torrent, the current must have and will have its course, be the consequences what they may. In cases not quite so decided, absence, the sight of new faces, the sound of new voices, generally serve, if not as a radical cure, as a mitigation, at least, of the disease. But, the worst of it is, that, on this point, we have the girls, and women too, against us. For they look upon it as right that every lover should be a little maddish, and, every attempt to rescue him from the thraldom imposed by their charms, they look upon it as an overt act of treason against their natural sovereignty. No girl ever liked a young man less for his having done things foolish and wild and ridiculous, provided she was sure that love of her had been the cause, let her but be satisfied upon this score, and there are very few things which she will not forgive. And, though wholly unconscious of the fact, she is a great and sound philosopher after all. For, from the nature of things, the rearing of a family always has been, is, and must ever be, attended with cares and troubles, which must infallibly produce, at times, feelings to be combated and overcome by nothing short of that ardent affection which first brought the parties together. So that, talk as long as Parson Malthus likes about moral restraint, and report as long as the committees of Parliament please about preventing premature and improvident marriages amongst the laboring classes, the passion that they would restrain, while it is necessary to the existence of mankind, is the greatest of all the compensations for the inevitable cares, troubles, hardships, and sorrows of life, and, as to the marriages, if they could once be rendered universally provident, every generous sentiment would quickly be banished from the world. The other description of
You generally find even very vulgar rich men making a sacrifice of their natural and rational taste to their mean and ridiculous pride, and thereby providing for themselves an ample supply of misery for life. By preferring provident marriages to marriages of love, they think to secure themselves against all the evils of poverty, but, if poverty come, and come it may, and frequently does, in spite of the best laid plans, and best modes of conduct, if poverty come, then where is the counterbalance for that ardent mutual affection, which troubles, and losses, and crosses always increase rather than diminish, and which, amidst all the calamities that can befall man, whispers to his heart, that his best possession is still left him unimpaired? The Worcestershire Baronet, who has had to endure the sneers of fools on account of his marriage with a beautiful and virtuous servant maid, would, were the present ruinous measures of the government to drive him from his mansion to a cottage, still have a source of happiness, while many of those, who might fall in company with him, would, in addition to all their other troubles, have, perhaps, to endure the reproaches of wives to whom poverty, or even humble life, would be insupportable. If marrying for the sake of money be, under any circumstances, despicable, if not disgraceful, if it be, generally speaking, a species of legal prostitution, only a little less shameful than that which, under some governments, is openly licensed for the sake of a tax, if this be the case generally, what ought to be said of a young man, who, in the heyday of youth, should couple himself onto a libidinous woman, old enough, perhaps, to be his grandmother, ugly as the nightmare, offensive alike, to the sight and the smell, and who should pretend to love her too, and all this merely for the sake of her money? Why, it ought, and it, doubtless, would be said of him, that his conduct was a libel on both man and womankind, that his name ought, forever, to be synonymous with baseness and nastiness, and that in no age and in no nation, not marked by a general depravity of manners, and total absence of all sense of shame, every associate, male or female, of such a man, or of his filthy mate, would be held in abhorrence. Public morality would drive such a hateful pair from society, and strict justice would hunt them from the face of the earth. Bonaparte could not be said to marry for money, but his motive was little better. It was for dominion, for power, for ambition, and that, too, of the most contemptible kind. I knew an American gentleman, with whom Bonaparte had always been a great favorite, but the moment the news arrived of his divorce and second marriage, he gave him up. This piece of grand prostitution was too much to be defended. And the truth is, that Bonaparte might have dated his decline from the day of that marriage. My American friend said, if I had been he, I would, in the first place, have married the poorest and prettiest girl in all France. If he had done this, he would, in all probability, have now been on an imperial throne, instead of being eaten by worms at the bottom of a very deep hole in St. Helena, whence, however, his bones conveyed to the world the moral, that to marry for money, for ambition, or from any motive other than the one pointed out by affection, is not the road to glory, to happiness, or to peace. Let me now turn from these two descriptions of lovers, with whom it is useless to reason, and address myself to you, my reader, whom I suppose to be a real lover, but not so smitten as to be bereft of your reason. You should never forget, that marriage, which is a state that every young person ought to have in view, is a thing to last for life, and that, generally speaking, it is to make life happy, or miserable, for, though a man may bring his mind to something nearly a state of indifference, even that is misery, except with those who can hardly be reckoned amongst sensitive beings. Marriage brings numerous cares, which are amply compensated by the more numerous delights which are their companions. But to have the delights, as well as the cares, the choice of the partner must be fortunate. I say fortunate, for, after all, love, real love, impassioned affection, is an ingredient so absolutely necessary, that no perfect reliance can be placed on the judgment. Yet, the judgment may do something, reason may have some influence, and, therefore, I here offer you my advice with regard to the exercise of that reason. The things which you ought to desire in a wife are, chastity, sobriety, industry, frugality, cleanliness, knowledge of domestic affairs, good temper, beauty. Chastity, perfect modesty, in word, deed, and even thought, is so essential, that, without it, no female is fit to be a wife. It is not enough that a young woman abstain from everything approaching towards indecorum in her behavior towards men, it is, with me, not enough that she cast down her eyes, or turn aside her head with a smile, when she hears an indelicate illusion, she ought to appear not to understand it, and to receive from it no more impression than if she were a post. A loose woman is a disagreeable acquaintance, what must she be, then, as a wife? Love is so blind, and vanity is so busy in persuading us that our own qualities will be sufficient to ensure fidelity, that we are very apt to think nothing, or, at any rate, very little, of trifling symptoms of levity, but if such symptoms show themselves now, we may be well assured, that we shall never possess the power of effecting a cure. If prudery mean false modesty, it is to be despised, but if it mean modesty pushed to the utmost extent, I confess that I like it. You are free and hearty girls I have liked very well to talk and laugh with, but never, for one moment, did it enter into my mind that I could have endured a free and hearty girl for a wife. The thing is, I repeat, to last for life, it is to be a counterbalance for troubles and misfortunes, and it must, therefore, be perfect, or it had better not be at all. To say that one despises jealousy is foolish, it is a thing to be lamented, but the very elements of it ought to be avoided. Gross indeed is the beast, for he is unworthy of the name of man, nasty indeed is the wretch, who can even entertain the thought of putting himself between a pair of sheets with a wife of whose infidelity he possesses the proof, but, in such cases, a man ought to be very slow to believe appearances, and he ought not to decide against his wife but upon the clearest proof. The last, and, indeed, the only effectual safeguard is, to begin well, to make a good choice, to let the beginning be such as surrendering fidelity and jealousy next to impossible. If you begin in grossness, if you couple yourself onto one with whom you have taken liberties, infidelity is the natural and just consequence. When a peer of the realm, who had not been overfortunate in his matrimonial affairs, was urging Major Cartwright to seek for nothing more than moderate reform, the Major, forgetting the domestic circumstances of his lordship, asked him how he should relish moderate chastity in a wife. The bare use of the two words, thus coupled together, is sufficient to excite disgust. Yet with this moderate chastity you must be, and ought to be, content, if you have entered into marriage with one, in whom you have ever discovered the slightest approach towards lewdness, either in deeds, words, or looks. To marry has been your own act, you have made the contract for your own gratification, you knew the character of the other party, and the children, if any, or the community, are not to be the sufferers for your gross and corrupt passion. Moderate chastity is all that you have, in fact, contracted for, you have it, and you have no reason to complain. When I come to address myself to the husband, I shall have to say more upon this subject, which I dismiss for the present with observing, that my observation has convinced me, that, when families are rendered unhappy from the existence of moderate chastity, the fault, first or last, has been in the man, ninety-nine times out of every hundred. Sobriety. By sobriety I do not mean merely an absence of drinking to a state of intoxication, for, if that be hateful in a man, what must it be in a woman? There is a Latin proverb, which says, that wine, that is to say, intoxication, brings forth truth. Whatever it may do in this way, in men, in women it is sure, unless prevented by age or by salutary ugliness, to produce a moderate, and a very moderate, portion of chastity. There never was a drunken woman, a woman who loved strong drink, who was chaste, if the opportunity of being the contrary presented itself to her. There are cases where health requires wine, and even small portions of more ardent liquor, but, reserving what I have further to say on this point, till I come to the conduct of the husband, young unmarried women can seldom stand in need of these stimulants, and, at any rate, only in cases of well-known definite ailments. Wine. Only a glass or two of wine at dinner, or so. As soon as have married a girl whom I had thought liable to be persuaded to drink, habitually, only a glass or two of wine at dinner, or so, as soon as have married such a girl, I would have taken a strumpet from the streets. And it has not required age to give me this way of thinking, it has always been rooted in my mind from the moment that I began to think the girls prettier than posts. There are few things so disgusting as a guzzling woman. A gourmandizing one is bad enough, but, one who tips off the liquor with an appetite, and exclaims good, good, by a smack of her lips, is fit for nothing but a brothel. There
But by the word sobriety, in a young woman, I mean a great deal more than even a rigid abstinence from that love of drink, which I am not to suppose, and which I do not believe, to exist anything like generally amongst the young women of this country. I mean a great deal more than this, I mean sobriety of conduct. The word sober, and its derivatives, do not confine themselves to matters of drink, they express steadiness, seriousness, carefulness, scrupulous propriety of conduct, and they are thus used amongst country people in many parts of England. When a summer such fellow makes too free with a girl, she reproves him with, come, be sober. And when we wish a team, or anything, to be moved on steadily and with great care, we cry out to the carter, or other operator, soberly, soberly. Now, this species of sobriety is a great qualification in the person you mean to make your wife. Skipping, tappering, romping, rattling girls are very amusing where all costs and other consequences are out of the question, and they may become sober in the summer such sense of the word. But while you have no certainty of this, you have a presumptive argument on the other side. To be sure, when girls are mere children, they are to play and romp like children. But, when they arrive at that age which turns their thoughts towards that sort of connection which is to be theirs for life, when they begin to think of having the command of a house, however small or poor, it is time for them to cast away the levity of the child. It is natural, nor is it very wrong, that I know of, for children to like to get about and to see all sorts of strange sights, though I do not approve of this even in children, but, if I could not have found a young woman, and I am sure I never should have married an old one, who I was not sure possessed all the qualities expressed by the word sobriety, I should have remained a bachelor to the end of that life, which, in that case, would, I am satisfied, have terminated without my having performed a thousandth part of those labors which have been, and are, in spite of all political prejudice, the wonder of all who have seen, or heard of, them. Scores of gentlemen have, at different times, expressed to me their surprise, that I was always in spirits, that nothing pulled me down, and the truth is, that, throughout nearly forty years of troubles, losses, and crosses, assailed all the while by more numerous and powerful enemies than ever man had before to contend with, and performing, at the same time, labors greater than man ever before performed, all those labors requiring mental exertion, and some of the mental exertion of the highest order, the truth is, that, throughout the whole of this long time of troubles and of labors, I have never known a single hour of real anxiety, the troubles have been no troubles to me, I have not known what lowness of spirits mean, have been more gay, and felt less care, than any bachelor that ever lived. You are always in spirits, Cobbett. To be sure, for why should I not? Poverty I have always set at defiance, and I could, therefore, defy the temptations of riches, and, as to home and children, I had taken care to provide myself with an inexhaustible store of that sobriety, which I am so strongly recommending my reader to provide himself with, or, if he cannot do that, to deliver it long before he ventures on the life enduring matrimonial voyage. This sobriety is entitled to trustworthiness, and this, young man, is the treasure that you ought to prize far above all others. Miserable is the husband, who, when he crosses the threshold of his house, carries with him doubts and fears and suspicions. I do not mean suspicions of the fidelity of his wife, but of her care, frugality, attention to his interests, and to the health and morals of his children. Miserable is the man, who cannot leave all unlocked, and who is not sure, quite certain, that all is as safe as if grasped in his own hand. He is the happy husband, who can go away, at a moment's warning, leaving his house and his family with as little anxiety as he quits an inn, not more fearing to find, on his return, anything wrong, than he would fear a discontinuance of the rising and setting of the sun, and if, as in my case, leaving books and papers all lying about at sixes and sevens, finding them arranged in proper order, and the room, during a lucky interval, free from the effects of his and his plowman's or gardener's dirty shoes. Such a man has no real cares, such a man has no troubles, and this is the sort of life that I have led. I have had all the numerous and indescribable delights of home and children, and, at the same time, all the bachelor's freedom from domestic cares, and to this cause, far more than to any other, my readers of those labors, which I never could have performed, if even the slightest degree of want of confidence at home had ever once entered into my mind. But, in order to possess this precious trustworthiness, you must, if you can, exercise your reason in the choice of your partner. If she be vain of her person, very fond of dress, fond of flattery, at all given to getting about, fond of what are called parties of pleasure, or coquettish, though in the least degree, if either of these, she never will be trustworthy, worthy, she cannot change her nature, and if you marry her, you will be unjust if you expect trustworthiness at her hands. But, besides this, even if you find in her that innate sobriety of which I have been speaking, there requires on your part, and that it wants to, confidence and trust without any limit. Confidence is, in this case, nothing unless it be reciprocal. To have a trustworthy wife, you must begin by showing her, even before you are married, that you have no suspicions, no fears, no doubts, with regard to her. Many a man has been discarded by a virtuous girl, merely on account of his quarrelous conduct. All women despise jealous men, and, if they marry such their motive is other than that of affection. Therefore, begin by proofs of unlimited confidence, and, as example may serve to assist precept, and as I never have preached that which I have not practiced, I will give you the history of my own conduct in this respect. When I first saw my wife, she was thirteen years old, and I was within about a month of twenty-one. She was the daughter of a sergeant of artillery, and I was the sergeant major of a regiment of foot, both stationed in forts near the city of St. John, in the province of New Brunswick. I sat in the same room with her, for about an hour, in company with others, and I made up my mind that she was the very girl for me. That I thought her beautiful is certain, for that I had always said should be an indispensable qualification, but I saw in her what I deemed marks of that sobriety of conduct of which I have said so much, and which has been by far the greatest blessing of my life. It was now dead of winter, and, of course, the snow several feet deep on the ground, and the weather piercing cold. It was my habit, when I had done my morning's writing, to go out at break of day to take a walk on a hill at the foot of which our barracks lay. In about three mornings after I had first seen her, I had, by an invitation to breakfast with me, got up two young men to join me in my walk, and our roadway by the house of her father and mother. It was hardly light, but she was out on the snow, scrubbing out a washing tub. That's the girl for me, said I, when we had got out of her hearing. One of these young men came to England soon afterwards, and he, who keeps an inn in your cheer, came over to Preston, at the time of the election, to verify whether I were the same man. When he found that I was, he appeared surprised, but what was his surprise, when I told him that those tall young men, whom he saw around me, were the sons of that pretty little girl that he and I saw scrubbing out the washing tub on the snow in New Brunswick at daybreak in the morning. From the day that I first spoke to her, I never had a thought of her ever being the wife of any other man, more than I had a thought of her being transformed into a chest of drawers, and I formed my resolution at once, to marry her as soon as we could get permission, and to get out of the army as soon as I could. So that this matter was, at once, settled as firmly as if written in the Book of Fate. At the end of about six months, my regiment, and I along with it, were removed to Fredericton, a distance of a hundred miles, up the river of S.T. John, and, which was worse, the artillery were expected to go off to England a year or two before our regiment. The artillery went, and she along with them, and now it was that I acted a part becoming a real insensible lover. I was aware, that, when she got to that gay place village, the house of her father and mother, necessarily visited by numerous persons not the most select, might become unpleasant to her, and I did not like, besides, that she should continue to work hard. I had saved 150 guineas, the earnings of my early hours, in writing for the paymaster, the quartermaster, and others, in addition to the savings of my own pay. I sent her all my money, before she sailed, and wrote to her to beg of her, if she found her home uncomfortable, to hire a lodging with respectable people, and, at any rate, not to spare the money, by any means, but to buy herself good clothes, and to live without hard work, until I arrived in England, and I, in order to induce her to lay out the money, told her that I should get plenty more before I came home. As the malignity of the devil would have it, we were kept abroad two years longer than our time, Mr. Pitt, England not being so tame then as she is now, having knocked up a dust with Spain about Nootka Sound. Oh, how I cursed Nootka Sound, and poor Bowling
But when her age is considered, when we reflect that she was living in a place crowded, literally crowded, with gaily dressed and handsome young men, many of them really far richer and in higher rank than I was, and scores of them ready to offer her their hand, when we reflect that she was living amongst young women who put upon their backs every shilling that they could commit, when we see her keeping the bag of gold untouched, and working hard to provide herself with but mere necessary apparel, and doing this while she was passing from 14 to 18 years of age, when we view the whole of the circumstances, we must say that here is an example, which, while it reflects honor on her sex, ought to have weight with every young woman whose eyes or ears this relation shall reach. If any young man imagine that this great sobriety of conduct in young women must be accompanied with seriousness approaching to gloom, he is, according to my experience and observation, very much deceived. The contrary is the fact, for I have found that as, amongst men, your jovial companions are, except over the bottle, the dullest and most insipid of souls, so amongst women, the gay, rattling, and laughing, are, unless some party of pleasure, or something out of domestic life, is going on, generally in the dumps and blue devils. Some stimulus is always craved after by this description of women, some sight to be seen, something to see or hear other than what is to be found at home, which, as it affords no incitement, nothing to raise and keep up the spirits, is looked upon merely as a place to be for want of a better, merely a place for eating and drinking, and the like, merely abiding place, whence to sally in search of enjoyments. A greater curse than a wife of this description, it would be somewhat difficult to find, and, in your character of lover, you are to provide against it. I hate a dull, melancholy, moping thing, I could not have existed in the same house with such a thing for a single month. The mopers are, too, all people at other times, the gaiety is for others, and the moping for the husband, to comfort him, happy man, when he is alone, plenty of smiles and a badinage for others, and for him to participate with others, but the moping is reserved exclusively for him. One hour she is cabareting about, as if rehearsing a jig, and, the next, sighing to the motion of a lazy needle, or weeping over a novel and this is called sentiment. Music, indeed. Give me a mother singing to her clean and fat and rosy baby, and making the house ring with her extravagant and hyperbolical encomiums on it. That is the music which is the food of love, and not the formal, pedantic noises, an affectation of skill in which is nowadays the ruin of half the young couples in the middle rank of life. Let any man observe, as I so frequently have, with delight, the excessive fondness of the laboring people for their children. Let him observe with what pride they dress them out on a Sunday, with means deducted from their own scanty meals. Let him observe the husband, who has toiled all the week like a horse, nursing the baby, while the wife is preparing the bit of dinner. Let him observe them both abstaining from a sufficiency, lest the children should feel the pinchings of hunger. Let him observe, in short, the whole of their demeanor, the real mutual affection, evinced, not in words, but in unequivocal deeds. Let him observe these things, and, having then cast a look at the lives of the great and wealthy, he will say, with me, that, when a man is choosing his partner for life, the dread of poverty ought to be cast to the winds. A laborer's cottage, on a Sunday, the husband or wife having a baby in arms, looking at two or three older ones playing between the flower borders going from the wicket to the door, is, according to my taste, the most interesting object that I have ever beheld, and, it is an object to be beheld in no country upon earth but England. In France, a laborer's cottage means a shed with a donkey before the door, and it means much about the same in America, where it is wholly inexcusable. In writing once, about five years ago, from Petworth to Horsham, on a Sunday in the afternoon, I came to a solitary cottage which stood at about twenty yards distance from the road. There was the wife with the baby in her arms, the husband teaching another child to walk, while four more were at play before them. I stopped and looked at them for some time, and then, turning my horse, rode up to the wicket, getting into talk by asking the distance to Horsham. I found that the man worked chiefly in the woods, and that he was doing pretty well. The wife was then only twenty-two, and the man only twenty-five. She was a pretty woman, even for Sussex, which, not excepting Lancashire, contains the prettiest women in England. He was a very fine and stout young man. Why, said I, how many children do you reckon to have at last? I do not care how many, said the man, God never sends mouths without sending meat. Did you ever hear, said I, of one parson Malthus? No, sir. Why, if he were to hear of your works, he would be outrageous, for he wants an act of parliament to prevent poor people from marrying young, and from having such lots of children. Oh, the brute, exclaimed the wife, while the husband laughed, thinking that I was joking. I asked the man whether he had ever had relief from the parish, and upon his answering in the negative, I took out my purse, took from it enough to bait my horse at Horsham, and to clear my turnpikes to worth, whither I was going in order to stay a while, and gave him all the rest. Now, is it not a shame, is it not a sin of all sins, that people like these should, by acts of the government, be reduced to such misery as to be induced to abandon their homes in their country, to seek, in a foreign land, the means of preventing themselves and their children from starving? And this has been, and now is, actually the case with many such families in the same county of Sussex. An ardent minded young man, who, by the by, will, as I am afraid, have been wearied by this rambling digression, may fear, that this great sobriety of conduct in a young woman, for which I have been so strenuously contending, argues a want of that warmth, which he naturally so much desires, and, if my observation and experience warranted the entertaining of this fear, I should say, had I to live my life over again, give me the warmth, and I will stand my chances to the rest. But, this observation and this experience tell me the contrary, they tell me that levity is, ninety-nine times out of a hundred, the companion of a want of ardent feeling. Prostitutes never love, and, for the far greater part, never did. Their passion, which is more mere animal than anything else, is easily gratified, they, like rakes, change not only without pain, but with pleasure, that is to say, pleasure as great as they can enjoy. Women of light minds have seldom any ardent passion, love is a mere name, unless confined to one object, and young women, in whom levity of conduct is observable, will not be thus restricted. I do not, however, recommend a young man to be too severe in judging, where the conduct does not go beyond mere levity, and is not bordering on loose conduct, for something depends here upon constitution and animal spirits, and something also upon the manners of the country. That levity, which, in a French girl, I should not have thought a great deal of, would have frightened me away from an English or an American girl. When I was in France, just after I was married, there happened to be amongst our acquaintance a gay, sprightly girl, of about seventeen. I was remonstrating with her, one day, on the facility with which she seemed to shift her smiles from object to object, and she, stretching one arm out in an upward direction, the other in a downward direction, raising herself upon one foot, leaning her body on one side, and thus throwing herself into flying attitude, answered my grave lecture by singing, in a very sweet voice, significantly bowing her head and smiling at the same time, the following lines from the vaudeville, in the play of Figaro. S. I. Lamour Dales, N. E. S. T. C. Pop or Volpegger? That is, if love has wings, is it not to flutter about with? The wit, argument, and manner, all together, silence me. She, after I left France, married a very worthy man, has had a large family, and has been, and is, a most excellent wife and mother. But that which does sometimes well in France, does not do here at all. Our manners are more grave, steadiness is the rule, and levity the exception. Love may voltage in France, but, in England, it cannot, with safety to the lover, and it is a truth which, I believe, no man of attentive observation will deny, that, as, in general, English wives are more warm in their conjugal attachments than those of France, so, with regard to individuals, that those English women who are the most light in their manners, and who are the least constant in their attachments, have the smallest portion of that warmth, that indescribable passion which God has, given to human beings as the great counterbalance to all the sorrows and sufferings of life. Industry. By industry, I do not mean merely laboriousness, merely labor, or activity of body, for purposes of gain or of saving, for there may be industry amongst those who have more money than they know well what to do with, and there may be lazy ladies, as well as lazy farmers and tradesmen's wives. There is no state of life in which industry in the wife is not necessary to the happiness and prosperity of the family, at the head of the household affairs of which she is placed. If she be lazy, there will be lazy servants, and, which is
Why, it is very difficult, it is a matter that reason has very little to do with, but there are, nevertheless, certain outward invisible signs, from which a man, not wholly deprived of the use of his reason, may form a pretty accurate judgment as to this matter. It was a story in Philadelphia, some years ago, that a young man, who was courting one of three sisters, happened to be on a visit to her, when all the three were present, and when one said to the others, I wonder where our needle is. Upon which he withdrew, as soon as was consistent with the rules of politeness, resolved never to think more of a girl who possessed a needle only in partnership, and who, it appeared, was not too well informed as to the place where even that share was deposited. This was, to be sure, a very flagrant instance of a want of industry, for, if the third part of the use of a needle satisfied her when single, it was reasonable to anticipate that marriage would banish that useful implement altogether. But such instances are seldom suffered to come in contact with the eyes and ears of the lover, to disguise all defects from whom is the great business, not only of the girl herself, but of her whole family. There are, however, certain outward signs, which, if attended to with care, will serve as pretty sure guides. And, first, if you find the tongue lazy, you may be nearly certain that the hands and feet are the same. By laziness of the tongue I do not mean silence, I do not mean an absence of talk, for that is, in most cases, very good, but, I mean, a slow and soft utterance, a sort of sighing out of the words instead of speaking them, a sort of letting the sounds fall out, as if the party were sick at stomach. The pronunciation of an industrious person is generally quick, distinct, and the voice, if not strong, firm at the least. Not masculine, as feminine as possible, not a croak nor a ball, but a quick, distinct, and sound voice. Nothing is much more disgusting than what the sensible country people call a mouth woman. A mouth man is bad enough, he is sure to be a lazy fellow, but, a woman of this description, in addition to her laziness, soon becomes the most disgusting of mates. In this whole world nothing is much more hateful than a female's underjaw, lazily moving up and down, and letting out a long string of half-articulate sounds. It is impossible for any man, who has any spirit in him, to love such a woman for any length of time. Look a little, also, at the labors of the teeth, for these correspond with those of the other members of the body, and with the operations of the mind. Quick at meals, quick at work, is a saying as old as the hills, in this, the most industrious nation upon earth, and never was there a truer saying. But fashion comes in here, and decides that you shall not be quick at meals, that you shall sit and be carrying on the affair of eating for an hour, or more. Good God! What have I not suffered on this account? However, though she must sit as long as the rest, and though she must join in the performance, for it is a real performance, unto the end of the last scene, she cannot make her teeth bend in their character. She may, and must, suffer the slice to linger on the plate, and must make the supply slow, in order to fill up the time, but when she does bite, she cannot well disguise what nature has taught her to do, and you may be assured, that if her jaws move in slow time, and if she rather squeeze than bite the food, if she so deal with it as to leave you in doubt as to whether she mean finally to admit or reject it, if she deal with it thus, set her down as being, in her very nature, incorrigibly lazy. Never mind the pieces of needlework, the tempering, the maps of the world made by her needle. Get to see her at work upon a mutton chop, or a bit of bread and cheese, and, if she deal quickly with these, you have a pretty good security for that activity, that stirring industry, without which a wife is a burden instead of being a help. And, as to love, it cannot live for more than a month or two, in the breast of a man of spirit, towards a lazy woman. Another mark of industry is, a quick step, and a somewhat heavy tread, showing that the foot comes down with a hearty goodwill, and if the body lean a little forward, and the eyes keep steadily in the same direction, while the feet are going, so much the better, for these discover earnestness to arrive at the intended point. I do not like, and I never liked, your sauntering, soft-stepping girls, who move as if they were perfectly indifferent as to the result, and, as to the love part of the story, whoever expects certain and lasting affection from one of these sauntering girls, will, when too late, find his mistake, the character runs the same all the way through, and no man ever yet saw a sauntering girl, who did not, when married, make a mawkish wife, and a cold-hearted mother, cared very little for either by husband or children, and, of course, having no store of those blessings which are the natural resources to apply to in sickness and in old age. Early rising is another mark of industry, and though, in the higher situations of life, it may be of no importance in a mere pecuniary point of view, it is, even there, of importance in other respects, for it is, I should imagine, pretty difficult to keep love alive towards a woman who never sees the dew, never beholds the rising sun, and who constantly comes directly from a reading bed to the breakfast table, and there shoes about, without appetite, the choicest morsels of human food. A man might, perhaps, endure this for a month or two, without being disgusted, but that is ample allowance of time. And, as to people in the middle rank of life, where a living in the provision for children is to be sought by labor of some sort or other, late rising in the wife is certain ruin, and, never was there yet an early rising wife, who had been a late rising girl. If brought up to late rising, she will like it, it will be her habit, she will, when married, never want excuses for indulging in the habit, at first she will be indulged without bounds, to make a change afterwards will be difficult, it will be deemed a wrong done to her, she will ascribe it to diminished affection, a quarrel must ensue, or, the husband must submit to be ruined, or, at the very least, to see half the fruit of his labor snort and lounged away. And, is this being rigid? Is it being harsh? Is it being hard upon women? Is it the offspring of the frigid severity of age? It is none of these, it arises from an ardent desire to promote the happiness, and to add to the natural, legitimate, and salutary influence, of the female sex. The tendency of this advice is to promote the preservation of their health, to prolong the duration of their beauty, to cause them to be beloved to the last day of their lives, and to give them, during the whole of those lives, weight and consequence, of which laziness would render them wholly unworthy. Frugality. This means the contrary of extravagance. It does not mean stinginess, it does not mean a pinching of the belly, nor a stripping of the back, but it means an abstaining from all unnecessary expenditure, and all unnecessary use, of goods of any and of every sort, and a quality of great importance it is, whether the rank in life be high or low. Some people are, indeed, so rich, they have such an overabundance of money and goods, that how to get rid of them would, to a looker on, seem to be their only difficulty. But while the inconvenience of even these immense masses is not too great to be overcome by a really extravagant woman, who jumps with joy at a basket of strawberries at a guinea an ounce, and who would not give a straw for green peas later in the year than January, while such a dame would lighten the bags of a lone monger, or shorten the rent roll of half a dozen purges amalgamated into one possession, she would, with very little study and application of her talent, send a nobleman of ordinary estate to the courthouse or the pension list, which last may be justly regarded as the poor book of the aristocracy. How many noblemen and gentlemen, of fine estates, have been ruined and degraded by the extravagance of their wives? More frequently by their own extravagance, perhaps, but, in numerous instances, by that of those whose duty it is to assist in upholding their stations by husbanding their fortunes. If this be the case amongst the opulent, who have estates to draw upon, what must be the consequences of a want of frugality in the middle and lower ranks of life? Here it must be fatal, and especially amongst that description of persons whose wives have, in many cases, the receiving as well as the expending of money. In such a case, there wants nothing but extravagance in the wife to make ruin as sure as the arrival of old age. To obtain security against this is very difficult, yet, if the lover be not quite blind, he may easily discover a propensity towards extravagance. The object of his addresses will, nine times out of ten, not be the manager of a house, but she must have her dress, and other little matters under her control. If she be costly in these, if, in these, she step above her rank, or even to the top of it, if she purchase all she is able to purchase, and prefer the showy to the useful, the gay, and the fragile to the less sightly and more durable, he may be sure that the disposition will cling to her through life. If he perceive in her a taste for costly food, costly furniture, costly amusements, if he find her love of gratification to be bounded only by her want of means, if he find her full of admiration of the trappings of the rich, and of desire to be able to imitate them, he may be pretty sure that she will not spare his purse, when once she gets her hand into it, and, therefore, if he can bid adieu to her charms, the
Reason would tell her that she could never be at the top, that she must stop at some point short of that, and that, therefore, all expenses in the rivalship are so much thrown away. But, reason and brooches and bracelets do not go in company. The girl who has not the sense to perceive that her person is disfigured, and not beautified, by parcels of brass and tin, for they are generally little better, and other hardware, stuck about her body, the girl that is so foolish as not to perceive, that, when silks and cottons and cambrics, in their neatest form, have done their best, nothing more is to be done, the girl that cannot perceive this is too great a fool to be trusted, with the purse of any man. Cleanliness. This is a capital ingredient, for there never yet was, and there never will be, love of long duration, sincere and ardent love, in any man, towards a filthy mate. I mean any man in England, or in those parts of America where the people have descended from the English. I do not say, that there are not men enough, even in England, to live peaceably and even contentedly, with dirty, at, dollar number at, dollar at, women, for, there are some who seem to like the filth well enough. But what I contend for is this, that there never can exist, for any length of time, ardent affection in any man towards a woman who is filthy either in her person, or in her house affairs. Men may be careless as to their own persons, they may, from the nature of their business, or from their want of time to adhere to neatness and dress, be slovenly in their own dress and habits, but, they do not relish this in their wives, who must still have charms, and charms and filth do not go together. It is not dress that the husband wants to be perpetual, it is not finery, but cleanliness and everything. The French women dress enough, especially when they sally forth. My excellent neighbor, Mr. John Treadwell, of Long Island, used to say that the French were pigs in the parlor and peacocks on the promenade, an alliteration which Canning self might have envied. This occasional cleanliness is not the thing that an English or an American husband wants, he wants it always, indoors as well as out, by night as well as by day, on the floor as well as on the table, and, however he may grumble about the fuss and the expense of it, he would grumble more if he had it not. I once saw a picture representing the amusements of Portuguese lovers, that is to say, three or four young men, dressed in gold or silver lace clothes, each having a young girl, dressed like a princess, and affectionately engaged in hunting down and killing the vermin in his head. This was, perhaps, an exaggeration, but that it should have had the shadow of foundation, was enough to fill me with contempt for the whole nation. The signs of cleanliness are, in the first place, a clean skin. An English girl will hardly let her lover see the stale dirt between her fingers, as I have many times seen it between those of French women, and even ladies, of all ages. An English girl will have her face clean, to be sure, if there be soap and water within her reach, but, get a glance, just a glance, at her pole, if you have any doubt upon the subject, and, if you find there, or behind the ears, what the year people call grime, the sooner you cease your visits the better. I hope, now, that no young woman will be offended at this, and think me too severe on her sex. I am only saying, I am only telling a woman, that which all men think, and, it is a decided advantage to them to be fully informed of our thoughts on the subject. If anyone, who shall read this, find, upon self-examination, that she is defective in this respect, there is plenty of time for correcting the defect. In the dress you can, amongst rich people, find little whereon to form a judgment as to cleanliness, because they have not only the dress prepared for them, but put upon them into the bargain. But, in the middle rank of life, the dress is a good criterion in two respects, first, as to its color, for, if the white be a sort of yellow, cleanly hands would have been at work to prevent that. A white yellow cravat, or shirt, on a man, speaks, at once, the character of his wife, and, be assured, that she will not take with your dress pains which she has never taken with her own. Then, the manner of putting on the dress is no bad foundation for judging. If it be careless, slovenly, if it do not fit properly, no matter for its mean quality, mean as it may be, it may be neatly and trimly put on, and, if it be not, take care of yourself, for, as you will soon find to your cost, a sloven in one thing is a sloven in all things. The country people judge greatly from the state of the covering of the ankles and, if that be not clean and tight, they conclude, that all out of sight is not what it ought to be. Look at the shoes. If they be trodden on one side, loose on the foot, or run down at the heel, it is a very bad sign, and, as to slipshod, though coming down in the morning and even before daylight, make up your mind to a rope, rather than to live with a slipshod wife. Oh. How much do women lose by an attention to these matters? Men, in general, say nothing about it to their wives, but they think about it, they envy their luckier neighbors, and in numerous cases, consequences the most serious arise from this apparently trifling cause. Beauty is valuable, it is one of the ties, and a strong tie too, that, however, cannot last to old age, but, the charm of cleanliness never ends but with life itself. I dismiss this part of my subject with a quotation from my year's residence in America, containing words which I venture to recommend to every young woman to engrave on her heart, the sweetest flowers, when they become putrid, stink the most, and a nasty woman is the nastiest thing in nature. Knowledge of domestic affairs. Without more or less of this knowledge, a lady, even the wife of a peer, is but a poor thing. It was the fashion, in former times, for ladies to understand a great deal about these affairs, and it would be very hard to make me believe that this did not tend to promote the interests and honor of their husbands. The affairs of a great family never can be well managed, if left wholly to hirelings, and there are many parts of these affairs in which it would be unseemly for the husband to meddle. Surely, no lady can be too high in rank to make it proper for her to be well acquainted with the characters and general demeanor of all the female servants. To receive and give them characters is too much to be left to a servant, however good, and of service however long. Much of the ease and happiness of the great and rich must depend on the character of those by whom they are served, they live under the same roof with them, they are frequently the children of their tenants, or poorer neighbors, the conduct of their whole lives must be influenced by the examples and precepts which they hear imbibe, and when ladies consider how much more weight there must be in one word from them than in ten thousand words from a person who, call her what you like, is still a fellow servant, it does appear strange that they should forego the performance of this at once important and pleasing part of their duty. It was from the mentions of noblemen and gentlemen, and not from boarding schools, that farmers and tradesmen formerly took their wives, and though these days are gone, with little chance of returning, there is still something left for ladies to do in checking the torrent of immorality which is now crowding the streets with prostitutes and cramming the jails with thieves. I am, however, addressing myself, in this work, to persons in the middle rank of life, and here knowledge of domestic affairs is so necessary in every wife, that the lover ought to have it continually in his eye. Not only a knowledge of these affairs, not only to know how things ought to be done, but how to do them, not only to know what ingredients ought to be put into a pie or a pudding, but to be able to make the pie or the pudding. Young people, when they come together, ought not, unless they have fortunes, or are in a great way of business, to think about servants. Servants for what? To help them to eat and drink and sleep? When children come, there must be some help in a farmer's or tradesman's house, but until then, what call for a servant in the house, the master of which has to earn every mouthful that is consumed? I shall, when I come to address myself to the husband, have much more to say upon this subject of keeping servants, but, what the lover, if he be not quite blind, has to look to, is, that his intended wife know how to do the work of a house, unless he have fortune sufficient to keep her like a lady. Eating and drinking, as I observe in cottage economy, came three times every day, they must come, and, however little we may, in the days of our health and vigor, care about choice food and about cookery, we very soon get tired of heavy or burnt bread and of spoiled joints of meat, we bear them for a time, or for two, perhaps, but, about the third time, we lament inwardly, about the fifth time, it must be an extraordinary honeymoon that will keep us from complaining, if the like continue. For a month or two, we begin to repent, and then adieu to all our anticipated delights. We discover, when it is too late, that we have not got a helpmate, but a burden, and, the fire of love being damped, the unfortunately educated creature, whose parents are more to blame than she is, is, unless she resolve to learn her duty, doomed to lead a life very nearly approaching to that of misery, for, however considerate the husband, he never can esteem her as he would have done, had she been skilled and able in domestic affairs. The mere manual performance of domestic labors is not, indeed, absolutely necessary in the female head of the family of
It was said of a famous French commander, that, in attacking an enemy, he did not say to his men go on, but come on, and, whoever had well observed the movements of servants, must know what a prodigious difference there is in the effect of the words, go and come. A very good rule would be, to have nothing to eat, in a farmer's or tradesman's house, that the mistress did not know how to prepare and to cook, no pudding, tart, pie or cake, that she did not know how to make. Never fear the toil to her, exercise is good for health, and without health there is no beauty, a sick beauty may excite pity, but pity is a short-lived passion. Besides, what is the labor in such a case? And how many thousands of ladies, who all weigh the day, would give half their fortunes for that sound sleep which the stirring housewife seldom fails to enjoy? Yet, if a young farmer or tradesman marry a girl, who has been brought up to play music, to what is called draw, to sing, to waste paper, pen, and ink, in writing long and half romantic letters, and to see shows, and plays, and read novels, if a young man do marry such an unfortunate young creature, let him bear the consequences with temper, let him be just, and justice will teach him to treat her with great indulgence, to endeavor to cause her to learn her business as a wife, to be patient with her, to reflect that he has taken her, being apprised of her inability, to bear in mind, that he was, or seemed to be, pleased with her showing useless acquirements, and that, when the gratification of his passion has been accomplished, he is unjust and cruel and unmanly, if he turn round upon her, and accuse her of a want of that knowledge, which he well knew that she did not possess. For my part, I do not know, nor can I form an idea of, a more unfortunate being than a girl with a mere boarding school education, and without a fortune to enable her to keep a servant, when married. Of what use are her accomplishments? Of what use her music, her drawing, and her romantic epistles? If she be good in her nature, the first little faint cry of her first baby drives all the tunes and all the landscapes and all the Clarissa Harlows out of her head forever. I once saw a very striking instance of this sort. It was a climb over the wall match, and I gave the bride away, at S.T. Margaret's Church, Westminster, the pair being as handsome a pair as ever I saw in my life. Beauty, however, though in double quantity, would not pay the bigger and butcher, and, after an absence of little better than a year, I found the husband in prison for debt, but either found also his wife, with her baby, and she, who had never, before her marriage, known what it was to get water to wash her own hands, and whose talk was all about music, and the like, was now the cheerful sustainer of her husband, and the most affectionate of mothers. All the music and all the drawing, and all the plays and romances were gone to the wines. The husband and baby had fairly supplanted them, and even this prison scene was a blessing, as it gave her, at this early stage, an opportunity of proving her devotion to her husband, who, though I have not seen him for about fifteen years, he being in a part of America which I could not reach when last there, has, I am sure, amply repaid her for that devotion. They have now a numerous family, not less than twelve children, I believe, and she is, I am told, a most excellent and able mistress of a respectable house. But, this is a rare instance, the husband, like his countrymen in general, was at once brave, humane, gentle, and considerate, and the love was so sincere and ardent, on both sides, that it made losses and sufferings appear as nothing. When I, in a sort of half-whisper, asked Mrs. At, dollar number at dollar at where her piano was, she smiled and turned her face towards her baby, that was sitting on her knee, as much as to say, this little fellow has beaten the piano, and, if what I am now writing should ever have the honor to be read by her, let it be the bearer of a renewed expression of my admiration of her conduct, and of that regard for her kind and sensible husband, which time and distance have not in the least diminished, and which will be an inmate of my heart until it shall cease to beat. The like of this is, however, not to be expected. No man ought to think that he has even a chance of it. Besides, the husband was, in this case, a man of learning and of great natural ability. He has not had to get his bread by farming or trade, and, in all probability, his wife has had the leisure to practice those acquirements which she possessed at the time of her marriage. But, can this be the case with the farmer or the tradesman's wife? She has to help to earn a provision for her children, or, at the least, to help to earn a store for sickness or old age. She, therefore, ought to be qualified to begin, at once, to assist her husband in his earnings. The way in which she can most efficiently assist is by taking care of his property, by expending his money to the greatest advantage, by wasting nothing, by making the table sufficiently abundant with the least expense. And how is she to do these things, unless she have been brought up to understand domestic affairs? How is she to do these things, if she have been taught to think these matters beneath her study? How is any man to expect her to do these things, if she have been so bred up as to make her habitually look upon them as worthy the attention of none but low and ignorant women? Ignorant, indeed. Ignorance consists in want of knowledge of those things which your calling or state of life naturally supposes you to understand. A plowman is not an ignorant man because he does not know how to read, if he knows how to plow, he is not to be called an ignorant man, but, a wife may be justly called an ignorant woman, if she does not know how to provide a dinner for her husband. It is cold comfort for a hungry man, to tell him how delightfully his wife plays and sings, lovers may live on very aerial diet, but husbands stand in need of the solids, and young women may take my word for it, that a constantly clean board, well cooked fiddles, a house in order, and a cheerful fire, will do more in preserving a husband's heart, than all the accomplishments, taught in all the establishments in the world. Good temper. This is a very difficult thing to ascertain beforehand. Smiles are so cheap, they are so easily put on for the occasion, and, besides, the frowns are, according to the lover's whim, interpreted into the contrary. By good temper, I do not mean easy temper, a serenity which nothing disturbs, for that is a mark of laziness. Sulkiness, if you be not too blind to perceive it, is a temper to be avoided by all means. A sulky man is bad enough, what, then, must be a sulky woman, and that woman a wife, a constant inmate, a companion day and night. Only think of the delight of sitting at the same table, and sleeping in the same bed, for a week, and not exchange a word all the while. Very bad to be scolding for such a length of time, but this is far better than the sulks. If you have your eyes, and look sharp, you will discover symptoms of this, if it unhappily exists. She will, at some time or other, show it towards someone or other of the family, or, perhaps, towards yourself, and you may be quite sure that, in this respect, marriage will not mend her. Sulkiness arises from capricious displeasure, displeasure not founded in reason. The party takes offense unjustifiably, is unable to frame a complaint, and therefore expresses displeasure by silence. The remedy for sulkiness is, to suffer it to take its full swing, but it is better not to have the disease in your house, and to be married to it is little short of madness. Querulousness is a great fault. No man, and, especially, no woman, likes to hear eternal plaintiveness. That she complain, and roundly complain, of your want of punctuality, of your coolness, of your neglect, of your liking the company of others, these are all very well, more especially as they are frequently but too just. But an everlasting complaining, without rhyme or reason, is a bad sign. It shows want of patience, and, indeed, want of sense. But, the contrary of this, a cold indifference, is still worse. When will you come again? You can never find time to come here. You like any company better than mine. These, when groundless, are very teasing, and demonstrate a disposition too full of anxiousness, but, from a girl who always receives you with the same civil smile, lets you, at your own good pleasure, depart with the same, and who, when you take her by the hand, holds her cold fingers as straight as sticks, I say, or should if I were young, God, in his mercy, preserve me. Pertinacity is a very bad thing in anybody, and especially in a young woman, and it is sure to increase in force with the age of the party. To have the last word is a poor triumph, but with some people it is a species of disease of the mind. In a wife it must be extremely troublesome, and, if you find an ounce of it in the maid, it will become a pound in the wife. An eternal disputer is a most disagreeable companion, and where young women thrust their say into conversations carried on by older persons, give their opinions in a positive manner, and court a contest of the tongue, those must be very bold men who will encounter them as wives. Still, of all the faults is to temper, your melancholy ladies have the worst, unless you have the same mental disease. Most wives are, at times, misery makers, but these carry it on as a regular trade. They are always unhappy about something, either past, present, or to come. Both
The argument is, that beauty exposes the possessor to greater temptation than women not beautiful are exposed to, and that, therefore, their fall is more probable. Let us see a little how this matter stands. It is certainly true, that pretty girls will have more, and more ardent, admirers than ugly ones, but, as to the temptation when in their unmarried state, there are few so very ugly as to be exposed to no temptation at all, and, which is the most likely to resist, she who has a choice of lovers, or she who if she let the occasion slip may never have it again. Which of the two is most likely to set a high value upon her reputation, she who all beholders admire, or she who is admired, at best, by mere chance. And as to women in the married state, this argument assumes, that, when they fall, it is from their own vicious disposition, when the fact is, that, if you search the annals of conjugal infidelity, you will find, that, nine times out of ten, the fault is in the husband. It is his neglect, his flagrant disregard, his frosty indifference, his foul example, it is to be said, nine times out of ten, he owes the infidelity of his wife, and, if I were to say ninety-nine times out of a hundred, the facts, if verified, would, I am certain, bear me out. And whence this neglect, this disregard, this frosty indifference, whence this foul example? Because it is easy, in so many cases, to find some woman more beautiful than the wife. This is no justification for the husband to plead, for he has, with his eyes open, made a solemn contract, if he have not beauty enough to please him, he should have sought it in some other woman, if, as is frequently the case, he have preferred rank or money to beauty, he is an unprincipled man, if he do anything to make her unhappy who has brought him the rank or the money. At any rate, as conjugal infidelity is, in so many cases, as it is generally caused by the want of affection and due attention in the husband, it follows, of course, that it must more frequently happen in the case of ugly than in that of handsome women. In point of dress, nothing need be said to convince any reasonable man that beautiful women will be less expensive in this respect than women of a contrary description. Experience teaches us that ugly women are always the most studious about their dress, and, if we had never observed upon the subject, reason would tell us that it must be so. Few women are handsome without knowing it, and if they know that their features naturally attract admiration, will they desire to draw it off and to fix it on lace and silks and jewels? As to manners and temper, there are certainly some handsome women who are conceited and arrogant, but, as they have all the best reasons in the world for being pleased with themselves, they afford you the best chance of general good humor, and this good humor is a very valuable commodity in the married state. Some that are called handsome, and that are such at the first glance, are dull, inanimate things, that might as well have been made of wax, or of wood. But, the truth is, that this is not beauty, for this is not to be found only in the form of the features, but in the movements of them also. Besides, here nature is very impartial, for she gives animation promiscuously to the handsome as well as to the ugly, and the want of this in the former is surely as bearable as in the latter. But, the great use of female beauty, the great practical advantage of it is, that it naturally and unavoidably tends to keep the husband in good humor with himself, to make him, to use the dealer's phrase, pleased with his bargain. When old age approaches, and the parties have become endeared to each other by a long series of joint cares and interests, and when children have come and bound them together by the strongest ties that nature has in store, at this age the features in the person are of less consequence, but, in the young days of matrimony, when the roving eye of the bachelor is scarcely become steady in the head of the husband, it is dangerous for him to see, every time he stirs out, a face more captivating than that of the person to whom he is bound for life. Beauty is, in some degree, a matter of taste, what one man admires, another does not, and it is fortunate for us that it is thus. But still there are certain things that all men admire, and a husband is always pleased when he perceives that a portion, at least, of these things are in his own possession, he takes this possession as a compliment to himself, there must, he will think the world will believe, have been some merit in him, some charm, seen or unseen, to have caused him to be blessed with the acquisition. And then there arise so many things, sickness, misfortune in business, losses, many many things, wholly unexpected, and, there are so many circumstances, perfectly nameless, to communicate to the new married man the fact, that it is not a real angel of whom he has got the possession, there are so many things of this sort, so many in such powerful dampers of the passions, and so many incentives to cool reflection, that it requires something, and a good deal too, to keep the husband in. Countenance in this is altered and enlightened state. The passion of women does not cool so soon, the lamp of their love burns more steadily, and even brightens as it burns, and, there is, the young man may be assured, a vast difference in the effect of the fondness of a pretty woman and that of one of a different description, and, let reason and philosophy say what they will, a man will come downstairs of a morning better pleased after seeing the former, than he would after seeing the latter, in her nightcap. To be sure, when a man has, from whatever inducement, once married a woman, he is unjust and cruel if he even slight her on account of her want of beauty, and, if he treat her harshly, on this account, he is a brute. But, it requires a greater degree of reflection and consideration than falls to the lot of men in general to make them act with justice in such a case, and, therefore, the best way is to guard, if you can, against the temptation to commit such injustice, which is to be done in no other way, than by not marrying anyone that you do not think handsome. I must not conclude this address to the lover without something on the subject of seduction and inconstancy. In, perhaps, nineteen cases out of twenty, there is, in the unfortunate cases of illicit gratification, no seduction at all, the passion, the absence of virtue, and the crime, being all mutual. But, there are other cases of a very different description, and where a man goes coolly and deliberately to work, first to gain and rivet the affections of a young girl, then to take advantage of those affections to accomplish that which he knows must be her ruin, and plunge her into misery for life, when a man does this merely for the sake of a momentary gratification, he must be either a selfish and unfeeling brute, unworthy of the name of man, or he must have a heart little inferior, in point of obduracy, to that of the murderer. Let young women, however, be aware, let them be well aware, that few, indeed, are the cases in which this apology can possibly avail them. Their character is not solely theirs, but belongs, in part, to their family and kindred. They may, in the case contemplated, be objects of compassion with the world, but what contrition, what repentance, what remorse, what that even the tenderest benevolence can suggest, is to heal the wounded hearts of humbled, disgraced, but still affectionate, parents, brethren and sisters? As to constancy in lovers, though I do not approve of the saying, at lovers lies Jove laughs, yet, when people are young, one object may supplant another in their affections, not only without criminality in the party experiencing the change, but without blame, and it is honest, and even humane, to act upon the change, because it would be both foolish and cruel to marry one girl while you liked another better, and the same holds good with regard to the other sex. Even when marriage has been promised, and that, too, in the most solemn manner, it is better for both parties to break off, than to be coupled together with the reluctant assent of either, and I have always thought, that actions for damages, on this score, if brought by the girl, show a want of delicacy as well as of spirit, and, if brought by the man, excessive meanness. Some damage may, indeed, have been done to the complaining party, but no damage equal to what that party would have sustained from a marriage, to which the other party would have yielded by a sort of compulsion, producing to almost a certainty what Hogarth, in his marriage all mode, most aptly typifies by two curs, of different sexes, fastened together by what sportsmen call couples, pulling different ways, and snarling and barking and foaming like furies. But when promises have been made to a young woman, when they have been relied on for any considerable time, when it is manifest that her peace and happiness, and, perhaps, her life, depend upon their fulfillment, when things have been carried to this length, the change in the lover ought to be announced in the manner most likely to make the disappointment as supportable as the case will admit of, for, though it is better to break the promise than to marry one while you like another better. Though it is better for both parties, you have no right to break the heart of her who has, and that, too, with your accordance, and, indeed, at your instigation, or, at least, by your encouragement, confided it to your fidelity. You cannot help your change of affections, but you can help making the transfer in such a way as to cause the destruction, or even probable destruction, nay, if it were but the deep misery, of her, to gain whose heart you had pledged your own. You ought to proceed by slow degrees, you ought to call time to your aid in executing a painful task, you ought scrupulously to avoid
Vanity is generally the tempter in this case, a desire to be regarded as being admired by the women, a very despicable species of vanity, but frequently greatly mischievous, notwithstanding. You do not, indeed, actually, in so many words, promise to marry, but the general tenor of your language and deportment has that meaning, you know that your meaning is so understood, and if you have not such meaning, if you be fixed by some previous engagement with, or greater liking for, another, if you know you are here sowing the seeds of disappointment, and if you, keeping your previous engagement or greater liking a secret, persevere, in spite of the admonitions of conscience, you are. Guilty of deliberate deception, injustice, and cruelty, you make to God an ungrateful return for those endowments which have enabled you to achieve this inglorious and unmanly triumph, and if, as is frequently the case, you glory in such triumph, you may have person, riches, talents to excite envy, but every just and humane man will abhor your heart. There are, however, certain cases in which you deceive, or nearly deceive, yourself, cases in which you are, by degrees and by circumstances, deluded into something very nearly resembling sincere love for a second object, the first still, however, maintaining her ground in your heart, cases in which you are not actuated by vanity, in which you are not guilty of injustice and cruelty, but cases in which you, nevertheless, do wrong, and as I once did a wrong of this sort myself, I will here give. The history of it, as a warning to every young man who shall read this little book, that being the best end, indeed, the only atonement, that I can make, or ever could have made, for this only serious sin that I ever committed against the female sex. The province of New Brunswick, in North America, in which I passed my years from the age of 18 to that of 26, consists, in general, of heaps of rocks, in the interstices of which grow the pine, the spruce, and various sorts of fir trees, or, where the woods have been burnt down, the bushes of the raspberry or those of the huckleberry. The province is cut asunder lengthwise, by a great river, called the S.T. John, about 200 miles in length, and, at halfway from the mouth, full a mile wide. Into this main river run innumerable smaller rivers, they're called creeks. On the sides of these creeks the land is, in places, clear of rocks, it is, in these places, generally good and productive, the trees that grow here are the birch, the maple, and others of the deciduous class, natural meadows here and there present themselves, and some of these spots far surpass in rural beauty any other that my eyes ever beheld, the creeks, abounding towards their sources in waterfalls of endless variety, as well in form as in magnitude, and always teeming with fish, while waterfowl enliven their surface, and while wild pigeons, of the gayest plumage, flutter, in thousands upon thousands, amongst the branches of the beautiful trees, which, sometimes, for miles together, form an arch over the creeks. I, in one of my rambles in the woods, in which I took great delight, came to a spot at a very short distance from the source of one of these creeks. Here was everything to delight the eye, and especially of one like me, who seemed to have been born to love rural life and trees and plants of all sorts. Here were about two hundred acres of natural meadow, interspersed with patches of maple trees in various forms and of various extent, the creek, there about thirty miles from its point of joining the ST. John, ran down the middle of the spot, which formed a sort of dish, the high and rocky hills rising all round it, except at the outlet of the creek, and these hills crowned with lofty pines, in the hills were the sources of the creek, the waters of which came down in cascades, for any one of which many a nobleman in England would, if he could transfer it, give a good slice of his fertile estate, and in the creek, at the foot of the cascades, there were, in the season, salmon the finest in the world, and so abundant, and so easily taken, as to be used for manuring the land. If nature, in her very best humor, had made a spot for the express purpose of captivating me, she could not have exceeded the efforts which she had here made. But I found something here besides these rude works of nature, I found something in the fashioning of which man had had something to do. I found a large and well-built log dwelling house, standing, in the month of September, on the edge of a very good field of Indian corn, by the side of which there was a piece of buckwheat just then mowed. I found a homestead, and some very pretty cows. I found all the things by which an easy and happy farmer is surrounded, and I found still something besides all these, something that was destined to give me a great deal of pleasure and also a great deal of pain, both in their extreme degree, and both of which, in spite of the lapse of forty years, now make an attempt to rush back into my heart. Partly from misinformation, and partly from miscalculation, I had lost my way, and, quite alone, but armed with my sword and a brace of pistols, to defend myself against the bears, I arrived at the log house in the middle of a moonlight night, the hoarfrost covering the trees and the grass. A stout and clamorous dog, kept off by the gleaming of my sword, with the master of the house, who got up, received me with great hospitality, got me something to eat, and put me into a feather bed, a thing that I had been a stranger to for some years. I, being very tired, had tried to pass the night in the woods, between the trunks of two large trees, which had fallen side by side, and within a yard of each other. I had made a nest for myself of dry fern, and had made a covering by laying boughs of spruce across the trunks of the trees. But unable to sleep on account of the cold, becoming sick from the great quantity of water that I had drank during the heat of the day, and being, moreover, alarmed at the noise of the bears, unless one of them should find me in a defenseless state, I had roused myself up, and had crept along as well as I could. So that no hero of Eastern romance ever experienced a more enchanting change. I had got into the house of one of those Yankee loyalists, who, at the close of the Revolutionary War, which, until it had succeeded, was called a rebellion, had accepted a grant of land in the King's province of New Brunswick, and who, to the great honor of England, had been furnished with all the means of making new and comfortable settlements. I was suffered to sleep till breakfast time, when I found a table, the like of which I have since seen so many in the United States, loaded with good things. The master and the mistress of the house, aged about fifty, were like what an English farmer and his wife were half a century ago. There were two sons, tall and stout, who appeared to have come in from work, and the youngest of whom was about my age, then twenty-three. But there was another member of the family, aged nineteen, who, dressed according to the neat and simple fashion of New England, when she had come with her parents five or six years before, had her long light brown hair twisted nicely up, and fastened on the top of her head, in which head were a pair of lively blue eyes, associated with features of which that softness and that sweetness, so characteristic of American girls, were the predominant expressions, the whole being set off by complexion indicative of glowing health, and forming, figure, movements, and all taken together, an assemblage of beauties, far surpassing any that I had ever seen but once in my life. That once was, two, two years gone, and, in such a case and at such an age, two years, two whole years, is a long, long while. It was a space as long as the eleventh part of my then life. Here was the present against the absent, here was the power of the eyes pitted against that of the memory, here were all the senses up in arms to subdue the influence of the thoughts, here was vanity, here was passion, here was the spot of all spots in the world, and here were also the life, and the manners and the habits and the pursuits that I delighted in, here was everything that imagination can conceive, united in a conspiracy against the poor little brunette in England. What, then, did I fall in love at once with this bouquet of lilies and roses? Oh, by no means. I was, however, so enchanted with the place, I so much enjoyed its tranquility, the shade of the maple trees, the business of the farm, the sports of the water and of the woods, that I stated it to the last possible minute, promising, at my departure, to come again as often as I possibly could, a promise which I most punctually fulfilled. Winter is the great season for jaunting and dancing, called frolicking, in America. In this province the river and the creeks were the only roads from settlement to settlement. In summer we traveled in canoes, in winter in sleighs on the ice or snow. During more than two years I spent all the time I could with my Yankee friends, they were all fond of me, I talked to them about country affairs, my evident delight in which they took as a compliment to themselves, the father and mother treated me as one of their children, the sons as a brother, and the daughter, who was as modest and as full of sensibility as she was beautiful, in a way to which a chap much less sanguine than I was would have given the tenderest interpretation, which treatment, I, especially in the last mentioned case, most cordially repaid. It is when you meet in company with others of your own age that you are, in love matters, put, most frequently, to the test, and exposed to detection. The next door neighbor might, in that country, be ten miles off. We used to have a frolic, sometimes at one house and sometimes at
Many times I put to myself the questions, what am I it? Is not this wrong? Why do I go? But still I went. Then, further in my excuse, my prior engagement, though carefully left unalluded to by both parties, was, in that thin population, and owing to the singular circumstances of it, and to the great talk that there always was about me, perfectly well known to her and all her family. It was matter of so much notoriety and conversation in the province, that General Carlton, brother of the late Lord Dorchester, who was the governor when I was there, when he, about fifteen years afterwards, did me the honor, on his return to England, to come and see me at my house in Duke Street, Westminster, asked, before he went away, to see my wife, of whom he had heard so much before her marriage. So that here was no deception on my part, but still I ought not to have suffered even the most distant hope to be entertained by a person so innocent, so amiable, for whom I had so much affection, and to whose heart I had no right to give a single twinge. I ought, from the very first, to have prevented the possibility of her ever feeling pain on my account. I was young, to be sure, but I was old enough to know what was my duty in this case, and I ought, dismissing my own feelings, to have had the resolution to perform it. The last parting came, and now came my just punishment. The time was known to everybody, and was irrevocably fixed, for I had to move with the regiment, and the embarkation of a regiment is an epic in a thinly settled province. To describe this parting would be too painful even at this distant day, and with this frost of age upon my head. The kind and virtuous father came forty miles to see me just as I was going on board in the river. His looks and words I have never forgotten. As the vessel descended, she passed the mouth of that creek which I had so often entered with delight, and though England, and all that England contained, were before me, I lost sight of this creek with an aching heart. On what trifles turned the great events in the life of man? If I had received a cool letter from my intended wife, if I had only heard a rumor of anything from which fickleness in her might have been inferred, if I had found in her any, even the smallest, abatement of affection, if she had but let go any one of the hundred strings by which she held my heart, if any of these, never would the world have heard of me. Young as I was, able as I was as a soldier, proud as I was of the admiration and commendations of which I was the object, fond as I was, too, of the command, which, at so early an age, my rare conduct and great natural talents had given me, sanguineous was my mind, and brilliant as were my prospects, yet I had seen so much of the meannesses, the unjust partialities, the insolent pomposity, the disgusting dissipations of that way of life, that I was weary of it, I longed, exchanging my fine. Lace coat for the Yankee farmer's homespun, to be where I should never behold the supple crouch of servility, and never hear the hectoring voice of authority, again, and, on the lonely banks of this branch-covered creek, which contained, she out of the question, everything congenial to my taste and dear to my heart, I, unapplauded, unfeared, unenvied and uncalumniated, should have lived and died. Letter 4. To husband. It is in this capacity that your conduct will have the greatest effect on your happiness, and a great deal will depend on the manner in which you begin. I am to suppose that you have made a good choice, but a good young woman may be made, by a weak, a harsh, a neglectful, an extravagant, or a profligate husband, a really bad wife and mother. All in a wife, beyond her own natural disposition and education is, nine times out of ten, the work of her husband. The first thing of all, be the rank in life what it may, is to convince her of the necessity of moderation and expense, and to make her clearly see the justice of beginning to act upon the presumption that there are children coming, that they are to be provided for, and that she is to assist in the making of that provision. Legally speaking, we have a right to do what we please with our own property, which, however, is not our own, unless it exceed our debts. And, morally speaking, we, at the moment of our marriage, contract a debt with the naturally to be expected fruit of it, and, therefore, reserving further remarks upon this subject till I come to speak of the education of children, the scale of expense should, at the beginning, be as low as that of which due attention to rank in life will admit. The great danger of all is, beginning with servants, or a servant. Where there are riches, or where the business is so great as to demand help in the carrying on of the affairs of a house, one or more female servants must be kept, but, where the work of a house can be done by one pair of hands, why should there be two, especially as you cannot have the hands without having the mouth, and, which is frequently not less costly, inconvenient, and injurious, the tongue. When children come, there must, at times, be some foreign aid, but, until then, what need can the wife of a young tradesman, or even farmer, unless the family be great, have of a servant? The wife is young, and why is she not to work as well as the husband? What justice is there in wanting you to keep two women instead of one? You have not married them both in form, but, if they be inseparable, you have married them in substance, and if you are free from the crime of bigamy, you have the far most burdensome part of its consequences. I am well aware of the unpopularity of this doctrine, well aware of its hostility to prevalent habits, well aware that almost every tradesman and every farmer, though with scarcely a shilling to call his own, and that every clerk, and every such person, begins by keeping a servant, and that the latter is generally provided before the wife be insult, I am well aware of all this, but knowing, from long and attentive observation, that it is the great bane of the marriage life, the great cause, of that penury, and of those numerous and tormenting embarrassments, amidst which conjugal felicity can seldom long be kept alive, I give you advice, and state the reasons on which it was founded. In London, or near it, a maid servant cannot be kept at an expense so low as that of thirty pounds a year, for, besides her wages, board, and lodging, there must be a fire solely for her, or she must sit with the husband and wife, hear every word that passes between them, and between them and their friends, which will, of course, greatly add to the pleasures of their fireside. To keep her tongue still would be impossible, and, indeed, unreasonable, and if, as may frequently happen, she be prettier than the wife, she will know how to give the suitable interpretation to the looks which, to next to a certainty, she will occasionally get from him, whom, as it were in mockery, she calls by the name of master. This is almost downright bigamy, but this can never do, and, therefore, she must have a fire to herself. Besides the blaze of coals, however, there is another sort of flame that she will inevitably covet. She will by no means be sparing of the coals, but, well fed and well washed, as she will be, whatever you may be, she will naturally cipher the fire of love, for which she carries in her bosom a match always ready prepared. In plain language, you have a man to keep, apart, at least, of every week, and the leg of lamb, which might have lasted you and your wife for three days, will, by this gentleman's size, be borne away in one. Shut the door against this intruder, out she goes herself, and, if she go empty-handed, she is no true Christian, or, at least, will not be looked upon as such by the charitable friend at whose house she meets the longing soul, dying partly with love and partly with hunger. The cost, altogether, is nearer fifty pounds a year than thirty. How many thousands of tradesmen and clerks, and the like, who might have passed through life without a single embarrassment, have lived in continual trouble and fear, and found a premature grave, from this very cause, and this cause alone. When I, on my return from America, and, lived a short time in St. James's Street, following my habit of early rising, I used to see the servant maids, at almost every house, dispensing charity at the expense of their masters, long before they, good men, opened their eyes, who thus did deeds of benevolence, not only without boasting of them, but without knowing of them. Meat, bread, cheese, butter, coals, candles, all came with equal freedom from these liberal hands. I have observed the same, in my early walks and rides, in every part of this great place and its environs. Where there is one servant it is worse than where there are two or more, for, happily for their employers, they do not always agree. So that the oppression is most heavy on those who are the least able to bear it, and particularly on clerk, and such like people, whose wives seem to think, that, because the husband's work is of a genteel description, they ought to live the life of ladies. Poor fellows. Their work is not hard and rough, to be sure, but, it is work, and work for many hours too, and painful enough, and as to their income, it scarcely exceeds, on an average, the double, at any rate, of that of a journeyman carpenter, bricklayer, or tailor. Besides, the man and wife will live on cheaper diet and drink than a servant will live. Thousands, who would never have had beer in their house, have it for the servant, who will not live without it. However frugal your wife, her frugality is of little use, if she have one of these inmates to provide for. Many hundred thousand times has it happened that the butcher and the butter man have been applied to solely because there was a serv
Not able. The young woman not able to cook and wash, and mend and make, and clean the house and make the bed for one young man and herself, and that young man her husband too, who is quite willing, if he be worth a straw, to put up with cold dinner, or with a crust, to get up and light her fire, to do anything that the mind can suggest to spare her labor, and to conduce to her convenience. Not able to do this? Then, if she brought no fortune, and he had none, she ought not to have been able to marry, and, let me tell you, young man, a small fortune would not put a servant keeping wife upon an equality with one who required no such a maid. If, indeed, the work of a house were harder than a young woman could perform without pain, or great fatigue, if it had a tendency to impair her health or deface her beauty, then you might hesitate, but, it is not too hard, and it tends to preserve health, to keep the spirits buoyant, and, of course, to preserve beauty. You often hear girls, while scrubbing or washing, singing till they are out of breath, but never while they are at what they call working at the needle. The American wives are most exemplary in this respect. They have none of that false pride, which prevents thousands in England from doing that which interest, reason, and even their own inclination would prompt them to do. They work, not from necessity, not from compulsion of any sort, for their husbands are the most indulgent in the whole world. In the towns they go to the market, and cheerfully carry home the result, in the country, they not only do the work in the house, but extend their labors to the garden, plant, and weed and hoe, and gather and preserve the fruits and the herbs, and this, too, in a climate far from being so favorable to labor as that of England, and they are amply repaid for these by those gratifications which their excellent economy enables their husbands to bestow upon them, and which it is their universal habit to do with a liberal hand. But did I practice what I am here preaching? I, and to the full extent. Till I had a second child, no servant ever entered my house, though well able to keep one, and never, in my whole life, did I live in a house so clean, in such trim order, and never have I eaten or drunk, or slept or dressed, in a manner so perfectly to my fancy, as I did then. I had a great deal of business to attend to, that took me a great part of the day from home, but, whenever I could spare a minute from business, the child was in my arms, I rendered the mother's labor as light as I could, any bit of food satisfied me, when washing was necessary, we shared it between us, and that famous grammar for teaching French people English, which has been for thirty years, and still is, the great work of this kind, throughout all America, and in every nation in Europe, was written by me, in hours not employed in business, and, in great part, during my share of the night washings over a sick, and then only child, who, after lingering many months, died in my arms. This was the way that we went on, this was the way that we began the married life, and surely, that which we did with pleasure no young couple, unendowed with fortune, ought to be ashamed to do. But she may be ill, the time may be near at hand, or may have actually arrived, when she must encounter that particular pain and danger of which you have been the happy cause. Oh, that is quite another matter. And if you now exceed in care, in watchings over her, in tender attention to all her wishes, in anxious efforts to quiet her fears, if you exceed in pains and expense to procure her relief and secure her life, if you, in any of these, exceed that which I would recommend, you must be romantic indeed. She deserves them all, and more than all, ten thousand times told. And now it is that you feel the blessing conferred by her economy. That heap of money, which might have been squandered on, or by, or in consequence of, an useless servant, you now have an hand wherewith to procure an abundance of that skill and that attendance of which she stands in absolute need, and she, when restored to you in smiling health, has the just pride to reflect, that she may have owed her life and your happiness to the effects of her industry. It is the beginning that is everything in this important case, and you will have, perhaps, much to do to convince her, not that what you recommend is advantageous, not that it is right, but to convince her that she can do it without sinking below the station that she ought to maintain. She would cheerfully do it, but there are her next door neighbors, who do not do it, though, in all other respects, on a PAR with her. It is not laziness, but pernicious fashion, that you will have to combat. But the truth is, that there ought to be no combat at all, this important matter ought to be settled and fully agreed on beforehand. If she really love you, and have common sense, she will not hesitate a moment, and if she be deficient in either of these respects, and if you be so mad in love as to be unable to exist without her, it is better to cease to exist at once, than to become the toiling and embarrassed slave of a wasting and pillaging servant. The next thing to be attended to is, your demeanor towards a young wife. As to oldish ones, or widows, time and other things have, in most cases, blunted their feelings, and rendered harsh or stern demeanor in the husband a matter not of heartbreaking consequence. But with a young and inexperienced one, the case is very different, and you should bear in mind, that the first frown that she receives from you is a dagger to her heart. Nature has so ordered it, that men shall become less ardent in their passion after the wedding day, and that women shall not. Their ardor increases rather than the contrary, and they are surprisingly quick-sighted and inquisitive on this score. When the child comes, it divides this ardor with the father, but until then you have it all, and if you have a mind to be happy, repay it with all your soul. Let what may happen to put you out of humor with others, let nothing put you out of humor with her. Let your words and looks and manners be just what they were before you called her wife. But now, and throughout your life, show your affection for her, and your admiration of her, not in nonsensical compliment, not in picking up her handkerchief, or her glove, or in carrying her fan or parasol, not, if you have the means, in hanging trinkets and baubles upon her, not in making yourself a fool by winking at, and seeming pleased at, her foibles, or follies, or faults, but show them by acts of real goodness towards her, proof by unequivocal deeds the high value that you set on her. Health and life and peace of mind, let your praise of her go to the full extent of her deserts, but let it be consistent with truth and with sense, and such as to convince her of your sincerity. He who is the flatterer of his wife only prepares her ears for the hyperbolical stuff of others. The kindest appellation that her Christian name affords is the best you can use, especially before faces. An everlasting, my dear, is but a sorry compensation for want of that sort of love that makes the husband cheerfully toil by day, break his rest by night, endure all sorts of hardships, if the life or health of his wife demand it. Let your deeds, and not your words, carry to her heart a daily and hourly confirmation of the fact that you value her health and life and happiness beyond all other things in the world, and let this be manifest to her, particularly at those times when life is always more or less in danger. I began my young marriage days in and near Philadelphia. At one of those times to which I have just alluded, in the middle of the burning hot month of July, I was greatly afraid of fatal consequences to my wife for want of sleep, she not having, after the great danger was over, had any sleep for more than forty-eight hours. All great cities, in hot countries, are, I believe, full of dogs, and they, in the very hot weather, keep up, during the night, a horrible barking and fighting and howling. Upon the particular occasion to which I am adverting, they made a noise so terrible and so unremitted, that it was next to impossible that even a person in full health and free from pain should obtain a minute's sleep. I was, about nine in the evening, sitting by the bed, I do think, said she, that I could go to sleep now, if it were not for the dogs. Downstairs I went, and out I sallied, in my shirt and trousers, and without shoes and stockings, and, going to a heap of stones lying beside the road, set to work upon the dogs, going backward and forward, and keeping them at two or three hundred yards distance from the house. I walked thus the whole night, barefooted, lest the noise of my shoes might possibly reach her ears, and I remember that the bricks of the causeway were, even in the night, so hot as to be disagreeable to my feet. My exertions produced the desired effect, a sleep of several hours was the consequence, and, at eight o'clock in the morning, off went I to a day's business, which was to end at six in the evening. Women are all patriots of the soil, and when her neighbors used to ask my wife whether all English husbands were like hers, she boldly answered in the affirmative. I had business to occupy the whole of my time, Sundays and weekdays, except sleeping hours, but I used to make time to assist her in the taking care of her baby, and in all sorts of things, get up, light her fire, boil her tea kettle, carry her up warm water in cold weather, take the child while she dressed herself and got the breakfast ready, then breakfast, get her in water and wood for the day, then dress myself neatly, and sally forth to my business. The moment that was over I used to hasten back to her again, and I no more thought of spending a moment away from her, unless business compelled me, than I thought of quitting the
I never dangled about at the heels of my wife, seldom, very seldom, ever walked out, as it is called, with her, I never went to walking in the whole course of my life, never went to walk without having some object in view other than the walk, and, as I never could walk at a slow pace, it would have been hard work for her to keep up with me, so that, in the nearly forty years of our married life, we have not walked out together, perhaps, twenty times. I hate a dangler, who is more like a footman than a husband. It is very cheap to be kind in trifles, but that which rivets the affections is not to be purchased with money. The great thing of all, however, is to prove your anxiety at those times of peril to her, and for which times you, nevertheless, wish. Upon those occasions I was never from home, be the necessity for it ever so great, it was my rule, that everything must give way to that. In the year, some English local militiamen were flogged, in the Isle of Ely, in England, under a guard of Hanoverians, then stationed in England. I, reading an account of this in a London newspaper, called The Career, expressed my indignation at it in such terms as it became an Englishman to do. The Attorney General, Gibbs, was set on upon me, he harassed me for nearly a year, then brought me to trial, and I was, by Ellen Burrow, Gross, Ellie Blanc, and Bailey, sentenced to two years imprisonment in Newgate, to pay a fine to the King of a thousand pounds, and to be held in heavy bail for seven years after the expiration of the imprisonment. Everyone regarded it as a sentence of death. I lived in the country at the time, seventy miles from London, I had a farm on my hands, I had a family of small children, amongst whom I had constantly lived, I had a most anxious and devoted wife, who was, too, in that state, which rendered the separation more painful tenfold. I was put into a place amongst felons, from which I had to rescue myself at the price of twelve guineas a week for the whole of the two years. The king, poor man, was, at the close of my imprisonment, not in a condition to receive the thousand pounds, but his son, the present king, punctually received it in his name and behalf, and he keeps it still. The sentence, though it proved not to be one of death, was, in effect, one of ruin, as far as then possessed property went. But this really appeared as nothing, compared with the circumstance, that I must now have a child born in a felon's jail, or be absent from the scene at the time of the birth. My wife, who had come to see me for the last time previous to her lying in, perceiving my deep dejection at the approach of her departure for Bali, resolved not to go, and actually went into a lodging as near to Newgate as she could find one, in order that the communication between us might be as speedy as possible, and in order that I might see the doctor, and receive assurances from him relative to her state. The nearest lodging that she could find was in Skinner Street, at the corner of a street leading to Smithfield. So that there she was, amidst the incessant rattle of coaches and butchers' carts, and the noise of cattle, dogs, and bawling men, instead of being in a quiet and commodious country house with neighbors and servants and everything necessary about her. Yet, so great is the power of the mind in such cases, she, though the circumstances proved uncommonly perilous, and were attended with the loss of the child, bore her sufferings with the greatest composure, because, at any minute she could send a message to, and hear from, me. If she had gone to Bali, leaving me in that state of anxiety in which she saw me, I am satisfied that she would have died, and that event taking place at such a distance from me, how was I to contemplate her corpse, surrounded by her distracted children, and to have escaped death, or madness, myself? If such was not the effect of this merciless act of the government towards me, that amiable body may be well assured that I have taken and recorded the will for the deed, and that such it will live in my memory as long as that memory shall last. I make no apology for this account of my own conduct, because example is better than precept, and because I believe that my example may have weight with many thousands, as it has had in respect to early rising, abstinence, sobriety, industry, and mercy towards the poor. It is not, then, dangling about after a wife, it is not the loading her with baubles and trinkets, it is not the jaunting of her about from show to show, and from what is called pleasure to pleasure. It is none of these that endears you to her, it is the adherence to that part of the promise you have made her, with my body I do worship, that is to say, respect and honor by personal attention and acts of affection. And remember, that the greatest possible proof that you can give a real and solid affection is to give her your time, when not wanted in matters of business, when not wanted for the discharge of some duty, either towards the public or towards private persons. Amongst duties of this sort, we must, of course, in some ranks and circumstances of life, include the intercourse amongst friends and neighbors, which may frequently and reasonably call the husband from his home, but what are we to think of the husband who is in the habit of leaving his own fireside, after the business of the day is over, and seeking promiscuous companions in the ale or the coffee house? I am told that, in France, it is rare to meet with a husband who does not spend every evening of his life in what is called a cafe, that is to say, a place for no other purpose than that of gossiping, drinking and gaming. And it is with great sorrow that I acknowledge that many English husbands indulge too much in a similar habit. Drinking clubs, smoking clubs, singing clubs, clubs of odd fellows, whist clubs, sodding clubs, these are inexcusable, they are censurable, they are at once foolish and wicked, even in single men, what must they be, then, in husbands, and how are they to answer, not only to their wives, but to their children, for this profligate abandonment of their homes, this breach of their solemn vow made to the former, this evil example to the latter? Innumerable are the miseries that spring from this cause. The expenses, in the first place, very considerable. I much question whether, amongst tradesmen, a shilling a night pays the average score, and that, too, for that which is really worth nothing at all, and cannot, even by possibility, be attended with any one single advantage, however small. Fifteen pounds a year thus thrown away, would amount, in the course of a tradesman's life, to a decent fortune for a child. Then there is the injury to hell from these night adventures, there are the quarrels, there is the vicious habit of loose and filthy talk, there are the slanders and the backbitings, there is the admiration of contemptible wit, and there are the scoffings at all that is sober and serious. And does the husband who thus abandons his wife and children imagine that she will not, in some degree at least, follow his example? If he do, he is very much deceived. If she imitate him even in drinking, he has no great reason to complain, and then the cost may be two shillings a night instead of one, equal in amount to the cost of all the bread wanted in the family, while the baker's bill is, perhaps, unpaid. Here are the slanderings, too, going on at home, for, while the husbands are assembled, it would be hard if the wives were not to do the same, and the very least that is to be expected is, that the teapot should keep pace with the porter pot or grog glass. Hence crowds of female acquaintances and intruders, and all the consequent and inevitable squabbles which form no small part of the torment of the life of man. If you have servants, they know to a moment the time of your absence, and they regulate their proceedings accordingly. Like master like man, is an old and true proverb, and it is natural, if not just, that it should be thus, for it would be unjust if the careless and neglectful sought were served as faithfully as the vigilant, attentive, and sober man. Late hours, cards, and dice, are amongst the consequences of the master's absence, and why not, seeing that he is setting the example? Fire, candle, profligate visitants, expenses, losses, children ruined in habits and morals, and, in short, a train of evils hardly to be enumerated, arise from this most vicious habit of the master spending his leisure time from home. But beyond all the rest is the ill treatment of the wife. When left to ourselves we all seek the company that we like best, the company in which we take the most delight, and therefore every husband, be his state of life what it may, who spends his leisure time, or who, at least, is in the habit of doing it, in company other than that of his wife and family, tells her in them, as plainly by deeds as he could possibly do by words, that he takes more delight in other company than in theirs. Children repay this with disregard for their father, but to a wife of any sensibility, it is either a dagger to her heart or an incitement to revenge, and revenge, too, of a species which a young woman will seldom be long in want of the means to gratify. In conclusion of these remarks respecting absentee husbands, I would recommend all those who are prone to, or likely to fall into, the practice, to remember the words of Mrs. Sullen, in the post stratagem, my husband, says she, addressing a footman whom she had taken as a paramour, comes reeling home at midnight, tumbles in beside me as a salmon flounces in a net, oversets the economy of my bed, belches the fumes of his drink in my face, then twists himself round, leaving me half naked, and, listening till morning to that tuneful nightingale, his nose. It is at least forty three years since I read the post stratagem, and I now quote from
Let him resolve, from the very first, never to spend an hour from home, unless business, or, at least, some necessary and rational purpose demanded. Where ought he to be, but with the person whom he himself hath chosen to be his partner for life, and the mother of his children? What other company ought he to deem so good and so fitting as this? With whom else can he so pleasantly spend his hours of leisure and relaxation? Besides, if he quit her to seek company more agreeable, is not she set at large by that act of his? What justice is there in confining her at home without any company at all, while he rambles forth in search of company more gay than he finds at home? Let the young married man try the thing, let him resolve not to be seduced from his home, let him never go, in one single instance, unnecessarily from his own fireside. Habit is a powerful thing, and if he begin right, the pleasure that he will derive from it will induce him to continue right. This is not being tied to the apron strings, which means quite another matter, as I shall show by and by. It is being at the husband's place, whether he have children or not. And is there any want of matter for conversation between a man and his wife? Why not talk of the daily occurrences to her, as well as to anybody else, and especially to a company of tickling and noisy men? If you excuse yourself by saying that you go to read the newspaper, I answer, by the newspaper, if you must read it, the cost is not half of what you spend per day at the pothouse, and then you have it your own, and may read it at your leisure, and your wife can read it as well as yourself, if read it you must. And, in short, what must that man be made of, who does not prefer sitting by his own fireside with his wife and children, reading to them, or hearing them read, to hearing the gabble and balderdash of a club or a pothouse company? Men must frequently be from home at all hours of the day and night. Sailors, soldiers, merchants, all men out of the common track of labor, and even some in the very lowest walks, are sometimes compelled by their affairs, or by circumstances, to be from their homes. But what I protest against is, the habit of spending leisure hours from home, and near to it, and doing this without any necessity, and by choice, liking the next door, or any house in the same street, better than your own. When absent from necessity, there is no wound given to the heart of the wife, she concludes that you would be with her if you could, and that satisfies, she laments the absence, but submits to it without complaining. Yet, in these cases, her feelings ought to be consulted as much as possible, she ought to be fully apprised of the probable duration of the absence, and of the time of return, and if these be dependent on circumstances, those circumstances ought to be fully stated, for you have no right to keep her mind upon the rack, when you have it in your power to put it in a state of ease. Few men have been more frequently taken from home by business, or by necessity of some sort, than I have, and I can positively assert, that, as to my return, I never once disappointed my wife in the whole course of our married life. If the time of return was contingent, I never failed to keep her informed from day to day, if the time was fixed, or when it became fixed, my arrival was as sure as my life. Going from London to Bali, once, with Mr. Finnerty, whose name I can never pronounce without an expression of my regard for his memory, we stopped at Alton, to dine with a friend, who, delighted with Finnerty's talk, as everybody else was, kept us till ten or eleven o'clock, and was proceeding to the other bottle, when I put in my protest, saying, we must go, my wife will be frightened. Blood, man, said Finnerty, you do not mean to go home tonight. I told him I did, and then sent my son, who was with us, to order out the postchaise. We had twenty-three miles to go, during which we debated the question, whether Mrs. Cobbett would be up to receive us, I contending for the affirmative, and he for the negative. She was up, and had a nice fire for us to sit down at. She had not committed the matter to a servant, her servants and children were all in bed, and she was up, to perform the duty of receiving her husband and his friend. You did not expect him, said Finnerty. To be sure I did, said she, he never disappointed me in his life. Now, if all young men knew how much value women set upon this species of fidelity, there would be fewer unhappy couples than there are. If men have appointments with lords, they never dream of breaking them, and I can assure them that wives are as sensitive in this respect as lords. I had seen many instances of conjugal unhappiness arising out of that carelessness which left wives in a state of uncertainty as to the movements of their husbands, and I took care, from the very outset, to guard against it. For no man has a right to sport with the feelings of any innocent person whatever, and particularly with those of one who has committed her happiness to his hands. The truth is, that men in general look upon women as having no feelings different from their own, and they know that they themselves would regard such disappointments as nothing. But this is a great mistake, women feel more acutely than men, their love is more ardent, more pure, more lasting, and they are more frank and sincere in the utterance of their feelings. They ought to be treated with due consideration head for all their amiable qualities and all their weaknesses, and nothing by which their minds are affected ought to be deemed a trifle. When we consider what a young woman gives up on her wedding day, she makes a surrender, an absolute surrender, of her liberty, for the joint lives of the parties, she gives the husband the absolute right of causing her to live in what place, and in what manner in what society, he pleases, she gives him the power to take from her, and to use, for his own purposes, all her goods, unless reserved by some legal instrument, and, above all, she surrenders to him her person. Then, when we consider the pains which they endure for us, and the large share of all the anxious parental cares that fall to their lot, when we consider their devotion to us, and how unshaken their affection remains in our elements, even though the most tedious and disgusting, when we consider the offices that they perform, and cheerfully perform, for us, when, were we left to one another, we should perish from neglect, when we consider their devotion to their children, how evidently they love them better, in numerous instances, than their own lives, when we consider these things, how can a just man think anything a trifle that affects their happiness? I was once going, in my gig, up the hill, in the village of Frankfurt, near Philadelphia, when a little girl, about two years old, who had toddled away from a small house, was lying basking in the sun, in the middle of the road. About two hundred yards before I got to the child, the teams, five big horses in each, of three wagons, the drivers of which had stopped to drink at a tavern on the brow of the hill, started off, and came, nearly abreast, galloping down the road. I got my gig off the road as speedily as I could, but expected to see the poor child crushed to pieces. The young man, a journeyman carpenter, who was shingling a shed by the side of the road, seeing the child, and seeing the danger, though a stranger to the parents, jumped from the top of the shed, ran into the road, and snatched up the child, from scarcely an inch before the hoof of the leading horse. The horse's leg knocked him down, but he, catching the child by its clothes, flung it back, out of the way of the other horses, and saved himself by rolling back with surprising agility. The mother of the child, who had, apparently, been watching, seeing the teams coming, and seeing the situation of the child, rushed out, and catching up the child, just as the carpenter had flung it back, and hugging it in her arms, uttered a shriek such as I never heard before, never heard since, and, I hope, shall never hear again, and then she dropped down, as if perfectly dead. By the application of the usual means, she was restored, however, in a little while, and I, being about to depart, asked the carpenter if he were a married man, and whether he were a relation of the parents of the child. He said he was neither, well, then, said I, you merit the gratitude of every father and mother in the world, and I will show mine, by giving you what I have, pulling out the nine or ten dollars that I had in my pocket. No, I thank you, sir, said he, I have only done what it was my duty to do. Bravery, disinterestedness, and maternal affection surpassing these, it is impossible to imagine. The mother was going right in amongst the feet of these powerful and wild horses, and amongst the wheels of the wagons. She had no thought for herself, no feeling of fear for her own life, her shriek was the sound of inexpressible joy, joy too great for her to support herself under. Perhaps ninety-nine mothers out of every hundred would have acted the same part, under similar circumstances. There are, comparatively, very few women not replete with maternal love, and, by the by, take you care, if you meet with a girl who is not fond of children, not to marry her by any means. Some few there are who even make a boast that they cannot bear children, that is, cannot endure them. I never knew a man that was good for much who had a dislike to little children, and I never knew a woman of that taste who was good for anything at all. I have seen a few such in the course of my life, and I have never wished to see one of them a second time. Being fond of little children argues no feminacy in a man, but, as far as my observation has gone, the contrary. A regiment of
To a fond mother you can do nothing so pleasing as to praise the baby, and, the younger it is, the more she values the compliment. Say fine things to her, and take no notice of her baby, and she will despise you. I have often beheld this, in many women, with great admiration, and it is a thing that no husband ought to overlook, for if the wife wish her child to be admired by others, what must be the ardor of her wishes with regard to his admiration? There was a drunken dog of a Norfolk man in our regiment, who came from Thetford, I recollect, who used to say, that his wife would forgive him for spending all the pay, and the washing money into the bargain, if he would but kiss her ugly brat, and say it was pretty. Now, though this was a very profligate fellow, he had philosophy in him, and certain it is, that there is nothing worthy of the name of conjugal happiness, unless the husband clearly evinces that he is fond of his children, and that, too, from their very birth. But though all the aforementioned considerations demand from us the kindest possible treatment of a wife, the husband is to expect dutiful deportment at her hands. He is not to be her slave, he is not to yield to her against the dictates of his own reason and judgment, it is her duty to obey all his lawful commands, and, if she have sense, she will perceive that it is a disgrace to herself to acknowledge, as a husband, a thing over which she has an absolute control. It should always be recollected that you are the party whose body must, if any do, lie in jail for debt, and for debts of her contracting, too, as well as of your own contracting. Over her tongue, too, you possess a clear right to exercise, if necessary, some control, for if she is in an unjustifiable manner, it is against you, and not against her, that the law enables, and justly enables, the slandered party to proceed, which would be monstrously unjust, if the law were not founded on the right which the husband has to control, if necessary, the tongue of the wife, to compel her to keep it within the limits prescribed by the law. The charming, the most enchanting, life, indeed, would be that of a husband, if he were bound to cohabit with him to maintain one for all the debts and all the slanders of whom he was answerable, and over whose conduct he possessed no compulsory control. Of the remedies in the case of really bad wives, squanderers, drunkards, adulteresses, I shall speak further on, it being the habit of us all to put off to the last possible moment the performance of disagreeable duties. But, far short of these vices, there are several faults in a wife that may, if not cured in time, lead to great unhappiness, great injury to the interests as well as character of her husband and children, and which faults it is, therefore, the husband's duty to correct. A wife may be chaste, sober in the full sense of the word, industrious, cleanly, frugal, and may be devoted to her husband and her children to a degree so enchanting as to make them all love her beyond the power of words to express. And yet she may, partly under the influence of her natural disposition, and partly encouraged by the great and constant homage paid to her virtues, and presuming, too, on the pain with which she knows her will be thwarted, she may, with all her virtues, be thus led to a bold interference in the affairs of her husband, may attempt to dictate to him in matters quite out of her own sphere, and, in the pursuit of the gratification of her love of power and command, may wholly overlook the acts, the follower and injustice which she would induce her husband to commit, and overlook, too, the contemptible thing that she is making the man whom it is her duty to honor and obey, and the abasement of whom cannot take place without some portion of degradation falling upon herself. At the time when the book came out, relative to the little treated Queen Caroline, I was talking upon the subject, one day, with a person, who had not read the book, but who, as was the fashion with all those who were looking up to the government, condemned the Queen unheard. Now, said I, be not so shamefully unjust, but get the book, read it, and then give your judgment indeed, said his wife, who was sitting by, but he shanty, pronouncing the word shanty with an emphasis in a voice tremendously masculine. Oh, said I, if he shanty, that is another matter, but, if he shanty read, if he shanty hear the evidence, he shanty be looked upon, by me, as a just judge, and I shanty regard him, in future, as having any opinion of his own in anything. All which the husband, the poor impact thing, heard without a word escaping his lips. A husband thus under command, is the most contemptible of God's creatures. Nobody can place reliance on him for anything, whether in the capacity of employer or employed, you are never sure of him. No bargain is firm, no engagement sacred, with such a man. Feeble as a reap before the boisterous she commander, he is bold and injustice towards those whom it pleases her caprice to mark out for vengeance. In the eyes of neighbors, for friends such a man cannot have, in the eyes of servants, in the eyes of even the beggars at his door, such a man is a mean and despicable creature, though he may roll in wealth and possess great talents into the bargain. Such a man has, in fact, no property, he has nothing that he can rightly call his own, he is a beggarly dependent under his own roof, and if he have anything of the men left in him, and if there be rope or river near, the sooner he betakes him to the one or the other the better. How many men, how many families, have I known brought to utter ruin only by the husband suffering himself to be subdued, to be cowed down, to be held in fear, of even a virtuous wife? What, then, must be the lot of him who submits to a commander who, at the same time, sets all virtue at defiance? Women are a sisterhood. They make common cause on behalf of the sex, and, indeed, this is natural enough, when we consider the vast power that the law gives us over them. The law is for us, and they combine, wherever they can, to mitigate its effects. This is perfectly natural, and, to a certain extent, laudable, even sing fellow feeling in public spirit, but when carried to the length of Hishanti, it is despotism on the one side and slavery on the other. Watch, therefore, the incipient steps of encroachment, and they come on so slowly, so softly, that you must be sharp-sighted if you perceive them, but the moment you do perceive them, your love will blind for too long a time, but the moment you do perceive them, put at once an effectual stop to their progress. Never mind the pain that it may give you, a day of pain at this time will spare you years of pain in time to come. Many a man has been miserable, and made his wife miserable too, for a score or two of years, only for want of resolution to bear one day of pain, and it is a great deal to bear, it is a great deal to do to thwart the desire of one whom you so dearly love, and whose virtues daily render her more and more dear to you. But, and this is one of the most admirable of the mother's traits, that she herself will, while the tears stream from her eyes, force the nauseous medicine down the throat of her child, whose every cry is a dagger to her heart, that she herself has the courage to do this for the sake of her child, why should you flinch from the performance of a still more important and more sacred duty towards herself, as well as towards you and your children? Am I recommending tyranny? Am I recommending disregard of the wife's opinions and wishes? Am I recommending a reserve towards her that would seem to say that she was not trustworthy, or not a party interested in her husband's affairs? By no means, on the contrary, though I would keep anything disagreeable from her, I should not enjoy the prospect of good without making her a participator. But reason says, and God has said, that it is the duty of wives to be obedient to their husbands, and the very nature of things prescribes that there must be a head of every house, and an undivided authority. And then it is so clearly just that the authority should rest with him on whose head rests the whole responsibility, that a woman, when patiently reasoned with on the subject, must be a virago in her very nature not to submit with facility to the terms of her marriage vow. There are, in almost every considerable neighborhood, a little squadron of she commanders, generally the youngest wives of old or weak-minded men, and generally without children. These are the tutoresses of the young wives of the Vichin age, they, in virtue of their experience, not only school the wives, but scold the husbands, they teach the former how to encroach and the latter how to yield, so that if you suffer this to go quietly on, you are soon under the care of a comet as completely as if you were insane. You want no comet, reason, law, religion, the marriage vow, all these have made you head, have given you full power to rule your family, and if you give up your right, you deserve the contempt that assuredly awaits you, and also the ruin that is, in all probability, your doom. Taking it for granted that you will not suffer more than a second or third session of the female comet, let me say a word or two about the conduct of men in deciding between the conflicting opinions of husbands and wives. When a wife has a point to carry, and finds herself hard pushed, or when she thinks it necessary to call to her aid all the force she can possibly muster, one of her resources is, the vote on her side of all her husband's visiting friends. My husband thinks so and so, and I think so and so, now, Mr. Tompkins, don't you think I am right? To be sure he does, and so does Mr. Jenkins, and so does Wilkins, and so does Mr. At, dollar number at dollar at, and you would swear that they were all her
And don't you think so too, Mr. Cobbett, said the lady, with great earnestness. Indeed, ma'am, said I, I should think it very great presumption in me to offer any opinion at all, and especially in opposition to the known decision of the father, who is the best judge, and the only rightful judge, in such a case. This was a very sensible and well-behaved woman, and I still respect her very highly, but I could perceive that I instantly dropped out of her good graces. Harry, however, I was glad to hear, went to be buried in the farmhouse. A house divided against itself, or, rather, in itself, cannot stand, and it is divided against itself if there be a divided authority. The wife ought to be heard, and patiently heard, she ought to be reasoned with, and, if possible, convinced, but if, after all endeavors in this way, she remain opposed to the husband's opinion, his will must be obeyed, or he, at once, becomes nothing, she is, in fact, the master, and he is nothing but an insignificant inmate. As to matters of little comparative moment, as to what shall be for dinner, as to how the house shall be furnished, as to the management of the house and of menial servants, as to these matters, and many others, the wife may have her way without any danger, but when the questions are, what is to be the calling to be pursued, what is to be the place of residence, what is to be the style of living and scale of expense, what is to be done with property, what the manner and place of educating. Children, what is to be their calling or state of life, who are to be employed or entrusted by the husband, what are the principles that he is to adopt as to public matters, whom he is to have for co-tutors or friends, all these must be left solely to the husband, and all these he must have his will, or there never can be any harmony in the family. Nevertheless, in some of these concerns, wives should be heard with a great deal of attention, especially in the affairs of choosing your male acquaintances and friends and associates. Women are more quick-sighted than men, they are less disposed to confide in persons upon a first acquaintance, they are more suspicious as to motives, they are less liable to be deceived by professions and protestations, they watch words with a more scrutinizing ear, and looks with a keener eye, and, making due allowance for their prejudices in particular cases, their opinions and remonstrances, with regard to matters of this sort, ought not to be said at not without great deliberation. Louvet, one of the Brissodens, who fled for their lives in the time of Robespierre, this Louvet, in his narrative, entitled Mess Perils in which I read, for the first time, to divert my mind from the perils of the yellow fever, in Philadelphia, but with which I was so captivated as to have read it many times since, this writer, giving an account of his wonderful dangers and escapes, relates, that being on his way to Paris from the vicinity of Bordeaux, and having no regular passport, fell, lame, but finally crept onto a miserable pothouse, in a small town in the Limousin. The landlord questioned him with regard to who and what he was and whence he came and was satisfied with his answers. But the landlady, who had looked sharply at him on his arrival, whispered a little boy, who ran away, and quickly returned with the mayor of the town. Louvet soon discovered that there was no danger in the mayor, who could not decipher his forged passport, and who, being well plied with wine, wanted to hear no more of the matter. The landlady, perceiving this, slipped out and brought a couple of aldermen, who asked to see the passport. Oh, yes, but drink first. Then there was a laughing story to tell over again, at the request of the half-drunken mayor, then a laughing and more drinking, the passport in Louvet's hand, but never opened, and, while another toast was drinking, the passport slipped back quietly into the pocket, the woman looking furious all the while. At last, the mayor, the alderman, and the landlord, all nearly drunk, shook hands with Louvet, and wished him a good journey, swore he was a true sense culotte, but, he says, that the sharp-sighted woman, who was to be deceived by none of his stories or professions, saw him get off with deep and manifest disappointment and chagrin. I have thought of this many times since, when I have had occasion to witness the quick-sightedness and penetration of women. The same quality that makes them, as they notoriously are, more quick in discovering expedients in cases of difficulty, makes them more apt to penetrate into motives and character. I now come to a matter of the greatest possible importance, namely, the great troubler of the married state, the great bane of families, jealousy, and I shall first speak of jealousy in the wife. This is always an unfortunate thing, and sometimes fatal. Yet, if there be a great propensity towards it, it is very difficult to be prevented. One thing, however, every husband can do in the way of prevention, and that is, to give no ground for it. And here, it is not sufficient that he strictly adhere to his marriage vow, he ought further to abstain from every art, however free from guilt, calculated to awaken the slightest degree of suspicion in a mind, the peace of which he is bound by every tie of justice and humanity not to disturb, or, if he can avoid it, to suffer it to be disturbed by others. A woman that is very fond of her husband, and this is the case with nine tenths of English and American women, does not like to share with another any, even the smallest portion, not only of his affection, but of his assiduities and applause, and, as the bestowing of them on another, and receiving payment in kind, can serve no purpose other than of gratifying one's vanity, they ought to be abstained from, and especially if the gratification be to be purchased with even the chance of exciting uneasiness in her, whom it is your sacred duty to make as happy as you can. For about two or three years after I was married, I, retaining some of my military manners, used, both in France and America, to romp most famously with the girls that came in my way, till one day, at Philadelphia, my wife said to me, in a very gentle manner, don't do that, I do not like it. That was quite enough, I had never thought on the subject before, one hair of her head was more dear to me than all the other women in the world, and this I knew that she knew, but I now saw that this was not all that she had erected from me, I saw, that she had the further claim upon me that I should abstain from everything that might induce others to believe that there was any other woman for whom, even if I were at liberty, I had any affection. I beseech unmarried men to bear this in mind, for, on some trifle of this sort, the happiness or misery of a long life frequently turns. If the mind of a wife be disturbed on this score, every possible means ought to be used to restore it to peace, and though her suspicions be perfectly groundless, though they be wild as the dreams of madmen, though they may present a mixture of the furious and the ridiculous, still they are to be treated with the greatest lenity and tenderness, and if, after all, you fail, the frailty is to be lamented as a misfortune, and not punished as a fault, seeing that it must have its foundation in a feeling towards you, which it would be the basis of ingratitude, and the most ferocious of cruelty, to repay by harshness of any description. As to those husbands who make the unjust suspicions of their wives a justification for making those suspicions just, as to such as can make a sport of such suspicions, rather brag of them than otherwise, and endeavor to aggravate rather than assuage them, as to such I have nothing to say, they being far without the scope of any advice that I can offer. But to such as are not of this description, I have a remark or two to offer with respect to measures of prevention. And, first, I never could see the sense of its being a piece of etiquette, a sort of mark of good breeding, to make it a rule that man and wife are not to sit side by side in a mixed company, that if a party walk out, the wife is to give her arm to some other than her husband, that if there be any other hand near, his is not to help to a seat or into a carriage. I never could see the sense of this, but I have always seen the nonsense of it plainly enough, it is, in short, amongst many other foolish and mischievous things that we do in aping the manners of those whose riches, frequently ill-gotten, and whose power emboldened them to set, with impunity, pernicious examples, and to their examples this nation owes more of its degradation in morals than to any other source. The truth is, that this is a piece of false refinement, it, being interpreted, means, that so free are the parties from a liability to suspicion, so innately virtuous and pure are they, that each man can safely trust his wife with another man, and each woman her husband with another woman. But this piece of false refinement, like all others, overshoots its mark, it says too much, for it says that the parties have lewd thoughts in their minds. This is not the fact, with regard to people in general, but it must have been the origin of this set of consummately ridiculous and contemptible rules. Now I would advise a young man, especially if he have a pretty wife, not to commit her unnecessarily to the care of any other man, not to be separated from her in a studious and ceremonious manner, and not to be ashamed to prefer her company and conversation to that of any other woman. I never could discover any good breeding in setting another man, almost expressly, to poke his nose up in the face of my wife, and talk nonsense to her, for, in such cases, nonsense it generally is. It is not a thing of much consequence, to be sure, but when the wife is young, especially, it is not seemly, at any rate, and it cannot possibly lead to any good, though it
What company can a young man and woman want more than their two selves, and their children, if they have any? If here be not company enough, it is but a sad affair. The pernicious cards are brought forth by the company keeping, the rival expenses, the sittings up late at night, the seeing of the lady's home, and a thousand squabbles and disagreeable consequences. But, the great thing of all is, that this hankering after company, proves, clearly proves, that you want something beyond the society of your wife, and that she is sure to feel most acutely, the bare fact contains an imputation against her, and it is pretty sure to lay the foundation of jealousy, or of something still worse. If acts of kindness in you are necessary in all cases, they are especially so in cases of her illness, from whatever cause arising. I will not suppose myself to be addressing any husband capable of being unconcerned while his wife's life is in the most distant danger from illness, though it has been my very great mortification to know in my lifetime, two or three fruits of this description, but, far short of this degree of brutality, a great deal of fault may be committed. When men are ill, they feel every neglect with double anguish, and, what then must be in such cases the feelings of women, whose ordinary feelings are so much more acute than those of men, what must be their feelings in case of neglect and illness, and especially if the neglect come from the husband. Your own heart will, I hope, tell you what those feelings must be, and will spare me the vain attempt to describe them, and, if it do thus instruct you, you will want no arguments from me to induce you, at such a season, to prove the sincerity of your affection by every kind word and kind act that your mind can suggest. This is the time to try you, and, be you assured, that the impression left on her mind now will be the true and lasting impression, and, if it be good, will be a better preservative against her being jealous, than ten thousand of your professions ten thousand times repeated. In such a case, you ought to spare no expense that you can possibly afford, you ought to neglect nothing that your means will enable you to do, for, what is the use of money if it be not to be expended in this case? But, more than all the rest, is your own personal attention. This is the valuable thing, this is the great bomb to the sufferer, and, it is efficacious in proportion as it is proved to be sincere. Leave nothing to other hands that you can do yourself, the mind has a great deal to do in all the elements of the body, and, bear in mind, that, whatever be the event, you have a more than ample reward. I cannot press this point too strongly upon you, the bed of sickness presents no charms, no allurements, and women know this well, they watch, in such a case, your every word and every look, and now it is that their confidence is secured, or their suspicions excited, for life. In conclusion of these remarks, as to jealousy in the wife, I cannot help expressing my abhorrence of those husbands who treat it as a matter for ridicule. To be sure, infidelity in a man is less heinous than infidelity in the wife, but still, is the marriage found nothing? Is a promise solemnly made before God, and in the face of the world, nothing? Is a violation of the contract, and that, too, with a feeble party, nothing of which a man ought to be ashamed? But, besides all these, there is the cruelty. First, you win, by great pains, perhaps, a woman's affections, then, in order to get possession of her person, you marry her, then, after enjoyment, you break your vow, you bring upon her the mixed pity and jeers of the world, and thus you leave her to weep out her life. Murder is more horrible than this, to be sure, and the criminal law, which punishes divers other crimes, does not reach this, but, in the eye of reason and of moral justice, it is surpassed by very few of those crimes. Passion may be pleaded, and so it may, for almost every other crime of which men can be guilty. It is not a crime against nature, nor are any of these which men commit in consequence of their necessities. The temptation is great, and is not the temptation great when men thieve or rob. In short, there is no excuse for an act so unjust and so cruel, and the world is justice to this matter, for, I have always observed, that, however men are disposed to laugh at these breaches of vows in men, the act seldom fails to produce injury to the whole character, it leaves, after all the joking, a stain, and, amongst those who depend on character for livelihood, it often produces ruin. At the very least, it makes an unhappy and wrangling family, it makes children despise or hate their fathers, and it affords an example at the thought of the ultimate consequences of which a father ought to shudder. In such a case, children will take part, and they ought to take part, with the mother, she is the injured party, the shame brought upon her attaches, in part, to them, they feel the injustice done them, and, if such a man, when the grey hairs, and tottering knees, and piping boys come, look round him in vain for a prop, let him, at last, be just, and acknowledge that he has now the due reward of his own wanton cruelty to one whom he had solemnly sworn to love and to cherish to the last hour of, his or her life. But, bad as his conjugal infidelity in the husband, it is much worse in the wife, a proposition that it is necessary to maintain by the force of reason, because the women, as a sisterhood, are prone to deny the truth of it. They say that adultery is adultery, in men as well as in them, and that, therefore, the offense is as great in the one case as in the other. As a crime, abstractly considered, it certainly is, but, as to the consequences, there is a wide difference. In both cases, there is the breach of a solemn vow, but, there is this great distinction, that the husband, by his breach of that vow, only brings shame upon his wife and family, whereas the wife, by breach of her vow, may bring the husband a spurious offspring to maintain, and may bring that spurious offspring to rob of their fortunes, and in some cases of their bread, her legitimate children. So that here is a great and evident wrong done to numerous parties, besides the deeper disgrace inflicted in this case than in the other. And why is the disgrace deeper? Because here is a total want of delicacy, here is, in fact, prostitution, here is grossness and filthiness of mind, here is everything that argues baseness of character. Women should be, and they are, except in few instances, far more reserved and more delicate than men, nature bids them be such, the habits and manners of the world confirm this precept of nature, and therefore, when they commit this offense, they excite loathing, as well as call for reprobation. In the countries where plurality of wives is permitted, there is no plurality of husbands. It is their thought not at all delicate for a man to have several wives, but the bare thought of a woman having two husbands would excite horror. The widows of the Hindus burn themselves in the pile that consumes their husbands, but the Hindu widowers do not dispose of themselves in this way. The widows devote their bodies to complete destruction, lest, even after the death of their husbands, they should be tempted to connect themselves with other men, and though this is carrying delicacy far indeed, it reads to Christian wives a lesson not unworthy of their attention, for, though it is not desirable that their bodies should be turned into handfuls of ashes, even that transmutation were preferable to that infidelity which fixes the brand of shame on the cheeks of their parents, their children, and on those of all who ever called them friend. For these plain and forcible reasons it is that this species of offense is far more heinous in the wife than in the husband, and the people of all civilized countries act upon this settled distinction. Men who have been guilty of the offense are not cut off from society, but women who have been guilty of it are, for, as we all know well, no woman, married or single, of fair reputation, will risk that reputation by being ever seen, if she can avoid it, with a woman who has ever, at any time, committed this offense, which contains in itself, and by universal award, a sentence of social excommunication for life. If, therefore, it be the duty of the husband to adhere strictly to his marriage vow, if his breach of that vow be naturally attended with the fatal consequences above described, how much more imperative is the duty on the wife to avoid, even the semblance of a deviation from that vow? If the man's misconduct, in this respect, brings shame on so many innocent parties, what shame, what dishonor, what misery follows such misconduct in the wife? Her parents, those of her husband, all her relations, and all her friends, share in her dishonor. And her children, how is she to make atonement to them? They are commanded to honor their father and their mother, but not such a mother as this, who, on the contrary, has no claim to anything from them but hatred, abhorrence, and execration. It is she who has broken the ties of nature, she has dishonored her own offspring, she has fixed a mark of reproach on those who once made a part of her own body, nature shuts her out of the pale of its influence, and condemns her to the just detestation of those who had formerly made love her as their own life. But as the crime is so much more heinous, and the punishment so much more severe, in the case of the wife than it is in the case of the husband, so the caution ought to be greater in making the accusation, or entertaining the suspicion. Men ought to be very slow in entertaining such suspicions, they ought to have clear proof before they can suspect, a proneness to such suspicions is a very unfortunate turn of the mind, and, indeed, few
Jealous husbands are not despicable because they have grounds, but because they have not grounds, and this is generally the case. When they have grounds, their own honor commands them to cast off the object, as they would cut out a corn or a cancer. It is not the jealousy in itself, which is despicable, but the continuing to live in that state. It is no dishonor to be a slave in Algiers, for instance, the dishonor begins only where you remain a slave voluntarily, it begins the moment you can escape from slavery, and do not. It is despicable unjustly to be jealous of your wife, but it is infamy to cohabit with her if you know her to be guilty. I shall be told that the law compels you to live with her, unless you be rich enough to disengage yourself from her, but the law does not compel you to remain in the same country with her, and, if a man have no other means of ridding himself of such a curse, what are mountains or seas or traverse? And what is the risk, if such there be, of exchanging a life of bodily ease for a life of labor? What are these, and numerous other ills, if they happen, suprad? Nay, what is death itself, compared with the baseness, the infamy, the never ceasing shame and reproach of living under the same roof with a prostituted woman, and calling her your wife? But, there are children, and what are to become of these? To be taken away from the prostitute, to be sure, and this is a duty which you owe to them, the sooner they forget her the better, and the farther they are from her, the sooner that will be. There is no excuse for continuing to live with an adult breast, no inconvenience, no loss, no suffering, ought to deter a man from delivering himself from such a state of filthy infamy, and to suffer his children to remain in such a state, is a crime that hardly admits of adequate description, the jail is paradise compared with such a life, and he who can endure this latter, from the fear of encountering hardship, is a wretch too despicable to go by the name of man. But, now, all this supposes, that the husband has well and truly acted his part. It supposes, not only that he has been faithful, but, that he has not, in any way, been the cause of temptation to the wife to be unfaithful. If he have been cold and neglectful, if he have led a life of irregularity, if he have proved to her that home was not his delight, if he have made his house the place of resort for loose companions, if he have given rise to a taste for visiting, junketing, parties of pleasure and gaiety, if he have introduced the habit of indulging in what are called innocent freedoms, if these, or any of these, the fault is his, he must take the consequences, and he has no right to inflict punishment on the offender, the offense being in fact of his own creating. The laws of God, as well as the laws of man, have given him all power in this respect, it is for him to use the power for the honor of his wife as well as for that of himself, if he neglect to use it, all the consequences ought to fall on him, and, as far as my observation has gone, in 19 out of 20 cases of infidelity in wives, the crimes have been fairly ascribable to the husbands. Follow misconduct in the husband, cannot, indeed, justify or even palliate infidelity in the wife, whose very nature ought to make her recoil at the thought of the offense, but it may, at the same time, deprive him of the right of inflicting punishment on her, her kindred, her children, and the world, will justly hold her in abhorrence, but the husband must hold his peace. Innocent freedoms. I know of none that a wife can indulge in. The words, as applied to the demeanor of a married woman, or even a single one, imply contradiction. For freedom, thus used, means an exemption or departure from the strict rules of female reserve, and, I do not see how this can be innocent. It may not amount to crime, indeed, but, still it is not innocent, and the use of the phrase is dangerous. If it had been my fortune to be yoked to a person, who liked innocent freedoms, I should have unyoked myself in a very short time. But, to say the truth, it is all a man's own fault. If he have not sense and influence enough to prevent innocent freedoms, even before marriage, he will do well to let the thing alone, and leave wives to be managed by those who have. But, men will talk to your wife, and that are her. To be sure they will, if she be young and pretty, and would you go and pull her away from them? Oh no, by no means, but you must have very little sense, or must have made very little use of it, if her manner do not soon convince them that they employ their flattery in vain. So much of a man's happiness and of his efficiency through life depends upon his mind being quite free from all anxieties of this sort, that too much care cannot be taken to guard against them, and, I repeat, that the great preservation of all is, the young couple living as much as possible at home, and having as few visitors as possible. If they do not prefer the company of each other to that of all the world besides, if either of them be weary of the company of the other, if they do not, when separated by business or any other cause, think with pleasure of the time of meeting again, it is a bad omen. Pursue this course when young, and the very thought of jealousy will never come into your mind, and, if you do pursue it, and show by your deeds that you value your wife as you do your own life, you must be pretty nearly an idiot, if she do not think you to be the wisest man in the world. The best man she will be sure to think you, and she will never forgive anyone that calls your talents or your wisdom in question. Now, will you say that, if to be happy, nay, if to avoid misery and ruin in the married state, requires all these precautions, all these cares, to fail to any extent in any of which is to bring down on a man's head such fearful consequences, will you say that, if this be the case, it is better to remain single? If you should say this, it is my business to show that you are in error. For, in the first place, it is against nature to suppose that children can cease to be born, they must and will come, and then it follows, that they must come by promiscuous intercourse, or by particular connection. The former nobody will contend for, seeing that it would put us, in this respect, on a level with the brute creation. Then, as the connection is to be particular, it must be during pleasure, or for the joint lives of the parties. The former would seldom hold for any length of time, the tie would seldom be durable, and it would be feeble on account of its uncertain duration. Therefore, to be a father, with all the lasting and delightful ties attached to the name, you must first be a husband, and there are very few men in the world who do not, first or last, desire to be fathers. If it be said, that marriage ought not to be for life, but that its duration ought to be subject to the will, the mutual will at least, of the parties, the answer is, that it would seldom be of long duration. Every trifling dispute would lead to a separation, a hasty word would be enough. Knowing that the engagement is for life, prevents disputes too, it checks anger in its beginnings. Put a rooting horse into a field with a weak fence, and with captivating pasture on the other side, and he is continually trying to get out, but, let the field be walled round, he makes the best of his heart fair, and divides his time between grazing and sleeping. Besides, there could be no families, no assemblages of persons worthy of that name, all would be confusion and indescribable intermixture, the names of brother and sister would hardly have a meaning, and, therefore, there must be marriage, or there can be nothing worthy of the name of family or a father. The cares and troubles of the married life are many, but, are those of the single life few? Take the farmer, and it is nearly the same with the tradesman, but, take the farmer, for instance, and let him, at the age of twenty-five, go into business unmarried. See his maid servants, probably rivals for his smiles, but certainly rivals in the charitable distribution of his victuals and drink amongst those of their own rank, behold their guardianship of his pork tub, his bacon rack, his butter, cheese, milk, poultry, eggs, and all the rest of it, look at their care of all his household stuff, his blankets, sheets, pillowcases, towels, knives, and forks, and particularly of his crockery ware, of which last they will hardly exceed a single cartload of broken bits in the year, and, how nicely they will get up and take care of his linen and other wearing apparel, and always have it ready for him without his thinking about it. If absent at market, or especially at a distant fair, how scrupulously they will keep all their cronies out of his house, and what special care they will take of his cellar, more particularly that which holds his strong beer, and his groceries and his spirits and his wine, for a bachelor can afford it, how safe these will all be. Bachelors have not, indeed, any more than married men, a security for health, but if our young farmer be sick, there are his couple of maids to take care of him, to administer his medicine, and to perform for him all other nameless offices, which in such a case are required, and what is more, take care of everything downstairs at the same time, especially his desk with the money in it. Never will they, good humored girls as they are, scold him for coming home too late, but, on the contrary, like him the better for it, and if he have drunk a little too much, so much the better, for then he will sleep late in the morning, and when he comes out at last, he will find that his men have been so hard at work, and that all his animals have been taken such good care of. Nonsense. A bare glance at the thing shows, that a farmer, above all men living, can never carry on his affairs with
The wages of the former is not the expense, it is the want of a common interest with you, and this you can obtain in no one but a wife. But there are the children. I, for my part, firmly believe that a farmer, married at twenty-five, and having ten children during the first ten years, would be able to save more money during these years, than a bachelor, of the same age, would be able to save, on the same farm, in a like space of time, he keeping only one maid servant. One single fit of illness, of two months' duration, might sweep away more than all the children would cost in the whole ten years, to say nothing of the continual waste and pillage, and the idleness, going on from the first day of the ten years to the last. Besides, is the money all? What a life to lead. No one to talk to without going from home, or without getting someone to come to you, no friend to sit and talk to, pleasant evenings to pass. Nobody to share with you your sorrows or your pleasures, no soul having a common interest with you, all around you taking care of themselves, and no care of you, no one to cheer you in moments of depression, to say all in a word, no one to love you, and no prospect of ever seeing any such one to the end of your days. For, as to parents and brethren, if you have them, they have other and very different ties, and, however laudable your feelings as son and brother, those feelings are of a different character. Then as to gratifications, from which you will hardly abstain altogether, are they generally of little expense? And are they attended with no trouble, no vexation, no disappointment, no jealousy even, and are they never followed by shame or remorse? It does very well in bantering songs, to say that the bachelor's life is devoid of care. My observation tells me the contrary, and reason concurs, in this regard, with experience. The bachelor has no one on whom he can in all cases rely. When he quits his home, he carries with him cares that are unknown to the married man. If, indeed, like the common soldier, he have merely a lodging place, and a bundle of clothes, given in charge to someone, he may be at his ease, but if he possess anything of a home, he is never sure of its safety, and this uncertainty is a great enemy to cheerfulness. And as to efficiency in life, how is the bachelor to equal the married man? In the case of farmers and tradesmen, the latter have so clearly the advantage over the former, that one need hardly insist upon the point, but it is, and must be, the same in all the situations of life. To provide for a wife and children is the greatest of all possible spurs to exertion. Many a man, naturally prone to idleness, has become active and industrious when he saw children growing up about him, many a dull sluggard has become, if not a bright man, at least a bustling man, when roused to exertion by his love. Dryden's account of the change wrought in Simon, is only a strong case of the kind. And, indeed, if a man will not exert himself for the sake of a wife and children, he can have no exertion in him, or he must be deaf to all the dictates of nature. Perhaps the world never exhibited a more striking proof of the truth of this doctrine than that which is exhibited in me, and I am sure that everyone will say, without any hesitation, that a fourth part of the labors I have performed, never would have been performed, if I had not been a married man. In the first place, they could not, for I should, all the early part of my life, have been rambling and roaming about as most bachelors are. I should have had no home that I cared to straw about, and should have wasted the far greater part of my time. The great affair of home being settled, having the home secured, I had leisure to employ my mind on things which it delighted in. I got rid at once of all cares, all anxieties, and had only to provide for the very moderate wants of that home. But the children began to come. They sharpened my industry, they spurred me on. To be sure, I had other and strong motives, I wrote for fame, and was urged forward by ill treatment, and by the desire to triumph over my enemies, but, after all, a very large part of my nearly hundred volumes may be fairly ascribed to the wife and children. I might have done something, but, perhaps, not a thousandth part of what I have done, not even a thousandth part, for the chances are, that I, being fond of a military life, should have ended my days ten or twenty years ago, in consequence of wounds, or fatigue, or, more likely, in consequence of the persecutions of some haughty and insolent fool, whom nature had formed to black my shoes, and whom a system of corruption had made my commander. Love came and rescued me from this state of horrible slavery, placed the whole of my time at my own disposal, made me as free as air, removed every restraint upon the operations of my mind, naturally disposed to communicate its thoughts to others, and gave me, for my leisure hours, a companion, who, though deprived of all opportunity of acquiring what is called learning, had so much good sense, so much useful knowledge, was so innocent, so just in all her ways, so pure in thought, word, and deed, so disinterested, so generous, so devoted to me and her children, so free from all disguise, and, withal, so beautiful and so talkative, and in a voice so sweet, so cheering, that I must, seeing the health and the capacity which it had pleased God to give me, have been a criminal, if I had done much less than that which I have done, and I have always said, that, if my country feel any gratitude for my labors, that gratitude is due to her full as much as to me. Care. What care have I known? I have been buffeted about by this powerful and vindictive government, I have repeatedly had the fruit of my labors snatched away from me by it, but I had a partner that never frowned, that was never melancholy, that never was subdued in spirit, that never betted a smile, on these occasions, that fortified me, and sustained me by her courageous example, and that was just as busy and as zealous in taking care of the remnant as she had been in taking care of the whole, just as cheerful, and just, as full of caresses, when brought down to a mean hired lodging, as when the mistress of a fine country house, with all its accompaniments, and, whether from her words or her looks, no one could gather that she regretted the change. What cares have I had, then? What have I had worthy of the name of cares? And, how is it now? How is it when the sixty-fourth year has come? And how should I have been without this wife and these children? I might have amassed a tolerable heap of money, but what would that have done for me? It might have bought me plenty of professions of attachment, plenty of persons impatient for my exit from the world, but not one single grain of sorrow, for any anguish that might have attended my approaching end. To me, no being in this world appears so wretched as an old bachelor. Those circumstances, those changes in his person and in his mind, which, in the husband, increase rather than diminish the attentions to him, produce all the want of feeling attendant on disgust, and he beholds, in the conduct of the mercenary crew that generally surround him, little besides an eager desire to profit from that event, the approach of which, nature makes a subject of sorrow with him. Before I quit this part of my work, I cannot refrain from offering my opinion with regard to what is due from husband to wife, when the disposal of his property comes to be thought of. When marriage is an affair settled by deeds, contracts, and lawyers, the husband, being bound beforehand, has really no will to make. But where he has a will to make, and a faithful wife to leave behind him, it is his first duty to provide for her future well-being, to the utmost of his power. If she brought him no money, she brought him her person, and by delivering that up to him, she established a claim to his careful protection of her to the end of her life. Some men think, or act as if they thought, that, if a wife bring no money, and if the husband gain money by his business or profession, that money is his, and not hers, because she has not been doing any of those things for which the money has been received. But is this way of thinking just? By the marriage vow, the husband endows the wife with all his worldly goods, and not a bit too much is this, when she is giving him the command and possession of her person. But does she not help to acquire the money? Speaking, for instance, of the farmer or the merchant, the wife does not, indeed, go to plough, or to look after the ploughing and sowing, she does not purchase or sell the stock, she does not go to the fair or the market, but she enables him to do all these without injury to his affairs at home, she is the guardian of his property, she preserves what would otherwise be lost to him. The barn and the granary, though they create nothing, have, in the bringing of food to our mouths, as much merit as the fields themselves. The wife does not, indeed, assist in the merchant's counting house, she does not go upon the exchange, she does not even know what he is doing, but she keeps his house in order, she rears up his children, she provides a scene of suitable resort for his friends, she ensures him a constant retreat from the fatigues of his affairs, she makes his home pleasant, and she is the guardian of his income. In both these cases, the wife helps to gain the money, and in cases where there is no gain, where the income is by descent, or is fixed, she helps to prevent it from being squandered away. It is, therefore, as much hers as it is the husband's, and though the law gives him, in many cases, the power of keeping her share from her, no just man will ever avail himself of that power. With regard to the tying up of widows from marrying again, I will relate what took place
I know what ticklish ground I am treading on here, but, though it is lawful for a woman to take a second husband is for a man to take a second wife, the cases are different, and widely different, in the eye of morality and of reason, for, as adultery in the wife is a greater offense than adultery in the husband, as it is more gross, as it includes prostitution, so a second marriage in the woman is more gross than in the man, argues great deficiency in that delicacy, than innate modesty, which, after all, is the great charm, the charm of charms, in the female sex. I do not like to hear a man talk of his first wife, especially in the presence of a second, but to hear a woman thus talk of her first husband, has never, however beautiful and good she might be, failed to sink her in my estimation. I have, in such cases, never been able to keep out of my mind the concatenation of ideas, which, in spite of custom, in spite of the frequency of the occurrence, leave an impression deeply disadvantageous to the party, for, after the greatest of ingenuity has exhausted itself in the way of apology, it comes to this at last, that the person has a second time undergone that surrender, to which nothing but the most ardent affection, could ever reconcile a chaste and delicate woman. The usual apologies, that a lone woman wants a protector, that she cannot manage her estate, that she cannot carry on her business, that she wants a home for her children, all these apologies are not worth a straw, for what is the amount of them? Why, that she surrenders her person to secure these ends. And if we admit the validity of such apologies, are we far from apologizing for the kept mistress, and even the prostitute? Nay, the former of these may, if she confine herself to one man, plead more boldly in her defense, and even the latter may plead that hunger, which knows no law, and no decorum, and no delicacy. These unhappy, but justly reprobated, and despised parties, are allowed no apology at all, though reduced to the begging of their bread, the world grants them no excuse. The sentence on them is, you shall suffer every hardship, you shall submit to hunger and nakedness, you shall perish by the wayside, rather than you shall surrender your person to the dishonor of the female sex. But can we, without crying injustice, pass this sentence upon them, and, at the same time hold it to be proper, decorous, and delicate, that widows shall surrender their persons for worldly gain, for the sake of ease, or for any consideration whatsoever? It is disagreeable to contemplate the possibility of cases of separation, but amongst the evils of life, such have occurred, and will occur, and the injured parties, while they are sure to meet with the pity of all just persons, must console themselves that they have not merited their fate. In the making one's choice, no human foresight or prudence can, in all cases, guard against an unhappy result. There is one species of husbands to be occasionally met with in all countries, meriting particular reprobation, and causing us to lament, that there is no law to punish offenders so enormous. There was a man in Pennsylvania, apparently a very amiable young man, having a good estate of his own, and marrying a most beautiful woman of his own age, of rich parents, and of virtue perfectly spotless. He very soon took to both gaming and drinking, the last being the most fashionable vice of the country, he neglected his affairs and his family, and about four years spent his estate, and became dependent on his wife's father, together with his wife and three children. Even this would have been of little consequence, as far as related to expense, but he lived the most scandalous life, and was incessant in his demands of money for the purposes of that infamous life. All sorts of means were resorted to to reclaim him, and all in vain, and the wretch, availing himself of the pleading of his wife's affection, and of his power over the children more especially, continued for ten or twelve years to plunder the parents, and to disgrace those whom it was his bounden duty to assist in making happy. At last, going out in the dark, in a boat, and being partly drunk, he went to the bottom of the Delaware, and became food for otters or fishes, to the great joy of all who knew him, excepting only his amiable wife. I can form an idea of no baseness equal to this. There is more of baseness in this character than in that of the robber. The man who obtains the means of indulging in vice, by robbery, exposes himself to the inflictions of the law, but though he merits punishment, he merits it less than the base miscreant who obtains his means by his threats to disgrace his own wife, children, and the wife's parents. The short way in such a case, is the best, set the wretched defiance, resort to the strong arm of the law wherever it will avail you, drive him from your house like a mad dog, for, be assured, that a being so base and cruel is never to be reclaimed, all your efforts at persuasion are useless, his promises and vows are made but to be broken, all your endeavors to keep the thing from the knowledge of the world, only prolong his plundering of you, and many tender father and mother have been ruined by such endeavors, the whole story must come out at last, and it is better to come out before you be ruined, than after your ruin is completed. However, let me hope, that those who read this work will always be secure against evils like these, let me hope, that the young men who read it will abstain from those vices which lead to such fatal results, that they will, before they utter the marriage vow, duly reflect on the great duties that the vow imposes on them, that they will repel, from the outset, every temptation to anything tending to give pain to the defenseless persons whose love for them have placed them at their mercy, and, that they will imprint on their own minds this truth, that a bad husband was never yet a happy man. Letter V. To a father. Little children, says the scripture, are like arrows in the hands of the giant, and blessed is the man that hath his quiver full of them, a beautiful figure to describe, in forcible terms, the support, the power, which a father derives from being surrounded by a family. And what father, thus blessed, is there who does not feel, in this sort of support, a reliance which he feels in no other. In regard to this sort of support there is no uncertainty, no doubts, no misgivings, it is yourself that you see in your children, their bosoms are the safe repository of even the whispers of your mind, they are the great and unspeakable delight of your youth, the pride of your prime of life, and the props of your old age. They proceed from that love, the pleasures of which no tongue or pen can adequately describe, and the various blessings which they bring are equally incapable of description. But, to make them blessings, you must act your part well, for they may, by your neglect, your ill treatment, your evil example, be made to be the contrary of blessings, instead of pleasure, they may bring you pain, instead of making your heart glad, the sight of them may make it sorrowful, instead of being the staff of your old age, they may bring your gray hairs and grief to the grave. It is, therefore, of the greatest importance, that you here act well your part, omitting nothing, even from the very beginning, tending to give you great and unceasing influence over their minds, and, above all things, to ensure, if possible, an ardent love of their mother. Your first duty towards them is resolutely to prevent their drawing the means of life from any breast but hers. That is their own, it is their birthright, and if that fail from any natural cause, the place of it ought to be supplied by those means which are frequently resorted to without employing a hireling breast. I am aware of the too frequent practice of the contrary, I am well aware of the offense which I shall here give to many, but it is for me to do my duty, and to set, with regard to myself, consequences at defiance. In the first place, no food is so congenial to the child as the milk of its own mother, its quality is made by nature to suit the age of the child, it comes with the child, and is calculated precisely for its stomach. And, then, what sort of a mother must that be who can endure the thought of seeing her child at another breast? The suckling may be attended with great pain, and it is so attended in many cases, but this pain is a necessary consequence of pleasures foregone, and, besides, it has its accompanying pleasures too. No mother ever suffered more than my wife did from suckling her children. How many times have I seen her, when the child was beginning to draw, bite her lips while the tears ran down her cheeks? Yet, having endured this, the smiles came and dried up the tears, and the little thing that had caused the pain received abundant kisses as its punishment. Why, now, did I not love her the more for this? Did not this tend to rivet her to my heart? She was enduring this for me, and would not this enduring thought have been wanting, if I had seen the baby at a breast that I had hired and paid for, if I had had two women, one to bear the child and another to give it milk? Of all the sights that this world affords, the most delightful in my eyes, even to an unconcerned spectator, is, a mother with her clean and fat baby looking at her breast, leaving off now and then and smiling, and she, occasionally, half smothering it with kisses. What must that sight be, then, to the father of the child? Besides, are we to overlook the great and wonderful effect that this has on the minds of children? As they succeed each other, they see with their own eyes, the pain, the care, the caresses, which their mother has endured for, or bestowed, on them, and nature bids them love her accordingly. To love her ardently becomes part of their very nature, and when the time comes that her advice to them is necessary as a guide for their
who has not seen these banished children, when brought and put into the arms of their mothers, screaming to get from them, and stretch out their little hands to get back into the arms of the nurse, and when safely got there, hugging the hireling as if her bosom were a place of refuge. Why, such a sight is, one would think, enough to strike a mother dead. And what sort of a husband and father, I want to know, must that be, who can endure the thought of his child loving another woman more than its own mother and his wife? And besides all these considerations, is there no crime in robbing the child of the nurse, and in exposing it to perish? It will not do to say that the child of the nurse may be dead, and thereby leave her breast for the use of some other. Such cases must happen too seldom to be at all relied on, and, indeed, everyone must see, that, generally speaking, there must be a child cast off for everyone that is put to a hireling breast. Now, without supposing it possible, that the hireling will, in any case, contrive to get rid of her own child, every man who employs such hireling, must know, that he is exposing such child to destruction, that he is assisting to rob it of the means of life, and, of course, assisting to procure its death, as completely as a man can, in any case, assisting causing death by starvation, a consideration which will make every just man in the world recoil at the thought of employing a hireling. Breast. For he is not to think of pacifying his conscience by saying, that he knows nothing about the hireling's child. He does know, for he must know, that she has a child, and that he is a principal in robbing it of the means of life. He does not cast it off and leave it to perish himself, but he causes the thing to be done, and to all intents and purposes, he is a principal in the cruel and cowardly crime. And if an argument could possibly be yet wanting to the husband, if his feelings were so stiff as still to remain unmoved, must not the wife be aware that whatever face the world may put upon it, however custom may seem to bear her out, must she not be aware that everyone must see the main motive which induces her to banish from her arms that which has formed part of her own body? All the pretenses about her sore breasts and her want of strength are vain. Nature says that she is to endure the pains as well as the pleasures. Whoever has heard the bleeding of the ewe for her lamb, and has seen her reconciled, or at least pacified, by having presented to her the skin or some of the blood of her dead lamb, whoever has witnessed the difficulty of inducing either you or cow to give her milk to an alien young one, whoever has seen the valor of the timid and in defending her. Brute, and has observed that she never swallows a morsel that is fit for her young, until they be amply satisfied, whoever has seen the wild birds, though, at other times, shunning even the distant approach of man, flying and screaming round his head, and exposing themselves to almost certain death in defense of their nests, whoever has seen these things, or any one of them, must question the motive that can induce a mother to banish a child from her own breast to that of one who has already been so unnatural as to banish hers. And, in seeking for a motive sufficiently powerful to lead to such an act, women must excuse men, if they be not satisfied with the ordinary pretenses, they must excuse me, at any rate, if I do not stop even at love of ease and want of maternal affection, and if I express my fear, that, supra to the unjustifiable motives, there is one which is calculated to excite disgust, namely, a desire to be quickly freed from that restraint which the child imposes, and to hasten back, unbridled and you need figured, to those enjoyments, to have an eagerness for which, or to wish to excite a desire for which, a really delicate woman will shudder at the thought of being suspected. I am well aware of the hostility that I have here been exciting, but there is another, and still more furious, bull to take by the horns, and which would have been encountered some pages back, that being the proper place, had I not hesitated between my duty and my desire to avoid giving offense, I mean the employing of male operators, on those occasions where females used to be employed. And here I have everything against me, the now general custom, even amongst the most chaste and delicate women, the ridicule continually cast on old midwives, the interest of a profession, for the members of which I entertain more respect and regard than for those of any other, and, above all the rest, my own example to the contrary, and my knowledge that every husband has the same apology that I had. But because I acted wrong myself, it is not less, but rather more, my duty to endeavor to dissuade others from doing the same. My wife had suffered very severely with her second child, which, at last, was stillborn. The next time I pleaded for the doctor, and, after every argument that I could think of, obtained a reluctant consent. Her life was so dear to me, that everything else appeared as nothing. Every husband has the same apology to make, and thus, from the good, and not from the bad, feelings of men, the practice has become far too general, for me to hope even to narrow it, but, nevertheless, I cannot refrain from giving my opinion on the subject. We are apt to talk in a very unceremonious style of our rude ancestors, of their gross habits, their want of delicacy in their language. No man shall ever make me believe, that those, who reared the cathedral of Ely, which I saw the other day, were rude, either in their manners or in their minds and words. No man shall make me believe that our ancestors were rude and bitterly race when I read in an act of parliament passed in the reign of Edward IV, regulating the dresses of the different ranks of the people, and forbidding the laborers to wear coats of cloth that cost more than two shillings a yard, equal to forty shillings of our present money, and forbidding their wives and daughters to wear sashes or girdles trimmed with gold or silver. No man shall make me believe that this was a rude and bitterly race compared with those who now shirt and shiver about in canvas frocks and rotten cottons. Nor shall any man persuade me that that was a rude and bitterly state of things in which reign of Edward III an act was passed regulating the wages of labor and ordering that a woman for weeding in the corn should receive a penny a day, while a quart of red wine was sold for a penny and a pair of men's shoes for two pence. No man shall make me believe that agriculture was in a rude state when an act like this was passed, or that our ancestors of that day were rude in their minds or in their thoughts. Indeed, there are a thousand proofs that, whether in regard to domestic or foreign affairs, whether in regard to internal freedom and happiness, or to wait in the world, England was at her zenith about the reign of Edward III. The Reformation, as it is called, gave her a complete pull down. She revived again in the reigns of the Stuarts, as far as related to internal affairs, but the glorious revolution in its debt and its taxes, have, amidst the false glare of new palaces, roads, and canals, brought her down until she has become the land of domestic misery and of foreign impotence and contempt, and, until she, amidst all her boasted improvements and refinements, tremblingly awaits her fall. However, to return from this digression, rude and unrefined as our mothers might be, plain and unvarnished as they might be in their language, accustomed as they might be to call things by their names, though they were not so very delicate as to use the word small clothes, and to be quite unable, in speaking of horned cattle, horses, sheep, the canine race, and poultry, to designate them by their sexual appellations, though they might not absolutely faint at hearing these appellations used by others, rude and unrefined and delicate as they might be, they did not suffer, in the cases alluded to, the approaches of men, which approaches are unceremoniously suffered, and even sought, by their polished and refined and delicate daughters, and of unmarried men too, in many cases, and of very young men. From all antiquity this office was allotted to women. Moses' life was saved by the humanity of the Egyptian midwife, and to the employment of females in this memorable case, the world is probably indebted for that which has been left it by that greatest of all lawgivers, whose institutes, rude as they were, have been the foundation of all the wisest and most just laws in all the countries of Europe and America. It was the fellow feeling of the midwife for the poor mother that saved Moses. And none but a mother can, in such cases, feel to the full and effectual extent that which the operator ought to feel. She has been in the same state herself, she knows more about the matter, except in cases of very rare occurrence, than any man, however great his learning and experience, can ever know. She knows all the previous symptoms, she can judge more correctly than man can judge in such a case, she can put questions to the party, which a man cannot put, the communication between the two is wholly without reserve, the person of the one is given up to the other, as completely as her own is under her command. This never can be the case with a man operator, for, after all that can be said or done, the native feeling of women, in whatever rank of life, will, in these cases, restrain them from saying and doing, before man, even before husband, many things which they ought to say and do. So that, perhaps, even with regard to the bare question of comparative safety to life, the midwife is the preferable person. But safety to life is not all. The preservation of life is not to be preferred to everything. Ought not a man to prefer death to the commission of treason against his country? Ought not a man to die, rather than save his life by the prostitution of his wife to a tyrant, who insists upon the one or the other? Every man and
so that the risk in employing midwives must, of late years, have become vastly greater than it was even when I was a boy, or the whole race must have been extinguished long ago. And, then, how puzzled we should be to account for the building of all the cathedrals, and all the churches, and the draining of all the marshes, and all the fens, more than a thousand years before the word of Kusher ever came from the lips of women, and before the thought came into her mind? And here, even in the use of this word, we have a specimen of the refined delicacy of the present age, here we have, varnished the matter over how we may, modesty in the word and grossness in the thought. Farmers wives, daughters, and maids, cannot now allude to, or hear named, without blushing, those affairs of the homestead, which they, within my memory, used to talk about as freely as of milking or spinning, but, have they become more really modest than their mothers were? Has this refinement made them more continent than those rude mothers? Adria Westminster gave, about six years ago, damages to a man, calling himself a gentleman, against a farmer, because the latter, for the purpose for which such animals are kept, had a bowl in his yard, on which the windows of the gentleman looked. The plaintiff alleged that this was so offensive to his wife and daughters, that, if the defendant were not compelled to desist, he should be obliged to break up his windows, or to quit the house. If I had been the father of these, at once, delicate and curious daughters, I would not have been the herald of their purity of mind, and if I had been the suitor of one of them, I would have taken care to give up the suit with all convenient speed, for how could I reasonably have hoped ever to be able to prevail on delicacy, so exquisite, to commit itself to a pair of bridal sheets? In spite, however, of all this refinement in the human mind, which is everlastingly dinned in our ears, in spite of the small clothes, and of all the other affected stuff, we have this conclusion, this indubitable proof, of the falling off in real delicacy, namely, that common prostitutes, formerly unknown, now swarm in our towns, and are seldom wanting even in our villages, and where there was one illegitimate child, including those coming before the time, only fifty years ago, there are, now twenty. And who can say how far the employment of men, in the cases alluded to, may have assisted in producing this change, so disgraceful to the present age, and so injurious to the female sex? The prostitution and the swarms of illegitimate children have a natural and inevitable tendency to lessen that respect, and that kind and indulgent feeling, which is due from all men to virtuous women. It is well known that the unworthy members of any profession, calling, or rank in life, cause, by their acts, the whole body to sink in the general esteem, it is well known, that the habitual dishonesty of merchants trading abroad, the habitual profligate behavior of travelers from home, the frequent proofs of abject submission to tyrants, it is well known, that these may give the character of dishonesty, profligacy, or cowardice, to a whole nation. There are, doubtless, many men in Switzerland, who abhor the infamous practices of men selling themselves, by whole regiments, to fight for any foreign state that will pay them, no matter in what cause, and no matter whether against their own parents or brethren, but the censure falls upon the whole nation, and no money, no Swiss, is a proverb throughout the world. It is, amidst those scenes of prostitution and bastardy, impossible for men in general to respect the female sex to the degree that they formerly did, while numbers will be apt to adopt the unjust sentiment of the old bachelor, hope, that every woman is, at heart, a rake. Who knows, I say, in what degree the employment of men operators may have tended to produce this change, so injurious to the female sex. I, and to encourage unfeeling and brutal men to propose that the dead bodies of females, if poor, should be sold for the purpose of exhibition and dissection before an audience of men, a proposition that our rude ancestors would have answered, not by words, but by blows. Alas. Our women may talk of small clothes as long as they please, they may blush to scarlet at hearing animals designated by their sexual appellations, it may, to give the world a proof of our excessive modesty and delicacy, even pass a law, indeed we have done it, to punish an exposure of the person, but as long as our streets swarm with prostitutes, our asylums and private houses with bastards, as long as we have men operators in the delicate cases alluded to, and as long as the exhibiting of the dead body of a virtuous female before an audience of men shall not be punished by the law, and even with death, as long as we shall appear to be satisfied in this state of things, it becomes us, at any rate, to be silent about purity of mind, improvement of manners, and an increase of refinement and delicacy. This practice has brought the doctor into every family in the kingdom, which is of itself no small evil. I am not thinking of the expense, for, in cases like these, nothing in that way ought to be spared. If necessary to the safety of his wife, a man ought not only to part with his last shilling, but to pledge his future labor. But we all know that there are imaginary ailments, many of which are absolutely created by the habit of talking with or about the doctor. Read the domestic medicine, and by the time that you have done, you will imagine that you have, at times, all the diseases of which it treats. This practice has added to, has doubled, I, has augmented, I verily believe, tenfold the number of the gentlemen who are, in common parlance, called doctors, at which, indeed, I, on my own private account, ought to rejoice, for, invariably I have, even in the worst of times, found them everywhere amongst my staunchest and kindest friends. But though these gentlemen are not to blame for this, any more than attorneys are for their increase in number, and amongst these gentlemen, too, I have, with very few exceptions, always found sensible men and zealous friends, though the parties pursuing these professions are not to blame, though the increase of attorneys has arisen from the endless number and the complexity of the laws, and from the tenfold mass of crimes caused by poverty arising from oppressive taxation, and though they Increase of doctors has arisen from the diseases and the imaginary ailments arising from that effeminate luxury which has been created by the drawing of wealth from the many, and giving it to the few, and, as the lower classes will always endeavor to imitate the higher, so the Kusher has, along with the small clothes, descended from the lone palace down to the hovel of the pauper, there to take his fee out of the poor rates, though these parties are not to blame, the thing is not less an evil. Both professions have lost in character, in proportion to the increase in the number of its members, peaches, if they grew on edges, would rank but little above the berries of the bramble. But to return once more to the matter of risk of life, can it be that nature has so ordered it, that, as a general thing, the life of either mother or child shall be in danger, even if there were no attendant at all? Can this be? Certainly it cannot, safety must be the rule, and danger the exception, this must be the case, or the world never could have been peopled, and, perhaps, in ninety-nine cases out of every hundred, if nature were left wholly to herself, all would be right. The great doctor in these cases, is, comforting, consoling, cheering up. And who can perform this office like women? Who have for these occasions a language and sentiments which seem to have been invented for the purpose, and be they what they may as to general demeanor and character, they have all, upon these occasions, one common feeling, and that so amiable, so excellent, as to admit of no adequate description. They completely forget, for the time, all rivalships, all squabbles, all animosities, all hatred even, everyone feels as if it were her own particular concern. These, we may be well assured, are the proper attendants on these occasions, the mother, the aunt, the sister, the cousin, and female neighbor, these are the suitable attendants, having some experienced woman to afford extraordinary aid, if such be necessary, and in the few cases where the preservation of life demands the surgeon's skill, he is always at hand. The contrary practice, which we got from the French, is not, however, so general in France as in England. We have outstripped all the world in this, as we have in everything which proceeds from luxury and effeminacy on the one hand, and from poverty on the other, the millions have been stripped of their means to keep wealth on the thousands, and have been corrupted in manners, as well as in morals, by vicious examples set them by the possessors of that wealth. As reason says that the practice of which I complain cannot be cured without a total change in society, it would be presumption in me to expect such cure from any efforts of mine. I therefore must content myself with hoping that such change will come, and with declaring, that if I had to live my life over again, I would act upon the opinions which I have thought it my bounden duty here to state and endeavor to maintain. Having gotten over these thorny places as quickly as possible, I gladly come back to the babies, with regard to whom I shall have no prejudices, no affectation, no false pride, no sham fears to encounter, every heart, except there be one made of flint, being with me here. Then were there brought unto him little children, that he should put his hands on them, and pray, and the disciples rebuke them. But Jesus said, Suffer little children, and forbid them not to come unto me,
Our immortal bard, as the profligate Sheridan used to call him in public, while he laughed at him in private, our immortal bard seems to have forgotten that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were flung into the fiery furnace, made seven times hotter than usual, amidst the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music. He seems to have forgotten that it was a music and a dance loving damsel that chose, as a recompense for her elegant performance, the bloody head of John the Baptist, brought to her in a charger. He seems to have forgotten that, while Rome burned, Nero fiddled, he did not know, perhaps, that cannibals always dance and sing while their victims are roasting, but he might have known, and he must have known, that England's greatest tyrant, Henry VIII, had as his agent in blood, Thomas Cromwell, expressed it, his sweet soul enwrapped in the celestial sounds of music, and this was just at the time when the ferocious tyrant was ordering Catholics and Protestants to be tied back to back on the same hurdle, dragged to Smithfield on that hurdle, and they're tied to, and burned from, the same stake. Shakespeare must have known these things, for he lived immediately after their date, and if he had lived in our day, he would have seen instances enough of sweet souls enwrapped in the same manner, and capable, if not of deeds equally bloody, of others, discovering a total want of feeling for sufferings not unfrequently occasioned by their own wanton waste, and waste arising, too, in part, from their taste for these celestial sounds. Oh no. The heart of man is not to be known by this test. A great fondness for music is a mark of great weakness, great vacuity of mind, not of hardness of heart, not of vice, not of downright folly, but of a want of capacity, or inclination, for sober thought. This is not always the case. Accidental circumstances almost force the taste upon people, but, generally speaking, it is a preference of sound to sense. But the man, and especially the father, who is not fond of babies, who does not feel his heart softened when he touches their almost boneless limbs, when he sees their little eyes first begin to discern, when he hears their tender accents, the man whose heart does not be truly to this test, is, to say the best of him, an object of compassion. But the mother's feelings are here to be thought of too, for, of all gratifications, the very greatest that a mother can receive, is notice taken of, and praise bestowed on, her baby. The moment that gets into her arms, everything else diminishes in value, the father only accepted. Her own personal charms, notwithstanding all that men say and have written on the subject, become, at most, a secondary object as soon as the baby arrives. A saying of the old, profligate king of Prussia is frequently quoted in proof of the truth of the maxim, that a woman will forgive anything but calling her ugly, a very true maxim, perhaps, as applied to prostitutes, whether in high or low life, but a pretty long life of observation has told me, that a mother, worthy of the name, will care little about what you say of her person, so that you will but extol the beauty of her baby. Her baby is always the very prettiest that ever was born. It is always an eighth wonder of the world. And thus it ought to be, or there would be want of that wondrous attachment to it which is necessary to bear her up through all those cares and pains and toils inseparable from the preservation of its life and health. It is, however, of the part which the husband has to act, in participating in these cares and toils, that I am now to speak. Let no man imagine that the world will despise him for helping to take care of his own child. Thoughtless fools may attempt to ridicule, the unfeeling few may join in the attempt, but all, whose good opinion is worth having, will applaud his conduct, and will, in many cases, be disposed to repose confidence in him on that very account. To say of a man, that he is fond of his family, is, of itself, to say that, in private life at least, he is a good and trustworthy man, I, and in public life too, pretty much, for it is no easy matter to separate the two characters, and it is naturally concluded, that he who has been flagrantly wanting and feeling for his own flesh and blood, will not be very sensitive towards the rest of mankind. There is nothing more amiable, nothing more delightful to behold, than a young man especially taking part in the work of nursing the children, and how often have I admired this in the laboring men in Hampshire. It is, indeed, generally the same all over England, and as to America, it would be deemed brutal for a man not to take his full share of these cares and labors. The man who is to gain a living by his labor, must be drawn away from home, or, at least, from the cradle side, in order to perform that labor, but this will not, if he be made of good stuff, prevent him from doing his share of the duty due to his children. There are so many hours in the twenty-four, that he will have to spare for this duty, and there ought to be no toils, no watchings, no breaking of rest, imposed by this duty, of which he ought not to perform his full share, and that, too, without grudging. This is strictly due from him in payment for the pleasures of the marriage state. What right has he to the sole possession of a woman's person? What right to a husband's vast authority? What right to the honorable title and the boundless power of father? What right has he to all, or any of these, unless he can found his claim on the faithful performance of all the duties which these titles imply? One great source of the unhappiness amongst mankind arises, however, from a neglect of these duties, but, as if by way of compensation for their privations, they are much more duly performed by the poor than by the rich. The fashion of the laboring people is this, the husband, when free from his toil in the fields, takes his share in the nursing, which he manifestly looks upon as a sort of reward for his labor. However distant from his cottage, his heart is always at that home towards which he is carried, at night, by limbs that feel not their weariness, being urged on by heart anticipating the welcome of those who attend him there. Those who have, as I so many hundreds of times have, seen the laborers in the woodland parts of Hampshire and Sussex, coming, at nightfall, towards their cottage wickets, laden with fuel for a day or two, whoever has seen three or four little creatures looking out for the father's approach, running in to announce the glad tidings, and then scampering out to meet him, clinging round his knees, or hanging on his skirts, whoever has witnessed scenes like this, to witness which has formed one of. The greatest delights of my life will hesitate long before he prefer life of ease to a life of labor, before he prefer a communication with children intercepted by servants and teachers to that communication which is here direct, and which admits not of any division of affection. Then comes the Sunday, and, amongst all those who keep no servants, a great deal depends on the manner in which the father employs that day. When there are two or three children, or even one child, the first thing, after the breakfast, which is laid on this day of rest, is to wash and dress the child or children. Then, while the mother is dressing the dinner, the father, being in his Sunday clothes himself, takes care of the child or children. When dinner is over, the mother puts on her best, and then, all go to church, or, if that cannot be, whether from distance or other cause, all pass the afternoon together. This used to be the way of life amongst the laboring people, and from this way of life arose the most able and most moral people that the world ever saw, until grinding taxation took from them the means of obtaining a sufficiency of food and agreement, plunged the whole, good and bad, into one indiscriminate mass, under the degrading and hateful name of paupers. The working man, in whatever line, and whether in town or country, who spends his day of rest, or any part of it, except in case of absolute necessity, away from his wife and children, is not worthy of the name of father, and is seldom worthy of the trust of any employer. Such absence argues a want of fatherly and of conjugal affection, which want is generally duly repaid by similar want in the neglected parties, and, though stern authority may command and enforce obedience for a while, the time soon comes when it will be set at defiance, and when such a father, having no example, no proofs of love, to plead, complains of filial ingratitude, the silent indifference of his neighbors, and which is more poignant, his own heart, will tell him that his complaint is unjust. Thus far with regard to working people, but much more necessary is it to inculcate these principles in the minds of young men in the middle rank of life, and to be more particular, in their case, with regard to the care due to very young children, for here servants come in, and many are but too prone to think, that when they have handed their children over to well-paid and able servants, they have done their duty by them, than which there can hardly be more mischievous error. The children of the poorer people are, in general, much fonder of their parents than those of the rich are of theirs. This fondness is reciprocal, and the cause is, that the children of the former have, from their very birth, had a greater share than those of the latter of the personal attention, and of the never-ceasing endurance of their parents. I have before urged upon young married men, in the middle walks of life, to keep the servants out of the house as long as possible, and when they must come at last, when they must be had even to assist in taking care of children, let them be assistants in the most strict sense of the word, let them not be confided in, let children never be
How many are the instances of deformed bodies, of crooked limbs, of idiocy, or of deplorable imbecility, proceeding solely from young children being left to the care of servants? One would imagine that one single sight of this kind to be seen, or heard of, in a whole nation, would be sufficient to deter parents from the practice. And what, then, must those parents feel, who have brought this lifelong sorrowing on themselves? When once the thing is done, to repent is unavailing. And what is now the worth of all these and all the pleasures, to enjoy which the poor sufferer was abandoned to the care of servants? What? Can I plead example, then, in support of this rigid precept? Did we, who have bred up a family of children, and have had servants during the greater part of the time, never leave a young child to the care of servants? Never, no, not for one single hour. Were we, then, tied constantly to the house with them? No, for we sometimes took them out, but one or the other of us was always with them, until, in succession, they were able to take good care of themselves, or until the elder ones were able to take care of the younger, and then they sometimes stood sentinel in our stead. How could we visit then? Why, if both went, we bargained beforehand to take the children with us, and if this were a thing not to be proposed, one of us went, and the other stayed at home, the latter being very frequently my lot. From this we never once deviated. We cast aside all consideration of convenience, all calculations of expense, all thoughts of pleasure of every sort. And, what could have equaled the reward that we have received for our care and for our unshaken resolution in this respect? In the rearing of children, there is resolution wanting as well as tenderness. That parent is not truly affectionate who wants the courage to do that which is sure to give the child temporary pain. A great deal, in providing for the health and strength of children, depends upon their being duly and daily washed, when well, in cold water from head to foot. Their cries testify to what a degree they dislike this. They squall and kick and twist about at a fine rate, and many mothers, too many, neglect this, partly from reluctance to encounter this squalling, and partly, and much too often, from what I will not call idleness, but to which I cannot apply milder term than neglect. Well and duly performed, it is an hour's good tight work, for, besides the bodily labor, which is not very slight when the child gets to be five or six months old, there is the singing to overpower the voice of the child. The moment the stripping of the child used to begin, the singing used to begin, and the latter never ceased till the former had ceased. After having heard this go on with all my children, Rousseau taught me the philosophy of it. I happened, by accident, to look into his email, and there I found him saying, that the nurse subdued the voice of the child and made it quiet, by drowning its voice in hers, and thereby making it perceive that it could not be heard, and that to continue the cry was of no avail. Here, Nancy, said I, going to her with the book in my hand, you have been a great philosopher all your life, without either of us knowing it. A silent nurse is a poor soul. It is a great disadvantage to the child, if the mother be of a very silent, placid, quiet turn. The singing, the talking to, the tossing and rolling about, that mothers in general practice, are very beneficial to the children, they give them exercise, awaken their attention, animate them, and rouse them to action. It is very bad to have a child even carried about by a dull, inanimate, silent servant, who will never talk, sing, or chirp to it, who will but just carry it about, always kept in the same attitude, and seeing and hearing nothing to give it life and spirit. It requires nothing but a dull creature like this, and the washing and dressing left to her, to give a child the rickets, and make it, instead of being a strong straight person, tough shinned, bow kneed, or humpbacked, besides other ailments not visible to the eye. By and by, when the deformity begins to appear, the doctor is called in, but it is too late, the mischief is done, and a few months of neglect are punished by a life of mortification and sorrow, not wholly unaccompanied with shame. It is, therefore, a very spurious kind of tenderness that prevents a mother from doing the things which, though disagreeable to the child, are so necessary to its lasting well-being. The washing daily in the morning is a great thing, cold water winter or summer, and this never left to a servant, who has not, in such a case, either the patience or the courage that is necessary for the task. When the washing is over, and the child dressed in its day clothes, how gay and cheerful it looks. The exercise gives it appetite, and then disposes it to rest, and it sucks and sleeps and grows, the delight of all eyes, and particularly those of the parents. I can't bear that squalling. I have heard men say, and to which I answer, that I can't bear such men. There are, I thank God, very few of them, for, if they do not always reason about the matter, honest nature teaches them to be considerate and indulgent towards little creatures so innocent and so helpless and so unconscious of what they do. And the noise, after all, why should it disturb a man? He knows the exact cause of it, he knows that it is the unavoidable consequence of a great good to his child, and of course to him, it lasts but an hour, and the recompense instantly comes in the looks of the rosy child, and in the new hopes which every look excites. It never disturbed me, and my occupation was one of those most liable to disturbance by noise. Many score papers have I written amidst the noise of children, and in my whole life never bade them be still. When they grew up to be big enough to gallop about the house, I have, in wet weather, when they could not go out, written the whole day amidst noise that would have made some authors half mad. It never annoyed me at all. But a Scotch piper, whom an old lady, who lived beside us at Brompton, used to pay to come and play a long tune every day, I was obliged to bribe into a breach of contract. That which you are pleased with, however noisy, does not disturb you. That which is indifferent to you has not more effect. The rattle of coaches, the clapper of a mill, the fall of water, leave your mind undisturbed. But the sound of the pipe, awakening the idea of the lazy life of the piper, better paid than the laboring man, drew the mind aside from its pursuit, and, as it really was a nuisance, occasioned by the money of my neighbor, I thought myself justified in abating it by the same sort of means. The cradle is in poor families necessary, because necessity compels the mother to get as much time as she can for her work, and a child can rock the cradle. At first we had a cradle, and I rocked the cradle, in great part, during the time that I was writing my first work, the famous Maitre d'Anglais, which has long been the first book in Europe, as well as in America, for teaching the French people the English language. But we left off the use of the cradle as soon as possible. It causes sleep more, and oftener, than necessary, it saves trouble, but to take trouble was our duty. After the second child, we had no cradle, however difficult at first to do without it. When I was not at my business, it was generally my affair to put the child to sleep, sometimes by sitting with it in my arms, and sometimes by lying down on a bed with it, till it fell asleep. We soon found the good of this method. The children did not sleep so much, but they slept more soundly. The cradle produces a sort of dosing, or dreaming sleep. This is a matter of great importance, as everything must be that has any influence on the health of children. The poor must use the cradle, at least until they have other children big enough to hold the baby, and to put it to sleep, and it is truly wonderful at how early an age they, either girls or boys, will do this business faithfully and well. You see them in the lanes, and on the skirts of woods and commons, lugging a baby about, when it sometimes weighs half as much as the nurse. The poor mother is frequently compelled, in order to help to get bread for her children, to go to a distance from home, and leave the group, baby, and all, to take care of the house and of themselves, the eldest of four or five, not, perhaps, above six or seven years old, and it is quite surprising, that, considering the millions of instances in which this is done in England, in the course of a year, so very, very few accidents or injuries arise from the practice, and not a hundredth part so. Many as arise in the comparatively few instances in which children are left to the care of servants. In summertime you see these little groups rolling about up the green, or amongst the heath, not far from the cottage, and at a mile, perhaps, from any other dwelling, the dog their only protector. And what fine and straight and healthy and fearless and acute persons they become. It used to be remarked in Philadelphia, when I lived there, that there was not a single man of any eminence, whether doctor, lawyer, merchant, trader, or anything else, that had not been born and bred in the country, and of parents in a low state of life. Examine London, and you will find it much about the same. From this very childhood they are from necessity entrusted with the care of something valuable. They practically learn to think, and to calculate as to consequences. They are thus taught to remember things, and it is quite surprising what memories they have, and how scrupulously a little carter boy will deliver half a dozen messages, each of a different purport from the rest, to as many persons, all the messages committed to him at one and the same time, and he not knowing one letter of the alphabet
The courage, of which I have spoken, so necessary in the case of washing the children in spite of their screaming remonstrances, is, if possible, more necessary in cases of illness, requiring the application of medicine, or of surgical means of cure. Here the heart is put to the test indeed. Here is anguish to be endured by a mother, who has to force down the nauseous physic, or to apply the tormenting plaster. Yet it is the mother, or the father, and more properly the former, who is to perform this duty of exquisite pain. To no nurse, to no hireling, to no alien and, ought, if possible to avoid it, this task to be committed. I do not admire those mothers who are too tender-hearted to inflict this pain on their children, and who, therefore, leave it to be inflicted by others. Give me the mother who, while the tears stream down her face, has the resolution scrupulously to execute, with her own hands, the doctor's commands. Will a servant, will any hireling, do this? Committed to such hands, the least trouble will be preferred to the greater, the thing will, in general, not be half done, and if done, the suffering from such hands is far greater in the mind of the child than if it came from the hands of the mother. In this case, above all others, there ought to be no delegation of the parental office. Here life or limb is at stake, and the parent, man or woman, who, in any one point, can neglect his or her duty here, is unworthy of the name of parent. And here, as in all the other instances, where goodness in the parents towards the children give such weight to their advice when the children grow up, what a motive to filial gratitude. The children who are old enough to deserve and remember, will witness this proof of love and self-devotion in their mother. Each of them feels that she has done the same towards them all, and they love her and admire and revere her accordingly. This is the place to state my opinions, and the result of my experience, with regard to that fearful disease the smallpox, a subject, to, to which I have paid great attention. I was always, from the very first mention of the thing, opposed to the cowpox scheme. If efficacious in preventing the smallpox, I objected to it merely on the score of its beastliness. There are some things, surely, more hideous than death, and more resolutely to be avoided, at any rate, more to be avoided than the mere risk of suffering death. And, amongst other things, I always reckoned that of a parent causing the blood, and the diseased blood too, of a beast to be put into the veins of human beings, and those beings the children of that parent. I, therefore, as will be seen in the pages of the register of that day, most strenuously opposed the giving of twenty thousand pounds to Jenner out of the taxes, paid in great part by the working people, which I deemed and asserted to be a scandalous waste of the public money. I contended, that this beastly application could not, in nature, be efficacious in preventing the smallpox, and that, even if efficacious for that purpose, it was wholly unnecessary. The truth of the former of these assertions has now been proved in thousands upon thousands of instances. For a long time, for ten years, the contrary was boldly and brazenly asserted. This nation is fond of quackery of all sorts, and this particular quackery having been sanctioned by king, lords and commons, it spread over the country like a pestilence borne by the winds. Speedily sprang up the royal generation institution, and branch institutions, issuing from the parent trunk, set instantly to work, impregnating the veins of the rising and enlightened generation with the beastly matter. Gentlemen and ladies made the commodity a pocket companion, and if a caterer's child, in Hampshire at least, even seen by them, on a common, were not pretty quick in taking to its heels, it had to carry off more or less of the disease of the cow. One would have thought that one half of the cows in England must have been tapped to get at such a quantity of this stuff. In the midst of all this mad work, to which the doctors, after having found it in vain to resist, had yielded, the real smallpox, in its worst form, broke out in the town of Ringwood, in Hampshire, and carried off, I believe, I have not the account at hand, more than a hundred persons, young and old, every one of whom had had the cowpox so nicely. And what was now said? Was the quackery exploded, and were the grantators of the twenty thousand pounds ashamed of what they had done? Not at all, the failure was imputed to unskillful operators, to the staleness of the matter, to its not being of the genuine quality. Admitting all this, the schemes to condemn, for the great advantages held forth were, that anybody might perform the operation, and that the matter was everywhere abundant and cost-free. But these were paltry excuses, the mere shuffles of quackery, for what do we know now? Why, that in hundreds of instances, persons cowpoxed by Jenner himself, have taken the real smallpox afterwards, and have either died from the disorder, or narrowly escaped with their lives. I will mention two instances, the parties concerned being living and well-known, one of them to the whole nation, and the other to a very numerous circle in the higher walks of life. The first is Sir Richard Phillips, so well known by his able writings, and equally well known by his exemplary conduct as Sheriff of London, and by his lifelong labors in the cause of real charity and humanity. Sir Richard had, I think, two sons, whose veins were impregnated by the grantee himself. At any rate, he had one, who had, several years after Jenner had given him the ensuring matter, a very hard struggle for his life, under the hands of the good, old fashioned, seam giving, and dimple dipping smallpox. The second is Philip Codd, ESQ, formerly of Kensington, and now of Rumsted Court, near Maidstone, in Kent, who has a son that had a very narrow escape under the real smallpox, about four years ago, and who also had been cowpoxed by Jenner himself. This last mentioned gentleman I have known, and most sincerely respected, from the time of our both being about eighteen years of age. When the young gentleman, of whom I am now speaking, was very young, I having him upon my knee one day, asked his kind and excellent mother, whether he had been inoculated. Oh, no, said she, we are going to have him vaccinated. Whereupon I, going into the garden to the father, said, I do hope, Cod, that you are not going to have the beastly cow stuff put into that fine boy. Why, said he, you see, Cobbett, it is to be done by Jenner himself. What answer I gave, what names and epithets I bestowed upon Jenner and his quackery, I will lead the reader to imagine. Now, here are instances enough, but, every reader has heard of, if not seen, scores of others. Young Mr. Cod caught the smallpox at a school, and if I recollect rightly, there were several other vaccinated youths who did the same, at the same time. Quackery, however, has always a shuffle left. Now that the cowpox has been proved to be no guarantee against the smallpox, it makes it milder when it comes. A pretty shuffle, indeed, this. You are to be all your life in fear of it, having as your sole consolation, that when it comes, and it may overtake you in a camp, or on the seas, it will be milder. It was not too mild to kill Ringwood, and its mildness, in case of young Mr. Cod, did not restrain it from blinding him for a suitable number of days. I shall not easily forget the alarm and anxiety of the father and mother upon this occasion, both of them the best of parents, and both of them now punished for having yielded to this fashionable quackery. I will not say, justly punished, for affection for their children, in which respect they were never surpassed by any parents on earth, was the cause of their listening to the danger obviating quackery. This, too, is the case with other parents, but parents should be under the influence of reason and experience, as well as under that of affection, and now, at any rate, they ought to set this really dangerous quackery at naught. And, what does my own experience say on the other side? There are my seven children, the sons as tall, or nearly so, as their father, and the daughters as tall as their mother, all, in due succession, inoculated with the good old-fashioned face-tearing smallpox, neither of them with a single mark of that disease on their skins, neither of them having been, that we could perceive, ill for a single hour, in consequence of the inoculation. When we were in the United States, we observed that the Americans were never marked with the smallpox, or, if such a thing were seen, it was very rarely. The cause we found to be, the universal practice of having the children inoculated at the breast, and, generally, at a month or six weeks old. When we came to have children, we did the same. I believe that some of ours have been a few months old when the operation has been performed, but always while at the breast, and as early as possible after the expiration of six weeks from the birth, sometimes put off a little while by some slight disorder in the child, or on account of some circumstance or other, but, with these exceptions, done it, or before, the end of six weeks from the birth, and always at the breast. All is then pure, there is nothing in either body or mind to favor the natural theory of the disease. We always took particular care about the source from which the infectious matter came. We employed medical men, in whom we could place perfect confidence, we had their solemn word for the matter coming from some healthy child, and, at last, we had sometimes to wait for this,
I, at first, objected to the inoculating of the child, but she insisted upon it, and with so much pertinacity that I gave way, on condition that she would be inoculated too. This was done with three or four of the children, I think, she always being reluctant to have it done, saying that it looked like distressing the goodness of God. There was, to be sure, very little in this argument, but the long experience wore away the alarm, and there she is now, having had eight children hanging at her breast with that desolating disease in them, and she never having been affected by it from first to last. All her children knew, of course, the risk that she voluntarily incurred for them. They all have this indubitable proof, that she valued their lives above her own, and is it in nature, that they should ever willfully do anything to wound the heart of that mother, and must not her bright example have great effect on their character and conduct. Now, my opinion is, that the far greater part of English or American women, if placed in the above circumstances, would do just the same thing, and I do hope, that those, who have yet to be mothers, will seriously think of putting an end, as they have the power to do, to the disgraceful and dangerous quackery, the evils of which I have so fully proved. But there is, in the management of babies, something besides life, health, strength, and beauty, and something too, without which all these put together are nothing worth, and that is sanity of mind. There are, owing to various causes, some who are born idiots, but a great many more become insane from the misconduct, or neglect, of parents, and, generally, from the children being committed to the care of servants. I knew, in Pennsylvania, a child, as fine, and as sprightly, and as intelligent a child as ever was born, made an idiot for life by being, when about three years old, shut into a dark closet, by a maid servant, in order to terrify it into silence. The thoughtless creature first menaced it with sending it to the bad place, as the phrase is there, and, at last, to reduce it to silence, put it into the closet, shut the door, and went out of the room. She went back, in a few minutes, and found the child in a fit. It recovered from that, but was for life an idiot. When the parents, who had been out two days and two nights on a visit of pleasure, came home, they were told that the child had had a fit, but, they were not told the cause. The girl, however, who was a neighbor's daughter, being on her deathbed about ten years afterwards, could not die in peace without sending for the mother of the child, now become a young man, and asking forgiveness of her. The mother herself was, however, the greatest offender of the two, a whole lifetime of sorrow and of mortification was a punishment too late for her and her husband. Thousands upon thousands of human beings have been deprived of their senses by these and similar means. It is not long since that we read, in the newspapers, of a child being absolutely killed, at Birmingham, I think it was, by being thus frightened. The parents had gone out into what is called an evening party. The servants, naturally enough, had their party at home, and the mistress, who, by some unexpected accident, had been brought home at an early hour, finding the parlor full of company, ran upstairs to see about her child, about two or three years old. She found it with its eyes open, but fixed, touching it, she found it inanimate. The doctor was sent for in vain, it was quite dead. The maid affected to know nothing of the cause, but some one of the parties assembled discovered, pinned up to the curtains of the bed, a horrid figure, made up partly of a frightful mask. This, as the wretched girl confessed, had been done to keep the child quiet, while she was with her company below. When one reflects on the anguish that the poor little thing must have endured, before the life was quite frightened out of it, one can find no term sufficiently strong to express the abhorrence due to the perpetrator of this crime, which was, in fact, a cruel murder, and, if it was beyond the reach of the law, it was so and is so, because, as in the cases of parasite, the law, in making no provision for punishment peculiarly severe, has, out of respect to human nature, supposed such crimes to be impossible. But if the girl was criminal, if death, or life of remorse, was her due, what was the due of her parents, and especially of the mother? And what was the due of the father, who suffered that mother, and who, perhaps, tempted her to neglect her most sacred duty? If this poor child had been deprived of its mental faculties, instead of being deprived of its life, the cause would, in all likelihood, never have been discovered. The insanity would have been ascribed to brain fever, or to some other of the usual causes of insanity, or, as in thousands upon thousands of instances, to some unaccountable cause. When I was, in no. 9, paragraphs from 2, both inclusive, maintaining with all my might, the unalienable right of the child to the milk of its mother, I omitted, amongst the evils arising from banishing the child from the mother's breast, to mention, or, rather, it had never occurred to me to mention, the loss of reason to the poor, innocent creatures, thus banished. And now, as connected with this measure, I have an argument of experience, enough to terrify every young man and woman upon earth from the thought of committing this offense against nature. I wrote no. 9 at Cambridge, on Sunday, the TH of March, and before I quitted Shrewsbury, on the TH of May, the following facts reached my ears. A very respectable tradesman, who, with his wife, have led a most industrious life, in a town that it is not necessary to name, said to a gentleman that told it to me, I wish to God I had read no. Nine of Mr. Cobbett's advice to young men fifteen years ago. He then related, that he had had ten children, all put out to be suckled, in consequence of the necessity of his having the mother's assistance to carry on his business, and that two out of the ten had come home idiots, though the rest were all sane, and though insanity had never been known in the family of either father or mother. These parents, whom I myself saw, are very clever people, and the wife singularly industrious and expert in her affairs. Now the motive, in this case, unquestionably was good, it was that the mother's valuable time might, as much as possible, be devoted to the earning of a competence for her children. But, alas, what is this competence to these two unfortunate beings? And what is the confidence to the rest, when put in the scale against the mortification that they must, all their lives, suffer on account of the insanity of their brother and sister, exciting, as it must, in all their circle, and even in themselves, suspicions of their own perfect soundness of mind? When weighed against this consideration, what is all the wealth in the world? And as to the parents, where are they to find compensation for such a calamity, embittered additionally, too, by the reflection, that it was in their power to prevent it, and that nature, with loud voice, cried out to them to prevent it? Money. Wealth acquired in consequence of this banishment of these poor children, these victims of this, I will not call it avarice, but over eager love of gain. Wealth, thus acquired. What wealth can console these parents for the loss of reason in these children? Where is the father and the mother, who would not rather see their children plowing in other men's fields, and sweeping other men's houses, than let about parks or houses of their own, objects of pity even of the menials procured by their wealth? If what I have now said be not sufficient to deter a man from suffering any consideration, no matter what, to induce him to delegate the care of his children, when very young, to anybody whomsoever, nothing that I can say can possibly have that effect, and I will, therefore, now proceed to offer my advice with regard to the management of children when they get beyond the danger of being crazed or killed by nurses or servants. We here come to the subject of education in the true sense of that word, which is rearing up, seeing that the word comes from the Latin educo, which means to breed up, or to rear up. I shall, afterwards, have to speak of education in the now common acceptation of the word, which makes it mean, book learning. At present, I am to speak of education in its true sense, as the French, who, as well as we, take the word from the Latin, always use it. They, in their agricultural works, talk of the education du cochon, de la louette, and see, that is of the hog, the lark, and so of other animals, that is to say, of the manner of breeding them, or rearing them up, from their being little things till they be of full size. The first thing, in the rearing of children, who have passed from the baby state, is, as to the body, plenty of good food, and, as to the mind, constant good example in the parents. But the latter I shall speak more by and by. With regard to the former, it is of the greatest importance, that children be well fed, and there never was a greater error than to believe that they do not need good food. Everyone knows, that to have fine horses, the colts must be kept well, and that it is the same with regard to all animals of every sort and kind. The fine horses and cattle and sheep all come from the rich pastures. To have them fine, it is not sufficient that they have plenty of food when young, but that they have rich food. Were there no land, no pasture, in England, but such as is found in Middlesex, Essex, and Surrey, we should see none of those coach horses and dray horses whose height and size make us stare. It is the keep when young that makes the fine animal. There is no other reason for the people in the American
It cannot bite the meat, but it's come squeeze out the juice. When it is done with the breast, it eats meat constantly twice, if not thrice, a day. And this abundance of good food is the cause, to be sure, of the superior size and strength of the people of that country. Nor is this, in any point of view, an unimportant matter. The tall man is, whether it's laborer, carpenter, bricklayer, soldier, or sailor, or almost anything else, worth more than a short man, he can look over a higher thing, he can reach higher in ladder, he can move on from place to place faster, in mowing grass or corn he takes a wider swarth, in pitching he wants a shorter prong, in making buildings he does not so soon want a ladder or a scaffold, in fighting he keeps his body farther from the point of his sword. To be sure, a man may be tall and weak, but, this is the exception and not the rule, height and weight and strength, in men as in speechless animals, generally go together. I, in an enterprise encouraged to, the powers of the body have a great deal to do. Doubtless there are, have been, and always will be, great numbers of small and enterprising and brave men, but it is not in nature, that, generally speaking, those who are conscious of their inferiority in point of bodily strength, should possess the boldness of those who have a contrary description. To what but this difference in the size and strength of the opposing combatants are we to ascribe the ever to be blushed at events of our last war against the United States? The hearts of our seamen and soldiers were as good as those of the Yankees, on both sides they had sprung from the same stock, on both sides equally well supplied with all the materials of war, if on either side, the superior skill was on ours, French, Dutch, Spaniards, all had confessed our superior prowess, yet, when, with our whole undivided strength, and to that strength adding the flush and pride of victory and conquest, crowned even in the capital of France, when, with all these tremendous advantages, and with all the nations of the earth looking on, we came foot to foot and yard arm to yard arm with the Americans, the result was such as an English pen refuses to describe. What, then, was the great cause of this result, which filled us with shame in the world with astonishment? Not the want of courage in our men. There were, indeed, some moral causes at work, but the main cause was, the great superiority of size and of bodily strength on the part of the enemy soldiers and sailors. It was so many men on each side, but it was men of a different size and strength, and, on the side of the foe, men accustomed to daring enterprise from a consciousness of that strength. Why are abstinence and fasting enjoined by the Catholic Church? Why, to make men humble, meek, and tame, and they have this effect too, this is visible in whole nations as well as in individuals. So the good food, and plenty of it, is not more necessary to the forming of a stout and able body than to the forming of an active and enterprising spirit. Poor food, short allowance, while they check the growth of the child's body, check also the daring of the mind, and, therefore, the starving or pinching system ought to be avoided by all means. Children should eat often, and as much as they like at a time. They will, if at full heap, never take, a plain food, more than it is good for them to take. They may, indeed, be stuffed with cakes and sweet things till they be ill, and, indeed, until they bring on dangerous disorders, but, of meat plainly and well cooked, and of bread, they will never swallow the tenth part of an ounce more than it is necessary for them to swallow. Ripe fruit, or cooked fruit, if no sweetening take place, will never hurt them, but, when they once get a taste for sugary stuff, and to cram down loads of garden vegetables, when ices, creams, tarts, raisins, almonds, all the endless pamperings come, the doctor must soon follow with his drugs. The blowing out of the bodies of children with tea, coffee, soup, or warm liquids of any kind, is very bad. These have an effect precisely like that which is produced by feeding young rabbits or pigs or other young animals upon watery vegetables. It makes them big-bellied and bare-boned at the same time, and it effectually prevents the frame from becoming strong. Children in health want no drink other than skim milk, or buttermilk, or whey, and, if none of those be at hand, water will do very well, provided they have plenty of good meat. Cheese and butter do very well for part of the day. Puddings and pies, but always without sugar, which, say what people will about the wholesomeness of it, is not only of no use in the rearing of children, but injurious, it forces an appetite, like strong drink, it makes daily encroachments on the taste, it wheedles down that which the stomach does not want, it finally produces illness, it is one of the curses of the country, for it, by taking off the bitter of the tea and coffee, is the great cause of sending down into the stomach those quantities of warm water by which the body is debilitated and deformed and the mind enfeebled. I am addressing myself to persons in the middle walk of life, but no parent can be sure that his child will not be compelled to labor hard for its daily bread, and then, how vast is the difference between one who has been pampered with sweets and one who has been reared on plain food and simple drink. The next thing after good and plentiful and plain food is good air. This is not within the reach of everyone, but, to obtain it is worth great sacrifices in other respects. We know that there are smells which will cause instant death, we know, that there are others which will cause death in a few years, and, therefore, we know that it is the duty of parents to provide, if possible, against this danger to the health of their offspring. To be sure, when a man is so situated that he cannot give his children sweet air without putting himself into jail for death, when, in short, he has the dire choice of sickly children, children with big heads, small limbs, and rickety joints, or children sent to the poorhouse, when this is his hard lot, he must decide for the former sad alternative, but before he will convince me that this is his lot, he must prove to me that he and his wife expend not a penny in the decoration of their persons, that on his table, morning, noon, or night, nothing ever comes that is not the produce of English soil, that of his time not one hour is wasted in what is called pleasure, that down his throat not one drop or morsel ever goes, unless necessary to sustain life and health. How many scores and how many hundreds of men have I seen? How many thousands could I go and point out? Tomorrow, in London, the money expended on whose guzzlings and porter, grog, and wine, would keep, and keep well, in the country, a considerable part of the year, a wife surrounded by healthy children, instead of being stood up in some alley, or back room, with a parcel of poor creatures about her, whom she, though their fond mother, is almost ashamed to call hers. Compared with the life of such a woman, that of the laborer, however poor, is paradise. Tell me not of the necessity of providing money for them, even if you waste not a farthing, you can provide them with no money equal in value to health and straight limbs and good looks, these it is, if within your power, your bounden duty to provide for them, as to providing them with money, you deceive yourself, it is your own avarice, or vanity, that you are seeking to gratify, and not to ensure the good of your children. Their most precious possession is health and strength, and you have no right to run the risk of depriving them of these for the sake of keeping together money to bestow on them. You have the desire to see them rich, it is to gratify yourself that you act in such a case, and you, however you may deceive yourself, are guilty of injustice towards them. You would be ashamed to see them without fortune, but not at all ashamed to see them without straight limbs, without color in their cheeks, without strength, without activity, and with only half their due portion of reason. Besides sweet air, children want exercise. Even when they are babies in arms, they want tossing and pulling about, and want talking and singing too. They should be put upon their feet by slow degrees, according to the strength of their legs, and this is a matter which a good mother will attend to with incessant care. If they appear to be likely to squint, she will, always when they wake up, and frequently in the day, take care to present some pleasing object right before, and never on the side of their face. If they appear, when they begin to talk, to indicate a propensity to stammer, she will stop them, repeat the word or word slowly herself, and get them to do the same. These precautions are amongst the most sacred of the duties of parents, for, remember, the deformity is for life, a thought which will fill every good parent's heart with solicitude. All swaddling and tight covering are mischievous. They produce distortions of some sort or other. To let children creep and roll about till they get upon their legs of themselves is a very good way. I never saw a Native American with crooked limbs or humpback, and never heard any man say that he had seen one. And the reason is, doubtless, the loose dress in which children, from the moment of their birth, are kept, the good food that they always have, and the sweet air that they breathe in consequence of the absence of all dread of poverty on the part of the parents. As to bodily exercise, they will, when they begin to get about, take, if you let them alone, just as much of it as nature bids them, and no more. That is a pretty deal, indeed, if they be in health, and, it is your duty, now, to provide for their taking of that exercise, when they begin to be what are called boys and girls, in a way that shall tend
I was resolved to forego all the means of making money, all the means of living in anything like fashion, all the means of obtaining fame or distinction, to give up everything, to become common laborer, rather than make my children lead a life of restraint and rebuke. I could not be sure that my children would love me as they loved their own lives, but I was, at any rate, resolved to deserve such love at their hands, and, in possession of that, I felt that I could set calamity, of whatever. Description, at defiance. Now, proceeding to relate what was, in this respect, my line of conduct, I am not pretending that every man, and particularly every man living in a town, can, in all respects, do as I did in the rearing up of children. But, in many respects, any man may, whatever may be his state of life. For I did not lead an idle life, I had to work constantly for the means of living, my occupation required unremitted attention, I had nothing but my labor to rely on, and I had no friend, to whom, in case of need, I could fly for assistance, I always saw the possibility, and even the probability, of being totally ruined by the hand of power, but, happen what would, I was resolved, that, as long as I could cause them to do it, my children should lead happy lives, and happy lives they did lead. If ever children did in this whole world, the first thing that I did, when the fourth child had come, was to get into the country, and so far as to render a going backward and forward to London, at short intervals, quite out of the question. Thus was health, the greatest of all things, provided for, as far as I was able to make the provision. Next, my being always at home was secured as far as possible, always with them to set an example of early rising, sobriety, and application to something or other. Children, and especially boys, will have some out of their pursuits, and it was my duty to lead them to choose such pursuits as combine future utility with present innocence. Each is flower bed, little garden, plantation of trees, rabbits, dogs, at, dollar number at, horses, pheasants and hares, hoes, spades, whips, guns, always some object of lively interest, and as much earnestness and bustle about the various objects as if our living had solely depended upon them. I made everything give way to the great object of making their lives happy and innocent. I did not know what they might be in time, or what might be my lot, but I was resolved not to be the cause of their being unhappy then, let what might become of us afterwards. I was, as I am, of opinion, that it is injurious to the mind to press book learning upon it at an early age, I always felt pain for poor little things, set up, before company, to repeat verses, or bits of plays, at six or eight years old. I have sometimes not known which way to look, when a mother, and, too often, a father, whom I could not but respect on account of her fondness for her child, has forced the feeble voice wonder of the world, to stand with its little hand stretched out, spouting the soliloquy of Hamlet, or some such thing. I remember, on one occasion, a little pale-faced creature, only five years old, was brought in, after the feeding part of the dinner was over, first to take his regular half glass of vintner's brewings, commonly called wine, and then to treat us to a display of his wonderful genius. The subject was a speech of a robust and bold youth, in a Scotch play, the title of which I have forgotten, but the speech began with, My name is Norval, on the Grampian Hills my father fed his flocks. And this in a voice so weak and distressing as to put me in mind of the plaint of squeaking of little pigs when the sow was lying on them. As we were going home, one of my boys and I, he, after a silence of half a mile perhaps, rode up close to the side of my horse, and said, Papa, where be the Grampian Hills? Oh, said I, they are in Scotland, poor, barren, beggarly places, covered with heath and rushes, ten times as barren as Cheryl Heath. But, said he, how could that little boy's father feed his flocks there, then? I was ready to tumble off the horse with laughing. I do not know anything much more distressing to the spectators than exhibitions of this sort. Everyone feels, not for the child, for it is insensible to the uneasiness it excites, but for the parents, whose amiable fondness displays itself in this ridiculous manner. Upon these occasions, no one knows what to say, or whither to direct his looks. The parents, and especially the fond mother, looked sharply round for the so evidently merited applause, as an actor of the name of London, whom I recollect thirty years ago, used, when he had treated us to a witty shrug of his shoulders, or twist of his chin, to turn his face up to the gallery for the clap. If I had to declare on my oath which have been the most disagreeable moments of my life, I verily believe, that, after due consideration, I should fix upon those, in which parents, whom I have respected, have made me endure exhibitions like these, for, this is your choice, to be insincere, or to give offense. And, as towards the child, it is to be unjust, thus to teach it to set a high value on trifling, not to say mischievous, attainments, to make it, whether it be in its natural disposition or not, vain and conceited. The plaudits which it receives, in such cases, puffs it up in its own thoughts, sends it out into the world stuffed with pride and insolence, which must and will be extracted out of it by one means or another, and none but those who have had to endure the drawing of firmly fixed teeth, can, I take it, have an adequate idea of the painfulness of this operation. Now, parents have no right thus to indulge their own feelings at the risk of the happiness of their children. The great matter is, however, the spoiling of the mind by forcing on it thoughts which it is not fit to receive. We know well, we daily see, that in men, as well as in other animals, the body is rendered comparatively small and feeble by being heavily loaded, or hard worked, before it arrives at size and strength proportioned to such load and such work. It is just so with the mind. The attempt to put old heads upon young shoulders is just as unreasonable as it would be to expect a cold six months old to be able to carry a man. The mind, as well as the body, requires time to come to its strength, and the way to have it possess, at last, its natural strength, is not to attempt to load it too soon, and to favor it in its progress by giving to the body good and plentiful food, sweet air, and abundant exercise, accompanied with as little discontent or uneasiness as possible. It is universally known that ailments of the body are, in many cases, sufficient to destroy the mind, and to debilitate it in innumerable instances. It is equally well known that the torments of the mind are, in many cases, sufficient to destroy the body. This, then, being so well known, is it not the first duty of a father to secure to his children, if possible, sound and strong bodies? Lord Bacon says that a sound mind and a sound body is the greatest of God's blessings. To see his children possess these, therefore, ought to be the first object with every father, an object which I cannot too often endeavor to fix in his mind. I am to speak presently of that sort of learning which is derived from books, and which is a matter by no means to be neglected, or to be thought little of, seeing that it is the road, not only to fame, but to the means of doing great good to one's neighbors and to one's country, and, thereby, of adding to those pleasant feelings which are, in other words, our happiness. But, notwithstanding this, I must here insist, and endeavor to impress my opinion upon the mind of every father, that his children's happiness ought to be first object, that book learning, if it tend to militate against this, ought to be disregarded, and that, as to money, as to fortune, as to rank and title, that father who can, in the destination of his children, think of them more than of the happiness of those children, is, if he be of same mind, a great criminal. Who's there, having lived to the age of thirty, or even twenty, years, and having the ordinary capacity for observation, who's there, being of this description, who must not be convinced of the inadequacy of riches and what are called honors to ensure happiness? Who, amongst all the classes of men, experience, on an average, so little of real pleasure, and so much of real pain as the rich and the lofty? Hope gives us, as the materials for happiness, health, peace, and competence. I, but what is peace, and what is competence? If, by peace, he mean the tranquility of mind which innocence and good deeds produce, he is right and clear so far, for we all know that, without health, which has a well-known positive meaning, there can be no happiness. But competence is a word of unfixed meaning. It may, with some, mean enough to eat, drink, wear and be lodged and warmed with, but, with others, it may include horses, carriages, and footmen laced over from top to toe. So that, here, we have no guide, no standard, and, indeed, there can be none. But as every sensible father must know that the possession of riches do not, never did, and never can, afford even a chance of additional happiness, it is his duty to inculcate in the minds of his children to make no sacrifice of principle, of moral obligation of any sort, in order to obtain riches or distinction, and it is a duty still more imperative on him, not to expose them to the risk of loss of health, or diminution of strength, for purposes which have, either directly or indirectly, the acquiring of riches in view, whether for
When I was a very little boy, I was, in the barley sowing season, going along by the side of a field, near Waverly Abbey, the primroses and bluebells bespangling the banks on both sides of me, a thousand linnets singing and spreading all over my head, while the jingle of the traces and the whistling of the plowboy saluted my ear from over the hedge, and, as it were to snatch me from the enchantment, the hounds, at that instant, having started a hare in the hanger on the other side of the field, came up scampering over it in full cry, kicking me after them many a mile. I was not more than eight years old, but this particular scene has presented itself to my mind many times every year from that day to this. I always enjoy it over again, and I was resolved to give, if possible, the same enjoyments to my children. Men's circumstances are so various, there is such a great variety in their situations in life, their business, the extent of their pecuniary means, the local state in which they are placed, their internal resources, the variety in all these respects is so great, that, as applicable to every family, it would be impossible to lay down any set of rules, or maxims, touching every matter relating to the management and rearing of children. In giving an account, therefore, of my own conduct, in this respect, I am not to be understood as supposing, that every father can, or ought, to attempt to do the same, but while it will be seen, that there are many, and these the most important parts of that conduct, that all fathers may imitate, if they choose, there is no part of it which thousands and thousands of fathers might not adopt and pursue, and adhere to, to the very letter. I affected everything without scolding, and even without command. My children are a family of scholars, each sex its appropriate species of learning, and, I could safely take my oath, that I never ordered a child of mine, son, or daughter, to look into a book, in my life. My two eldest sons, when about eight years old, were, for the sake of their health, placed for a very short time, at a clergyman's at Michelle Dever, and my eldest daughter, a little older, at a school a few miles from Botley, to avoid taking them to London in the winter. But, with these exceptions, never had they, while children, teacher of any description, and I never, and nobody else ever, taught any one of them to read, write, or anything else, except in conversation, and, yet, no man was ever more anxious to be the father of a family of clever and learned persons. I accomplished my purpose indirectly. The first thing of all was health, which was secured by the deeply interesting and never-ending sports of the field and pleasures of the garden. Luckily these things were treated of in books and pictures of endless variety, so that on wet days, in long evenings, these came into play. A large, strong table, in the middle of the room, their mother sitting at her work, used to be surrounded with them, the baby, if big enough, set up in a high chair. Here were inkstands, pens, pencils, india rubber, and paper, all in abundance, and everyone scrabbled about as he or she pleased. There were prints of animals of all sorts, books treating of them, others treating of gardening, of flowers, of husbandry, of hunting, coursing, shooting, fishing, planting, and, in short, of everything, with regard to which we had something to do. One would be trying to imitate a bit of my writing, another drawing the pictures of some of our dogs or horses, a third poking over Blue's quadrupeds and picking out what he said about them, but our book of never failing resource was the French Maison Rustique, or Farmhouse, which, it is said, was the book that first tempted to Quesnois, I think that was the name, the famous physician, in the reign of Louis XIV, to learn to read. Here are all the four legged animals, from the horse down to the mouse, portraits and all, all the birds, reptiles, insects, all the modes of rearing, managing, and using the tame ones, all the modes of taking the wild ones, and of destroying those that are mischievous, all the various traps, springs, nets, all the implements of husbandry and gardening, all the labors of the field and the garden exhibited, as well as the rest, in plates, and, there was I, in my leisure moments, to join this inquisitive group, to read the French, and tell them what it meant in English, when the picture did not sufficiently explain itself. I never have been without a copy of this book for forty years, except during the time that I was fleeing from the dungeons of Castlereagh and Sidmouth, and, and, when I got to Long Island, the first book I bought was another Maison Rustique. What need have you of schools? What need of teachers? What need of scolding and force, to induce children to read, write, and love books? What need of cards, dice, or of any games, to kill time, but, in fact, to implant in the infant heart a love of gaming, one of the most destructive of all human vices? We did not want to kill time, we were always busy, wet weather or dry weather, winter or summer. There was no force in any case, no command, no authority, none of these was ever wanted. To teach the children the habit of early rising was a great object, and everyone knows how young people cling to their beds, and how loath they are to go to those beds. This was a capital matter, because, here were industry and health both at stake. Yet, I avoided command even here, and merely offered a reward. The child that was downstairs first, was called the lark for that day, and, further, sat at my right hand at dinner. They soon discovered, that to rise early, they must go to bed early, and thus was this most important object secured, with regard to girls as well as boys. Nothing more inconvenient, and, indeed, more disgusting, than to have to do with girls, or young women, who lounge in bed, a little more sleep, a little more slumber, a little more folding of the hands to sleep. Solomon knew them well, he had, I dare say, seen the breakfast cooling, carriages and horses and servants waiting, the sun coming burning on, the day wasting, the night growing dark too early, appointments broken, and the objects of journeys defeated, and all this from the lolloping in bed of persons who ought to have risen with the sun. No beauty, no modesty, no accomplishments, are a compensation for the effects of laziness in women, and, of all the proofs of laziness, none is so unequivocal as that of lying late in bed. Love makes men overlook this vice, for it is a vice, for a while, but, this does not last for life. Besides, health demands early rising, the management of a house imperiously demands it, but health, that most precious possession, without which there is nothing else worth possessing, demands it too. The morning air is the most wholesome and strengthening, even in crowded cities, men might do pretty well with the aid of the morning air, but, how are they to rise early, if they go to bed late? But, to do the things I did, you must love home yourself, to rear up children in this manner, you must live with them, you must make them, to, feel, by your conduct, that you prefer this to any other mode of passing your time. All men cannot lead this sort of life, but many may, and all much more than many do. My occupation, to be sure, was chiefly carried on at home, but, I had always enough to do, I never spent an idle week, or even day, in my whole life. Yet I found time to talk with them, to walk, or ride, about with them, and when forced to go from home, always took one or more with me. You must be good-tempered too with them, they must like your company better than any other persons, they must not wish you away, not fear your coming back, not look upon your departure as a holiday. When my business kept me away from the scrabbling table, a petition often came, that I would go and talk with the group, and the bearer generally was the youngest, being the most likely to succeed. When I went from home, all followed me to the outer gate, and looked after me, till the carriage, or horse, was out of sight. At the time appointed for my return, all were prepared to meet me, and if it were late at night, they sat up as long as they were able to keep their eyes open. This love of parents, and this constant pleasure at home, made them not even think of seeking pleasure abroad, and they, thus, were kept from vicious playmates and early corruption. This is the age, too, to teach children to be trustworthy, and to be merciful and humane. We lived in a garden of about two acres, partly kitchen garden with walls, partly shrubbery and trees, and partly grass. There were the peaches, as tempting as any that ever grew, and yet as safe from fingers as if no child were ever in the garden. It was not necessary to forbid. The blackbirds, the thrushes, the white throats, and even the very shy bird, the goldfinch, had their nests and bred up their young ones, in great abundance, all about this little spot, constantly the play place of six children, and one of the latter had its nest, and brought up its young ones, in a raspberry bush, within two yards of a walk, and at the time that we were gathering the ripe raspberries. We give dogs, and justly, great credit for sagacity and memory, but the following two most curious instances, which I should not venture to state, if there were not so many witnesses to the facts, in my neighbors at Botley, as well as in my own family, will show, that birds are not, in this respect, inferior to the canine race. All country people know that the skylark is a very shy bird, that its abode is the open fields, that it settles on the ground only, that it seeks safety in the wideness of space,
In order not to keep them in dread longer than necessary, I brought three able mowers, who would cut the hole in about an hour, and as the plot was nearly circular, set them to mow round, beginning at the outside. And now for sagacity indeed. The moment the men began to whip their sides, the two old larks began to flutter over the nest, and to make a great clamor. When the men began to mow, they flew round and round, stooping so low, when near the men, as almost to touch their bodies, making a great chattering at the same time, but before the men had got round with the second swarth, they flew to the nest, and away they went, young ones and all, across the river, at the foot of the ground, and settled in the long grass in my neighbor's orchard. The other instance relates to a house martin. It is well known that these birds build their nests under the eaves of inhabited houses, and sometimes under those of door porches, but we had one that built its nest in the house, and upon the top of a common door case, the door of which opened into a room out of the main passage into the house. Perceiving the martin had begun to build its nest here, we kept the front door open in the daytime, but were obliged to fasten it at night. It went on, had eggs, young ones, and the young ones flew. I used to open the door in the morning early, and then the birds carried on their affairs till night. The next year the martin came again, and had another brood in the same place. It found its old nest, and having repaired it, and put it in order, went on again in the former way, and it would, I dare say, have continued to come to the end of its life, if we had remained there so long, notwithstanding there were six healthy children in the house, making just as much noise as they pleased. Now, what sagacity in these birds, to discover that those were places of safety? And how happy must it have made us, the parents, to be sure that our children had thus deeply imbibed habits the contrary of cruelty? For, be it engraven on your heart, young man, that, whatever appearances may say to the contrary, cruelty is always accompanied with cowardice, and also with perfidy, when that is called for by the circumstances of the case, and that habitual acts of cruelty to other creatures, will, nine times out of ten, produce, when the power is possessed, cruelty to human beings. The ill usage of horses, and particularly at, dollar number at, is a grave and a just charge against this nation. No other nation on earth is guilty of it to the same extent. Not only by blows, but by privation, are we cruel towards these useful, docile, and patient creatures, and especially towards the last, which is the most docile and patient and laborious of the two, while the food that satisfies it, is of the coarsest and least costly kind, and in quantity so small. In the habitual ill treatment of this animal, which, in addition to all its labors, has the milk taken from its young ones to administer a remedy for our ailments, there is something that bespeaks ingratitude hardly to be described. In the register that I wrote from Long Island, I said, that amongst all the things of which I had been bereft, I regretted no one so much as a very diminutive mare, on which my children had all, in succession, learned to ride. She was become useless for them, and, indeed, for any other purpose, but the recollection of her was so entwined with so many past circumstances, which, at that distance, my mind conjured up, that I really was very uneasy, lest she should fall into cruel hands. By good luck, she was, after a while, turned out on the wide world to shift for herself, and when we got back, and had a place for her to stand in, from her native forest we brought her to Kensington, and she is now at Barnum, about twenty-six years old, and I dare say, as fat as a mole. Now, not only have I no moral right, considering my ability to pay for keep, to deprive her of life, but it would be unjust and ungrateful, in me to withhold from her sufficient food and lodging to make life as pleasant as possible while that life lasts. In the meanwhile the book learning crept in of its own accord, by imperceptible degrees. Children naturally want to be like their parents, and to do what they do, the boys following their father, and the girls their mother, and as I was always writing or reading, mine naturally desired to do something in the same way. But, at the same time, they heard no talk from fools or drinkers, saw me with no idle, gabbling, empty companions, saw no vain and affected coxcombs, and no tawdry and extravagant women, saw no nasty gormandizing, and heard no gabble about playhouses and romances and the other nonsense that fit boys to be lobby loungers, and girls to be the ruin of industrious and frugal young men. We wanted no stimulants of this sort to keep up our spirits, our various pleasing pursuits were quite sufficient for that, and the book learning came amongst the rest of the pleasures, to which it was, in some sort, necessary. I remember that, one year, I raised a prodigious crop of fine melons underhand glasses and I learned how to do it from a gardening book, or, at least, that book was necessary to remind me of the details. Having passed part of an evening in talking to the boys about getting this crop, come, said I, now, let us read the book. Then the book came forth, and to work we went, following very strictly the precepts of the book. I read the thing but once, but the eldest boy read it, perhaps, twenty times over, and explained all about the matter to the others. Why here was a motive. Then he had to tell the garden laborer what to do to the melons. Now, I will engage, that more was really learned by the single lesson, than would have been learned by spending, at this son's age, a year at school, and he happy and delighted all the while. When any dispute arose amongst them about hunting or shooting, or any other of their pursuits, they, by degrees, found out the way of settling it by reference to some book, and when any difficulty occurred, as to the meaning, they referred to me, who, if at home, always instantly attended to them, in these matters. They began writing by taking words out of printed books, finding out which letter was which, by asking me, or asking those who knew the letters one from another, and by imitating bits of my writing, it is surprising how soon they began to write a hand like mine, very small, very faint stroked, and nearly plain as print. The first use that any one of them made of the pen, was to write to me, though in the same house with them. They began doing this in mere scratches, before they knew how to make any one letter, and as I was always folding up letters and directing them, so were they, and they were sure to receive a prompt answer, with most encouraging compliments. All the meddlings and teasings of friends, and, what was more serious, the pressing prayers of their anxious mother, about sending them to school, I withstood without the slightest effect on my resolution. As to friends, preferring my own judgment to theirs, I did not care much, but an expression of anxiety, implying a doubt of the soundness of my own judgment, coming, perhaps, twenty times a day from her whose care they were as well as mine, was not a matter to smile at, and very great trouble it did give me. My answer at last was, as to the boys, I want them to be like me, and as to the girls, in whose hands can they be so safe as in yours. Therefore my resolution is taken, go to school they shall not. Nothing is much more annoying than the intermeddling of friends, in a case like this. The wife appeals to them, and good breeding, that is to say, nonsense, is sure to put them on her side. Then, they, particularly the women, when describing the surprising progress made by their own sons at school, used, if one of mine were present, to turn to him, and ask, to what school he went, and what he was learning. I leave anyone to judge of his opinion of her, and whether he would like her the better for that. Bless me, so tall, and not learned anything yet. Oh yes, he has, I used to say, he has learned to ride, and hunt, and shoot, and fish, and look after cattle and sheep, and to work in the garden, and to feed his dogs, and to go from village to village in the dark. This was the way I used to manage with troublesome customers of this sort. And how glad the children used to be, when they got clear of such criticizing people. And how grateful they felt to me for the protection which they saw that I gave them against that state of restraint, of which other people's boys complained. Go whither they might, they found no place so pleasant as home, and no soul that came near them affording them so many means of gratification as they received from me. In this happy state we lived, until the year, when the government laid its merciless fangs upon me, dragged me from these delights, and crammed me into a jail amongst felons, of which I shall have to speak more fully, when, in the last number, I come to speak of the duties of the citizen. This added to the difficulties of my task of teaching, for now I was snatched away from the only scene in which it could, as I thought, properly be executed. But even these difficulties were got over. The blow was, to be sure, a terrible one, and, oh God, how was it felt by these poor children? It was in the month of July when the horrible sentence was passed upon me. My wife, having left her children in the care of her good and affectionate sister, was in London, waiting to know the doom of her husband. When the news arrived at Bali, the three boys, one eleven, another nine, and the other seven, years old, were hoeing cabbages in that garden which had been the source of so much delight. When the account of the savage sentence was brought to them, the youngest could not, for
I am to forgive, am I, injuries like this, and that, too, without any atonement? Oh, no. I have not so read the holy scriptures, I have not, from them, learned that I am not to rejoice at the fall of unjust foes, and it makes a part of my happiness to be able to tell millions of men that I do thus rejoice, and that I have the means of calling on so many just and merciful men to rejoice along with me. Now, then, the book learning was forced upon us. I had a farm in hand. It was necessary that I should be constantly informed of what was doing. I gave all the orders, whether as to purchases, sales, plowing, sewing, breeding, in short, with regard to everything, and the things were endless in number and variety, and always full of interest. My eldest son and daughter could now write well and fast. One or the other of these was always at Bali, and I had with me, having hired the best part of the keeper's house, one or two, besides either his brother or sister, the mother coming up to town about once in two or three months, leaving the house and children in the care of her sister. We had a hamper, with a lot and two keys, which came up once a week, or oftener, bringing me fruit and all sorts of country fare, for the carriage of which, cost free, I was indebted to as good a man as ever God created, the late Mr. George Rogers, of Southampton, who, in the prime of life, died deeply lamented by thousands, but by none more deeply than by me and my family, who have to thank him, and the whole of his excellent family, for benefits and marks of kindness without number. This hamper, which was always, at both ends of the line, looked for with the most lively feelings, became our school. It brought me a journal of labors, proceedings, and occurrences, written on paper of shape and size uniform, and so contrived, as to margins, as to admit of binding. The journal used, when my son was the writer, to be interspersed with drawings of our dogs, colts, or anything that he wanted me to have a correct idea of. The hamper brought me plants, bulbs, and the like, that I might see the size of them, and always everyone sent his or her most beautiful flowers, the earliest violets and primroses and cowslips and bluebells, the earliest twigs of trees, and, in short, everything that they thought calculated to delight me. The moment the hamper arrived, I, casting aside everything else, set to work to answer every question, to give new directions, and to add anything likely to give pleasure at Bali. Every hamper brought one letter, as they called it, if not more, from every child, and to every letter I wrote an answer, sealed up and sent to the party, being sure that that was the way to produce other and better letters, for, though they could not read what I wrote, and though their own consisted at first of mere scratches, and afterwards, for a while, of a few words written down for them to imitate, I always thanked them for their pretty letter, and never expressed any wish to see them. Write better, but took care to write in a very neat and plain hand myself, and to do up my letter in a very neat manner. Thus, while the ferocious tigers thought I was doomed to incessant mortification, and to rage that must extinguish my mental powers, I found in my children, and in their spotless and courageous and most affectionate mother, delights to which the callous hearts of those tigers were strangers. Heaven first taught letters for some wretched aid. How often did this line of Pope occur to me when I opened the little spelling letters from Bali? This correspondence occupied a good part of my time, I had all the children with me, turn and turn about, and, in order to give the boys exercise, and to give the two eldest an opportunity of beginning to learn French, I used, for a part of the two years, to send them a few hours in the day to an abbe, who lived in Castle Street, Holborn. All this was a great relaxation to my mind, and, when I had to return to my literary labors, I returned fresh and cheerful, full of vigor, and full of hope, of finally seeing my unjust and merciless foes at my feet, and that, too, without bearing a straw on whom their fall might bring calamity, so that my own family were safe, because, say what anyone might, the community, taken as a whole, had suffered this thing to be done unto us. The paying of the work people, the keeping of the accounts, the referring to books, the writing and reading of letters, this everlasting mixture of amusement with book learning, made me, almost to my own surprise, find, at the end of the two years, that I had a parcel of scholars growing up about me, and, long before the end of the time, I had dictated many registers to my two eldest children. Then, there was copying out of books, which taught spelling correctly. The calculations about the farming affairs forced arithmetic upon us, the use, the necessity, of the thing, led to the study. By and by, we had to look into the laws to know what to do about the highways, about the game, about the poor, and all rural and parochial affairs. I was, indeed, by the fangs of the government, defeated in my fondly cherished project of making my sons farmers on their own land, and keeping them from all temptation to seek vicious and enervating enjoyments, but those fangs, merciless as they had been, had not been able to prevent me from laying in for their lives a store of useful information, habits of industry, care, sobriety, and a taste for innocent, healthful, and manly pleasures, the fangs had made me in them penniless, but, they, had not been able to take from us our health or our mental possessions, and these were ready for application as circumstances might ordain. After the age that I have now been speaking of, fourteen, I suppose everyone became a reader and writer according to fancy. As to books, with the exception of the poets, I never bought, in my whole life, anyone that I did not want for some purpose of utility, and of practical utility too. I have two or three times had the whole collection snatched away from me, and have begun again to get them together as they were wanted. Go and kick an ant's nest about, and you will see the little laborious, courageous creatures instantly set to work to get it together again, and if you do this ten times over, ten times over they will do the same. Here is the sort of stuff that men must be made of to oppose, with success, those who, by whatever means, get possession of great and mischievous power. Now, I am aware, that that which I did, cannot be done by every one of hundreds of thousands of fathers, each of whom loves his children with all his soul, I am aware that the attorney, the surgeon, the physician, the trader, and even the farmer, cannot, generally speaking, do what I did, and that they must, in most cases, send their sons to school, if it be necessary for them to have book learning. But while I say this, I know, that there are many things, which I did, which many fathers might do, and which, nevertheless, they do not do. It is in the power of every father to live at home with his family, when not compelled by business, or by public duty, to be absent. It is in his power to set an example of industry and sobriety and frugality, and to prevent a taste for gaming, dissipation, extravagance, from getting root in the minds of his children. It is in his power to continue to make his children hearers, when he is reproving servants for idleness, or commending them for industry and care. It is in his power to keep all dissolute and nightly talking companions from his house. It is in his power to teach them, by his uniform example, justice and mercy towards the inferior animals. It is in his power to do many other things, and something in the way of book learning too, however busy his life may be. It is completely within his power to teach them early rising and early going to bed, and, if many a man, who says that he has not time to teach his children, were to sit down, in sincerity, with a pen and a bit of paper, and put down all the minutes, which he, in every twenty-four hours, wastes over the bottle, or over cheese and oranges and raisins and biscuits, after he has dined, how many he lounges away, either at the coffee house or at home, over the useless part of newspapers, how many he spends in waiting for the coming and the managing of the tea table, how many he passes by candlelight, weird of his existence, when he might be in bed, how many he passes in the morning in bed, while the sun and dew shine and sparkle for him in vain, if he were to put all these together, and were to add those which he passes in the reading of books for his mere personal amusement, and without the smallest chance of acquiring from them any useful practical knowledge, if he were to sum up the whole of these and add to them the time worse than wasted in the contemptible work of dressing off his person, he would be frightened at the result, would send for his boys from school, and if greater book learning than he possessed were necessary, he would choose for the purpose some man of ability, and see the teaching carried on under his own roof, with safety as to morals, and with the best chances to health. If after all, however, a school must be resorted to, let it, if in your power, be as little populous as possible. As evil communications corrupt good manners, so the more numerous the assemblage, and the more extensive the communication, the greater the chance of corruption. Jails, barracks, factories, do not corrupt by their walls, but by their condensed numbers. Populous cities corrupt from the same cause, and it is, because it must be, the same with regard to schools, out of which children come not what they were when they went in. The master is, in some sort, their enemy, he is their overlooker, he is a spy on them, his authority is maintained by his absolute power of punishment, the parent commits them to that power, to be taught is to be held in
If he have great numbers, he must delegate his authority, and, like all other delegated authority, it will either be abused or neglected. With regard to girls, one would think that mothers would want no argument to make them shudder at the thought of committing the care of their daughters to other hands than their own. If fortune have so favored them as to make them rationally desirous that their daughters should have more of what are called accomplishments than they themselves have, it has also favored them with the means of having teachers under their own eye. If it have not favored them so highly as this, and it seldom has in the middle rank of life, what duty so sacred is that imposed on a mother to be the teacher of her daughters? And is she, from love of ease or of pleasure or of anything else, to neglect this duty, is she to commit her daughters to the care of persons, with whose manners and morals it is impossible for her to be thoroughly acquainted, is she to send them into the promiscuous society of girls, who belong to nobody knows whom, and come from nobody knows whither, and some of whom, for all she can know to the contrary, may have been corrupted before, and sent thither to be hidden from their former circle, is she to send her daughters to be shut up within walls, the bare sight of which awaken the idea of intrigue and invite to seduction and surrender, is she to leave the health of her daughters to chance, to shut them up with a motley bevy of strangers, some of whom, as is frequently the case, are proclaimed bastards, by the undeniable testimony given by the color of their skin, is she to do all this, and still put forward pretensions to the authority and the affection due to a mother? And, are you to permit all this, and still call yourself a father? Well, then, having resolved to teach your own children, or, to have them taught, at home, let us now see how they ought to proceed as to books for learning. It is evident, speaking of boys, that, at last, they must study the art, or science, that you intend them to pursue, if they be to be surgeons, they must read books on surgery, and the like in other cases. But, there are certain elementary studies, certain books to be used by all persons, who are destined to acquire any book learning at all. Then there are departments, or branches of knowledge, that every man in the middle rank of life, ought, if he can, to acquire, they being, in some sort, necessary to his reputation as a well-informed man, a character to which the farmer and the shopkeeper ought to aspire as well as the lawyer and the surgeon. Let me now, then, offer my advice as to the course of reading, and the manner of reading, for a boy, arrived at his fourteenth year, that being, in my opinion, early enough for him to begin. And, first of all, whether it's to boys or girls, I deprecate romances of every description. It is impossible that they can do any good, and they may do a great deal of harm. They excite passions that ought to lie dormant, they give the mind a taste for highly seasoned matter, they make matters of real life insipid, every girl, addicted to them, sighs to be a Sophie Western, and every boy, a Tom Jones. What girl is not in love with the wild youth, and what boy does not find a justification for his wildness? What can be more pernicious than the teachings of this celebrated romance? Here are two young men put before us, both sons of the same mother, the one a bastard, and by a parson too, the other a legitimate child, the former wild, disobedient, and squandering, the latter steady, sober, obedient, and frugal, the former everything that is frank and generous in his nature, the latter a greedy hypocrite, the former rewarded with the most beautiful and virtuous of women in a double estate, the latter punished by being made an outcast. How is it possible for young people to read such a book, and to look upon orderliness, sobriety, obedience, and frugality, as virtues? And this is the tenor of almost every romance, and of almost every play, in our language. In the school for scandal, for instance, we see two brothers, the one a prudent and frugal man, and, to all appearance, a moral man, the other a hairbrained squanderer, laughing at the morality of his brother, the former turns out to be a base hypocrite and seducer, and is brought to shame and disgrace, while the latter is found to be full of generous sentiment, and heaven itself seems to interfere to give him fortune and fame. In short, the direct tendency of the far greater part of these books, is, to cause young people to despise all those virtues, without the practice of which they must be accursed to their parents, a burden to the community, and must, except by mere accident, lead wretched lives. I do not recollect one romance nor one play, in our language, which has not this tendency. How is it possible for young princes to read the historical plays of the punning and smutty Shakespeare, and not think, that to be drunkards, blackguards, the companions of debauches and robbers, is the suitable beginning of a glorious reign? There is, too, another most abominable principle that runs through them all, namely, that there is in high birth, something of superior nature, instinctive courage, honor, and talent. Who can look at the two royal youths in Cymbeline, or at the noble youth in Douglas, without detesting the base parasites who wrote those plays? Here are youths, brought up by shepherds, never told of their origin, believing themselves the sons of these humble parents, but discovering, when grown up, the highest notions of valor and honor, and thirsting for military renown, even while tending their reputed fathers' flocks and herds. And, why the species of falsehood? To cheat the mass of the people, to keep them in abject subjection, to make them quietly submit to despotic sway. And the infamous authors are guilty of the cheat, because they are, in one shape or another, paid by oppressors out of means squeezed from the people. The true picture would give us just the reverse, would show us that high birth is the enemy of virtue, of valor, and of talent, would show us, that with all their incalculable advantages, royal and noble families have, only by mere accident, produced a great man, that, in general, they have been amongst the most effeminate, unprincipled, cowardly, stupid, and, at the very least, amongst the most useless persons, considered as individuals, and not in connection with the prerogatives and powers, bestowed on them solely by the law. It is impossible for me, by any words that I can use, to express, to the extent of my thoughts, the danger of suffering young people to form their opinions from the writings of poets and romances. Nine times out of ten, the morality they teach is bad, and must have a bad tendency. Their wit is employed to ridicule virtue, as you will almost always find, if you examine the matter to the bottom. The world owes a very large part of its sufferings to tyrants, but what tyrant was there amongst the ancients, whom the poets did not place amongst the gods? Can you open an English poet, without, in some part or other of his works, finding the grossest flatteries of royal and noble persons? How are young people not to think that the praises bestowed on these persons are just? Dryden, Parnell, Gay, Thompson, in short, what poet have we had, or have we, Pope only accepted, who was not, or is not, a pensioner, or a sinecure placeman, or the wretched dependent of some part of the aristocracy? Of the extent of the powers of writers in producing mischief to a nation, we have two most striking instances in the cases of Dr. Johnson and Burke. The former, at a time when it was a question whether war should be made on America to compel her to submit to be taxed by the English Parliament, wrote a pamphlet, entitled, Taxation No Tyranny, to urge the nation into that war. The latter, when it was a question, whether England should wage war against the people of France, to prevent them from reforming their government, wrote a pamphlet to urge the nation into that war. The first war lost us America, the last cost us 600 millions of money, and has loaded us with 40 millions a year of taxes. Johnson, however, got a pension for his life, and Burke a pension for his life, and for three lives after his own. Cumberland and Murphy, the playwriters, were pensioners, and, in short, of the whole mass, where has there been one, whom the people were not compelled to pay for labors, having for their principal object the deceiving and enslaving of that same people? It is, therefore, the duty of every father, when he puts a book into the hands of his son or daughter, to give the reader a true account of who and what the writer of the book was, or is. If a boy be intended for any particular calling, he ought, of course, to be induced to read books relating to that calling, if such books there be, and, therefore, I shall not be more particular on that head. But, there are certain things, that all men in the middle rank of life, ought to know something of, because the knowledge will be a source of pleasure, and because the want of it must, very frequently, give them pain, by making them appear inferior, in point of mind, to many who are, in fact, their inferiors in that respect. These things are grammar, arithmetic, history, accompanied with geography without these, a man, in the middle rank of life, however able he may be in his calling, makes but an awkward figure. Without grammar he cannot, with safety to his character as a well-informed man, put his thoughts upon paper, nor can he be sure, that he is speaking with propriety. How many clever men have I known, full of natural talent, eloquent by nature, replete with everything calculated to give them weight in society, and yet having little or no weight, merely because unable to put correctly upon paper that which they have
All the books on this subject that I had ever seen, were so bad, so destitute of everything calculated to lead the mind into a knowledge of the matter, so void of principles, and so evidently tending to puzzle and disgust the learner, by their sententious and crabbed and quaint, and almost hieroglyphical definitions, that I, at one time, had the intention of writing a little work on the subject myself. It was put off, from one cause or another, but a little work on the subject has been, partly at my suggestion, written and published by Mr. Thomas Smith of Liverpool, and is sold by Mr. Sherwood, in London. The author has great ability, and a perfect knowledge of his subject. It is a book of principles, and any young person of common capacity, will learn more from it in a week, than from all the other books, that I ever saw on the subject, in a twelve month. While the foregoing studies are proceeding, though they very well afford a relief to each other, history may serve as a relaxation, particularly during the study of grammar, which is an undertaking requiring patience and time. Of all history, that of our own country is of the most importance, because, for want of a thorough knowledge of what has been, we are, in many cases, at a loss to account for what is, and still more at a loss, to be able to show what ought to be. The difference between history and romance is this, that that which is narrated in the latter, leaves in the mind nothing which it can apply to present or future circumstances and events, while the former, when it is what it ought to be, leaves the mind stored with arguments for experience, applicable, at all times, to the actual affairs of life. The history of a country ought to show the origin and progress of its institutions, political, civil, and ecclesiastical, it ought to show the effects of those institutions upon the state of the people, it ought to delineate the measures of the government at the several epochs, and, having clearly described the state of the people at the several periods, it ought to show the cause of their freedom, good morals, and happiness, or of their misery, immorality, and slavery, and this, too, by the production of indubitable facts, and of inference is so manifestly fair, as to leave not the smallest doubt upon the mind. Do the histories of England which we have, answer this description. They are very little better than romances. Their contents are generally confined to narrations relating to battles, negotiations, intrigues, contests between rival sovereignties, rival nobles, and to the character of kings, queens, mistresses, bishops, ministers, and the like, from scarcely any of which can the reader draw any knowledge which is at all applicable to the circumstances of the present day. Besides this, there is the falsehood, and the falsehoods contained in these histories, where shall we find anything to surpass? Let us take one instance. They all tell us, that William the Conqueror knocked down twenty-six parish churches, and laid waste the parishes in order to make the new forest, and this in a tract of the very poorest land in England, where the churches must then have stood at about one mile and two hundred yards from each other. The truth is, that all the churches are still standing that were there when William landed, and the whole story is a sheer falsehood from the beginning to the end. But, this is a mere specimen of these romances, and that too, with regard to a matter comparatively unimportant to us. The important falsehoods are, those which misguide us by statement or by inference, with regard to the state of the people at the several epochs, as produced by the institutions of the country, or the measures of the government. It is always the object of those who have power in their hands, to persuade the people that they are better off than their forefathers were. It is the great business of history to show how this matter stands, and, with respect to this great matter, what are we to learn from anything that has hitherto been called the history of England? I remember, that, about a dozen years ago, I was talking with a very clever young man, who had read twice or thrice over the history of England, by different authors, and that I gave the conversation a turn that drew from him, unperceived by himself, that he did not know how tithes, parishes, poor rates, church rates, and the abolition of trial by jury in hundreds of cases, came to be in England, and, that he had not the smallest idea of the manner in which the Duke of Bifford came to possess. The power of taxing our cabbages in Covent Garden. Yet, this is history. I have done a great deal, with regard to matters of this sort, in my famous history of the Protestant Reformation, for I may truly call that famous, which has been translated and published in all the modern languages. But, it is reserved for me to write a complete history of the country from the earliest times to the present day, and this, God giving me life and health, I shall begin to do in monthly numbers, beginning on the 1st of September, and in which I shall endeavor to combine brevity with clearness. We do not want to consume our time over a dozen pages about Edward the Third dancing at a ball, picking up a lady's garter, and making the garter the foundation of an order of knighthood, bearing the motto of honey so I key mal weapons. It is not stuff like this, but we want to know what was the state of the people, what were a laborers' wages, what were the prices of the food, and how the laborers were dressed in the reign of that great king. What is a young person to imbibe from the history of England, as it is called, like that of Goldsmith? It is a little romance to amuse children, and the other historians have given us larger romances to amuse lazy persons who are grown up. To destroy the effects of these, and to make the people know what their country has been, will be my object, and this, I trust, I shall effect. We are, it is said, to have a history of England from Sir James Mackintosh, a history of Scotland from Sir Walter Scott, and a history of Ireland from Tommy Moore, the luscious poet. A Scotch lawyer, who is a pensioner, and a member for Nearsborough, which is well known to the Duke of Devonshire, who has the great tithes of twenty parishes in Ireland, will, doubtless, write a most impartial history of England, and particularly as far as relates to birds and ties. A Scotch romance writer, who, under the name of Mill Grother, wrote a pamphlet to prove that one pound notes were the cause of riches to Scotland, will write, to be sure, a most instructive history of Scotland. And, from the pen of an Irish poet, who is a sinecure placeman, and a protege of an English peer that has immense parcels of Irish confiscated estates, what a beautiful history shall we not then have of unfortunate Ireland? Oh, no. We are not going to be content with stuff such as these men will bring out. Human Smollett and Robertson have cheated us long enough. We are not in a humor to be cheated any longer. Geography is taught at schools, if we believe the school cards. The scholars can tell you all about the divisions of the earth, and this is very well for persons who have leisure to indulge their curiosity, but it does seem to me monstrous that a young person's time should be spent in ascertaining the boundaries of Persia or China, knowing nothing all the while about the boundaries, the rivers, the soil, or the products, or of the anything else of Yorkshire or Devonshire. The first thing in geography is to know that of the country in which we live, especially that in which we were born, I have now seen almost every hill and valley in it with my own eyes, nearly every city and every town, and no small part of the whole of the villages. I am therefore qualified to give an account of the country, and that account, under the title of Geographical Dictionary of England and Wales, I am now having printed as a companion to my history. When a young man well understands the geography of his own country, when he has referred to maps on this smaller scale, when, in short, he knows all about his own country, and is able to apply his knowledge to useful purposes, he may look at other countries, and particularly at those, the powers or measures of which are likely to affect his own country. It is of great importance to us to be well acquainted with the extent of France, the United States, Portugal, Spain, Mexico, Turkey, and Russia, but what need we care about the tribes of Asia and Africa, the condition of which can affect us no more than we would be affected by anything that is passing in the moon? When people have nothing useful to do, they may indulge their curiosity, but, merely to read books, is not to be industrious, is not to study, and is not the way to become learned. Perhaps there are none more lazy, or more truly ignorant, than your everlasting readers. A book is an admirable excuse for sitting still, and, a man who has constantly a newspaper, a magazine, a review, or some book or other in his hand, gets, at last, his head stuffed with such a jumble, that he knows not what to think about anything. An empty coxcomb, that wastes his time in dressing, strutting, or strolling about, and picking his teeth, is certainly a most despicable creature, but scarcely less so than a mere reader of books, who is, generally, conceited, thinks himself wiser than other men, in proportion to the number of leaves that he has turned over. In short, a young man should bestow his time upon no book, the contents of which he cannot apply to some useful purpose. Books of travels, of biography, natural history, and particularly such as relate to agriculture and horticulture, are all proper, when leisure is afforded for them, and the two last are useful to a very great part of mankind, but, unless the subjects treated of are of some interest to us in our affairs, no time should be wasted upon them, when there are so many duties demanded at our hands by our families in our country. A man may read books forever, and be an ignorant creature at last,
Not to put the word esquire before the name of almost any man who is not a mere laborer or artisan, is almost in the front. Every merchant, every master manufacturer, every dealer, if at all rich, is an esquire. Squires' sons must be gentlemen, and squires' wives and daughters' ladies. If this were all, if it were merely a ridiculous misapplication of words, the evil would not be great, but, unhappily, words lead to acts and produce things, and a young gentleman is not easily to be molded into a tradesman or a working farmer. And yet the world is too small to hold so many gentlemen and ladies. How many thousands of young men have, at this moment, cause to lament that they are not carpenters, or masons, or tailors, or shoemakers, and how many thousands of those, that they have been bred up to wish to disguise their honest and useful, and therefore honorable, calling? Rousseau observes, that men are happy, first, in proportion to their virtue, and next, in proportion to their independence, and that, of all mankind, the artisan, or craftsman, is the most independent, because he carries about, in his own hands and person, the means of gaining his livelihood, and that the more common the use of the articles on which he works, the more perfect his independence. Where, says he, there is one man that stands in need of the talents of the dentist, there are a hundred thousand that want those of the people who supply the matter for the teeth to work on, and for one who wants a sonnet to regale his fancy, there are a million clamoring for men to make or mend their shoes. I, and this is the reason, why shoemakers are proverbially the most independent part of the people, and why they, in general, show more public spirit than any other men. He who lives by pursuit, be it what it may, which does not require a considerable degree of bodily labor, must, from the nature of things, be, more or less, a dependent, and this is, indeed, the price which he pays for his exemption from that bodily labor. He may arrive at riches, or fame, or both, and this chance he sets against the certainty of independence and humbler life. There always have been, there always will be, and there always ought to be, some men to take this chance, but to do this has become the fashion, and a fashion it is the most fatal that ever seized upon a community. With regard to young women, to, to sing, to play on instruments of music, to draw, to speak French, and the like, are very agreeable qualifications, but why should they all be musicians and painters and linguists? Why all of them? Who, then, is there left to take care of the houses of farmers and traders? But there is something in these accomplishments worse than this, namely, that they think themselves too high for farmers and traders, and this, in fact, they are, much too high, and, therefore, the servant girls step in and supply their place. If they could see their own interest, surely they would drop this lofty tone, and these lofty airs. It is, however, the fault of the parents, and particularly of the father, whose duty it is to prevent them from imbibing such notions, and to show them, that the greatest honor they ought to aspire to is, thorough skill and care in the economy of a house. We are all apt to set too high value on what we ourselves have done, and I may do this, but I do firmly believe, that to cure any young woman of this fatal sublimation, she has only patiently to rid my cottage economy, ridden with an anxious desire to promote domestic skill and ability in that sex, on whom so much of the happiness of man must always depend. A lady in Worcestershire told me, that until she read cottage economy she had never baked in the house, and had seldom had good beer, that, ever since, she had looked after both herself, that the pleasure she had derived from it, was equal to the profit, and that the latter was very great. She said, that the article on baking bread, was the part that roused her to the undertaking, and, indeed, if the facts and arguments, they made use of, failed to stir her up to action, she must have been stone dead to the power of words. After the age that we have now been supposing, boys and girls become men and women, and, there now only remains for the father to act towards them with impartiality. If they be numerous, or, indeed, if they be only two in number, to expect perfect harmony to reign amongst, or between, them, is to be unreasonable, because experience shows us, that, even amongst the most sober, most virtuous, and most sensible, harmony so complete is very rare. By nature they are rivals for the affection and applause of the parents, in personal and mental endowments they become rivals, and, when pecuniary interests come to be well understood and to have their weight, here is a rivalship, to prevent which from ending in hostility, require more affection and greater disinterestedness than fall to the lot of one out of one hundred families. So many instances have I witnessed of good and amiable families living in harmony, till the hour arrived for dividing property amongst them, and then, all at once, becoming hostile to each other, that I have often thought that property, coming in such a way, was a curse, and that the parties would have been far better off, had the parent had merely a blessing to bequeath them from his or her lips, instead of a will for them to dispute and wrangle over. With regard to this matter, all that the father can do, is to be impartial, but, impartiality does not mean positive equality in the distribution, but equality in proportion to the different deserts of the parties, their different wants, their different pecuniary circumstances, and different prospects in life, and these very so much, in different families, that it is impossible to lay down any general rule upon the subject. But there is one fatal error, against which every father ought to guard his heart, and the kinder that heart is, the more necessary such guardianship. I mean the fatal error of heaping upon one child, to the prejudice of the rest, or, upon a part of them. This partiality sometimes arises from mere caprice, sometimes from the circumstance of the favorite being more favored by nature than the rest, sometimes from the nearer resemblance to himself, that the father sees in the favorite, and, sometimes, from the hope of preventing the favored party from doing that which would disgrace the parent. All these motives are highly censurable, but the last is the most general, and by far the most mischievous in its effects. How many fathers have been ruined, how many mothers and families brought to beggary, how many industrious and virtuous groups have been pulled down from confidence to penury, from the desire to prevent one from bringing shame on the parent? So that, contrary to every principle of justice, the bad is rewarded for the badness, and the good punished for the goodness. Natural affection, remembrance of infantine endearments, reluctance to abandon long cherished hopes, compassion for the sufferings of your own flesh and blood, the dread of fatal consequences from your adhering to justice, all these beat at your heart, and call on you to give way, but, you must resist them all, or, your ruin, and that of the rest of your family, are decreed. Suffering is the natural and just punishment of idleness, drunkenness, squandering, and an indulgence in the society of prostitutes, and, never did the world behold an instance of an offender, in this way, reclaimed but by the infliction of this punishment, particularly, if the society of prostitutes made part of the offense, for, here is something that takes the heart from you. Nobody ever yet saw, and nobody ever will see, a young man, linked to a prostitute, and retain, at the same time, any, even the smallest degree of affection, for parents or brethren. You may supplicate, you may implore, you may leave yourself penniless, and your virtuous children without bread, the invisible cormorant will still call for more, and, as we saw, only the other day, a wretch was convicted of having, at the instigation of his prostitute, beaten his aged mother, to get from her the small remains of the means necessary to provide her with food. In Aaron's collection of God's judgments on wicked acts, it is related of an unnatural son, who fed his aged father upon what's and awful, lodged him in a filthy and crazy garret, and clothed him in sackcloth, while he and his wife and children lived in luxury, that, having bought sackcloth enough for two dresses for his father, the children took away the part not made up, and hid it, and that, upon asking them what they could do this for, they told him that they meant to keep it for him, when he should become old and walk with a stick. This, the author relates, pierced his heart, and, indeed, if this failed, he must have had the heart of a tiger, but, even this would not succeed with the associate of a prostitute. When this vice, this love of the society of prostitutes, when this vice has once got fast hold, vain are all your sacrifices, vain your prayers, vain your hopes, vain your anxious desire to disguise the shame from the world, and, if you have acted well your part, no part of that shame falls on you, unless you have administered to the cause of it. Your authority has ceased, the voice of the prostitute, or the charms of the bottle, or the rattle of the dice, has been more powerful than your advice and example, you must lament this, but, it is not to bow you down, and, above all things, it is weak, and even criminally selfish, to sacrifice the rest of your family, in order to keep from the world the knowledge of that, which, if known, would, in your view of the matter, bring shame on yourself. Let me hope, however, that this is a calamity which will befall very few good fathers, and that, of all such, the sober, industrious, and frugal habits of their children, their dutiful demeanor, their truth,
Go, you, and shake the hand of the boon companion, take the greedy harlot to your arms, mock at the tears of your tender and anxious parents, and, when your purse is empty and your complexion faded, receive the poverty and the scorn due to your base ingratitude. Letter 6. To the citizen. Having now given my advice to the youth, the grown-up man, the lover, the husband, and the father, I shall, in this concluding number, tender my advice to the citizen, in which capacity every man has rights to enjoy and duties to perform, and these two of importance not inferior to those which belong to him, or are imposed upon him, as son, parent, husband, or father. The word citizen is not, in its application, confined to the mere inhabitants of cities. It means, a member of a civil society, or community, and, in order to have a clear comprehension of man's rights and duties in this capacity, we must take a look at the origin of civil communities. Time was when the inhabitants of this island, for instance, laid claim to all things in it, without the words owner or property being known. God had given to all the people all the land and all the trees, and everything else, just as he has given the burrows and the grass to the rabbits, and the bushes and the berries to the birds, and each man had the good things of this world in a greater or less degree in proportion to his skill, his strength, and his valor. This is what is called living under the law of nature, that is to say, the law of self-preservation and self-enjoyment, without any restraint imposed by regard for the good of our neighbors. In process of time, no matter from what cause, men made amongst themselves a compact, or an agreement, to divide the land and its products in such manner that each should have a share to his own exclusive use, and that each man should be protected in the exclusive enjoyment of his share by the united power of the rest, and, in order to ensure the due and certain application of this united power, the whole of the people agreed to be bound by regulations, called laws. Thus arose civil society, thus arose property, thus arose the words mine and mine. One man became possessed of more good things than another, because he was more industrious, more skillful, more careful, or more frugal, so that labor, of one sort or another, was the basis of all property. In what manner civil societies proceeded in providing for the making of laws and for the enforcing of them, the various ways in which they took measures to protect the weak against the strong, how they have gone to work to secure wealth against the attacks of poverty, these are subjects that it would require volumes to detail, but these truths are written on the heart of man, that all men are, by nature, equal, that civil society can never have arisen from any motive other than that of the benefit of the whole, that, whenever civil society makes the greater part of the people worse off than they were under the law of nature, the civil compact is, in conscience, dissolved, and all the rights of nature return, that, in civil society, the rights and the duties go hand in hand, and that, when the former are taken away, the latter cease to exist. Now, then, in order to act well our part as citizens or members of the community, we ought clearly to understand what our rights are, for, on our enjoyment of these depend our duties, rights going before duties, as value received goes before payment. I know well, that just the contrary of this is taught in our political schools, where we are told, that our first duty is to obey the laws, and it is not many years ago, that Horsley, Bishop of Rochester, told us, that the people had nothing to do with the laws but to obey them. The truth is, however, that the citizen's first duty is to maintain his rights, as it is the purchaser's first duty to receive the thing for which he has contracted. Our rights in society are numerous, the right of enjoying life and property, the right of exerting our physical and mental powers in an innocent manner, but, the great right of all, and without which there is, in fact, no right, is, the right of taking a part in the making of the laws by which we are governed. This right is founded in that law of nature spoken of above, it springs out of the very principle of civil society, for what compact, what agreement, what common assent, can possibly be imagined by which men would give up all the rights of nature, all the free enjoyment of their bodies and their minds, in order to subject themselves to rules and laws, in the making of which they should have nothing to say, and which should be enforced upon them without their assent. The great right, therefore, of every man, the right of rights, is the right of having a share in the making of the laws, to which the good of the whole makes it his duty to submit. With regard to the means of enabling every man to enjoy the share, they have been different, in different countries, and, in the same countries, at different times. Generally it has been, and in great communities it must be, by the choosing of a few to speak and act in behalf of the many, and, as there will hardly ever be perfect unanimity amongst men assembled for any purpose whatever, where fact and argument are to decide the question, the decision is left to the majority, the compact being that the decision of the majority shall be that of the whole. Minors are excluded from this right, because the law considers them as infants, because it makes the parent answerable for civil damages committed by them, and because of their legal incapacity to make any compact. Women are excluded because husbands are answerable in law for their wives, as to their civil damages, and because the very nature of their sex makes the exercise of this right incompatible with the harmony and happiness of society. Men stained with indelible crimes are excluded, because they have forfeited their right by violating the laws, to which their assent has been given. Insane persons are excluded, because they are dead in the eye of the law, because the law demands no duty at their hands, because they cannot violate the law, because the law cannot affect them, and, therefore, they ought to have no hand in making it. But, with these exceptions, where is the ground whereon to maintain that any man ought to be deprived of this right, which he derives directly from the law of nature, and which springs, as I said before, out of the same source with civil society itself? Am I told, that property ought to confer this right? Property sprang from labor, and not labor from property, so that if there were to be a distinction here, it ought to give the preference to labor. All men are equal by nature, nobody denies that they all ought to be equal in the eye of the law, but, how are they to be thus equal, if the law begin by suffering some to enjoy this right and refusing the enjoyment to others? It is the duty of every man to defend his country against an enemy, a duty imposed by the law of nature as well as by that of civil society, and without the recognition of this duty, there could exist no independent nation and no civil society. Yet, how are you to maintain that this is the duty of every man, if you deny to some men the enjoyment of a share in making the laws? Upon what principle are you to contend for equality here, while you deny its existence as to the right of sharing in the making of the laws? The poor man has a body and a soul as well as the rich man, like the latter, he has parents, wife, and children, a bullet or a sword is as deadly to him as to the rich man, there are hearts to take and tears to flow for him as well as for the squire or the lord or the lonemonger, yet, notwithstanding this equality, he is to risk all, and, if he escape, he is still to be denied an equality of rights. If, in such a state of things, the artisan or laborer, when called out to fight in defense of his country, were to answer, why should I risk my life? I have no possession but my labor, no enemy will take that from me, you, the rich, possess all the land and all its products, you make what laws you please without my participation or assent, you punish me at your pleasure, you say that my want of property excludes me from the right of having a share in the making of the laws, you say that the property that I have in my labor is nothing worth, on what ground, then, do you call on me to risk my life? If, in such a case, such questions were put, the answer is very difficult to be imagined. In cases of civil commotion the matter comes still more home to us. On what ground is the rich man to call the artisan from his shop or the laborer from the field to join the sheriff's posse or the militia, if he refused to deliver an artisan the right of sharing in the making of the laws? Why are they to risk their lives here? To uphold the laws, and to protect property. What? Laws, in the making of, or assenting to, which they have been allowed to have no share. Property, of which they are said to possess none. What? Compel men to come forth and risk their lives for the protection of property, and then, in the same breath, tell them, that they are not allowed to share in the making of the laws, because, and only because, they have no property. Not because they have committed any crime, not because they are idle or profligate, not because they are vicious in any way, out solely because they have no property, and yet, at the same time, compel them to come forth and risk their lives for the protection of property. But, the paupers? Ought they to share in the making of the laws? And why not? What is a pauper? What is one of the men to whom this degrading appellation is applied? A very poor man, a man who is, from some cause or other, unable to supply himself with food and raiment without aid from the parish rates. And, is that circumstance alone to deprive him of his right, a right of which he stands more in need than any other man? Perhaps he has, for many years of his life, contributed directly to those rates, and ten thousand to one he has, by his labor, contributed to them indirectly. The aid which, under such circumstances, he receives, is his right, he
First of the working people, but, if the parliament had done it, it would have been quickly seen, that this law was far from dooming them to be starved. Trusting that it is unnecessary for me to express a hope, that barbarous thoughts like those of Malthus and his tribe will never be entertained by any young man who has read the previous numbers of this work, let me return to my very, very poor man, and ask, whether it be consistent with justice, with humanity, with reason, to deprive a man of the most precious of his political rights, because, and only because, he has been, in a pecuniary way, singularly unfortunate. The scripture says, despise not the poor, because he is poor, that is to say, despise him not on account of his poverty. Why, then, deprive him of his right, why put him out of the pale of the law, on account of his poverty? There are some men, to be sure, who are reduced to poverty by their vices, by idleness, by gaming, by drinking, by squandering, but, the far greater part by bodily ailments, by misfortunes to the effects of which all men may, without any fault, and even without any folly, be exposed, and, is there a man on earth so cruelly unjust as to wish to add to the sufferings of such persons by stripping them of their political rights? How many thousands of industrious and virtuous men have, within these few years, been brought down from a state of competence to that of pauperism? And, is it just to strip such men of their rights, merely because they are thus brought down? When I was at Ely, last spring, there were in that neighborhood, three paupers cracking stones on the roads, who had all three been, not only repairs, but overseers of the poor, within seven years of the day when I was there. Is there any man so barbarous as to say, that these men ought, merely on account of their misfortunes, to be deprived of their political rights? Their right to receive relief is as perfect as any right of property, and, would you, merely because they claim this right, strip them of another right? To say no more of the injustice and the cruelty, is there reason, is there common sense in this? What? If a farmer or tradesman be, by flood or by fire, so totally ruined as to be compelled, surrounded by his family, to resort to the parish book, would you break the last heartstring of such a man by making him feel the degrading loss of his political rights? Here, young man of sense and of spirit, here is the point on which you are to take your stand. There are always men enough to plead the cause of the rich, enough and enough to echo the woes of the fallen great, but, be it your part to show compassion for those who labor, and to maintain their rights. Poverty is not a crime, and, though it sometimes arises from faults, it is not, even in that case, to be visited by punishment beyond that which it brings with itself. Remember, that poverty is decreed by the very nature of man. The scripture says, that the poor shall never cease from out of the land, that is to say, that there shall always be some very poor people. This is inevitable from the very nature of things. It is necessary to the existence of mankind, that a very large portion of every people should live by manual labor, and, as such labor is pain, more or less, and as no living creature likes pain, it must be, that the far greater part of laboring people will endure only just as much of this pain as is absolutely necessary to the supply of their daily wants. Experience says that this has always been, and reason and nature tell us, that this must always be. Therefore, when ailments, when losses, when untoward circumstances of any sort, stop or diminish the daily supply, one comes, and every just government will provide, from the general stock, the means to satisfy this want. Nor is the deepest poverty without its useful effects in society. To the practice of the virtues of abstinence, sobriety, care, frugality, industry, and even honesty in amiable manners and acquirement of talent, the two great motives are, to get upwards in riches or fame, and to avoid going downwards to poverty, the last of which is the most powerful of the two. It is, therefore, not with contempt, but with compassion, that we should look on those, whose state is one of the decrees of nature, from whose sad example we profit, and to whom, in return, we ought to make compensation by every indulgent and kind act in our power, and particularly by defense of their rights. To those who labor, we, who labor not with our hands, owe all that we eat, drink and wear, all that shades us by day and that shelters us by night, all the means of enjoying health and pleasure, and, therefore, if we possess talent for the task, we are ungrateful or cowardly, or both, if we omit any effort within our power to prevent them from being slaves, and, disguise the matter how we may, a slave, a real slave, every man is, who has no share in making the laws which he is compelled to, obey. What is a slave? For, let us not be amused by name, but look well into the matter. A slave is, in the first place, a man who has no property, and property means something that he has, and that nobody can take from him without his leave, or consent. Whatever man, no matter what he may call himself or anybody else may call him, can have his money or his goods taken from him by force, by virtue of an order, or ordinance, or law, which he has had no hand in making, and to which he has not given his assent, has no property, and is merely a depository of the goods of his master. A slave has no property in his labor, and any man who is compelled to give up the fruit of his labor to another, at the arbitrary will of that other, has no property in his labor, and is, therefore, a slave, whether the fruit of his labor be taken from him directly or indirectly. If it be said, that he gives up this fruit of his labor by his own will, and that it is not forced from him. I answer, to be sure he may avoid eating and drinking and may go naked, but, then he must die, and on this condition, and this condition only, can he refuse to give up the fruit of his labor, die, wretch, or surrender as much of your income, or the fruit of your labor as your masters choose to take. This is, in fact, the language of the rulers to every man who has refused to have a share in the making of the laws to which he is forced to submit. But, someone may say, slaves are private property, and may be bought and sold, out and out, like cattle. And, what is it to the slave, whether he be property of one or of many, or, what matters it to him, whether he pass from master to master by sale for an indefinite term, or be led to hire by the year, month, or week. It is, in no case, the flesh and blood and bones that are sold, but the labor, and, if you actually sell the labor of man, is not that man a slave, though you sell it for only a short time at once. And, as to the principle, so ostentatiously displayed in the case of the black slave trade, that man ought not to have a property in man, it is even an advantage to the slave to be private property, because the owner has then a clear and powerful interest in the preservation of his life, health, and strength, and will, therefore, furnish him amply with the food and raiment necessary for these ends. Everyone knows, that public property is never so well taken care of as private property, and this, too, on the maxim, that that which is everybody's business is nobody's business. Everyone knows that a rented farm is not so well kept in heart, as a farm in the hands of the owner. And as to punishments and restraints, what difference is there, whether these be inflicted and imposed by a private owner, or his overseer, or by the agents and overseers of a body of proprietors? In short, if you can cause a man to be imprisoned or whipped if you do not work enough to please you, if you can sell him by auction for a time limited, if you can forcibly separate him from his wife to prevent their having children, if you can shut him up in his dwelling place when you please, and for as long a time as you please, if you can force him to draw a cart or wagon like a beast of draft, if you can, when the humor seizes you, and at the suggestion of your mere fears, or whim, cause him to be shut up in a dungeon during your pleasure, if you can, at your pleasure, do these things to him, is it not to be impudently hypocritical to affect to call him a free man? But, after all, these may all be wanting, and yet the man be a slave, if he be allowed to have no property, and, as I have shown, no property he can have, not even in that labor, which is not only property, but the basis of all other property, unless he have a share in making the loss to which he is compelled to submit. It is said, that he may have this share virtually though not in form and name, for that his employers may have such share, and they will, as a matter of course, act for him. This doctrine, pushed home, would make the chief of the nation the sole maker of the laws, for, if the rich can thus act for the poor, why should not the chief act for the rich? This matter is very completely explained by the practice in the United States of America. There the maxim is, that every free man, with the exception of men stained with crime and men insane, has a right to have a voice in choosing those who make the laws. The number of representatives sent to the Congress is, in each state, proportion to the number of free people. But, as there are slaves in some of the states, these states have a certain portion of additional numbers on account of those slaves. Thus the slaves are represented by their owners, and this is real, practical, open, and undisguised virtual representation. No doubt that white men may be represented in the same way, for the color of the skin is nothing, but let them be called slaves, then, let it not be pretended that they
And yet, what would this be more than taxes imposed on those who have no voice in choosing the person to impose them? Who lets another man put his hand into his purse when he pleases? Who, that has the power to help himself, surrenders his goods or his money to the will of another? Has it not always been, and must it not always be, true, that, if your property be at the absolute disposal of others, your ruin is certain? And if this be, of necessity, the case amongst individuals and parts of the community, it must be the case with regard to the whole community. I, an experience shows us that it always has been the case. The natural and inevitable consequences of the want of this right in the people have, in all countries, been taxes pressing the industrious and laborious to the earth, severe loss and standing armies to compel the people to submit to those taxes, wealth, luxury, and splendor, amongst those who make the loss and receive the taxes, poverty, misery, immorality, and crime, amongst those who bear the burdens, and at last commotion, revolt, revenge, and rivers of blood. Such have always been, and such must always be, the consequences of the want of this right of all men to share in the making of the loss, a right, as I have before shown, derived immediately from the law of nature, springing up out of the same source with civil society, and cherished in the heart of man by reason and by experience. Well, then, this right being that, without the enjoyment of which there is, in reality, no right at all, how manifestly is it the first duty of every man to do all in his power to maintain this right where it exists, and to restore it where it has been lost? For observe, it must, at one time, have existed in every civil community, it being impossible that it could ever be excluded by any social compact, absolutely impossible, because it is contrary to the law of self-preservation to believe, that men would agree to give up the rights of nature without stipulating for some benefit. Before we can affect to believe that this right was not reserved, in such compact, as completely as the right to live was reserved, we must affect to believe, that millions of men, under no control but that of their own passions and desires, and having all the earth and its products at the command of their strength and skill, consented to be forever, they and their posterity, the slaves of a few. We cannot believe this, and therefore, without going back into history and precedence, we must believe, that, in whatever civil community this right does not exist, it has been lost, or rather, unjustly taken away. And then, having seen the terrible evils which always have arisen, and always must arise, from the want of it, being convinced that, were lost or taken away by force or fraud, it is our very first duty to do all in our power to restore it, the next consideration is, how one ought to act in the discharge of this most sacred duty, for sacred it is even as the duties of husband and father. For, besides the baseness of the thought of quietly submitting to be a slave oneself, we have here, besides our duty to the community, a duty to perform towards our children and our children's children. We all acknowledge that it is our bounden duty to provide, as far as our power will go, for the competence, the health, and the good character of our children, but, is this duty superior to that of which I am now speaking? What is competence, what is health, if the possessor be a slave, and hold his possessions at the will of another, or others, as he must do if destitute of the right to a share in the making of the loss? What is competence, what is health, if both can, at any moment, be snatched away by the grasp or the dungeon of a master, and his master he is who makes the loss without his participation or assent? And, as to character, as to fair fame, when the white slave puts forward pretensions to those, let him no longer affect to commiserate the state of his sleek and fat brethren in Barbados and Jamaica, let him hasten to mix the hair with the wool, to blend the white with the black, and to lose the memory of his origin amidst a dingy generation. Such, then, being the nature of the duty, how are we to go to work in the performance of it, and what are our means? With regard to these, so various are the circumstances, so endless the differences in the states of society, and so many are the cases when it would be madness to attempt that which it would be prudence to attempt in others, that no general rule can be given beyond this, that, the right and the duty being clear to our minds, the means that are surest and swiftest are the best. In every such case, however, the great and predominant desire ought to be not to employ any means beyond those of reason and persuasion, as long as the employment of these afforded ground for rational expectation of success. Men are, in such a case, laboring, not for the present day only, but for ages to come, and therefore they should not slacken in their exertions, because the grave may close upon them before the day of final triumph arrive. Amongst the virtues of the good citizen are those of fortitude and patience, and, when he has to carry on his struggle against corruptions deep and widely rooted, he is not to expect the baleful tree to come down at a single blow, he must patiently remove the earth that crops and feeds it, and sever the accursed roots one by one. Impatience here is a very bad sign. I do not like your patriots, who, because the tree does not give way at once, fall to blaming all about them, accuse their fellow sufferers of cowardice, because they do not do that which they themselves dare not think of doing. Such conduct argues chagrin and disappointment, and these argue a selfish feeling, they argue, that there has been more of private ambition and gain at work than of public good. Such blamers, such general accusers, are always to be suspected. What does the real patriot want more than to feel conscious that he has done his duty towards his country, and that, if life should not allow him time to see his endeavors crowned with success, his children will see it. The impatient patriots are like the young men, mentioned in the beautiful fable of Ellie Fontaine, who ridiculed the man of fourscore, who was planting an avenue of very small trees, which, they told him, that he never could expect to see as high as his head. Well, said he, and what of that? If their shade afford me no pleasure, it may afford pleasure to my children, and even to you, and, therefore, the planting of them gives me pleasure. It is the want of the noble disinterestedness, so beautifully expressed in this fable, that produces the impatient patriots. They wish very well to their country, because they want some of the good for themselves. Very natural that all men should wish to see the good arrive, and wish to share in it too, but, we must look on the dark side of nature to find the disposition to cast blame on the whole community because our wishes are not instantly accomplished, and especially to cast blame on others for not doing that which we ourselves dare not attempt. There is, however, a sort of patriot a great deal worse than this, he, who having failed himself, would see his country enslaved forever, rather than see its deliverance achieved by others. His failure has, perhaps, arisen solely from his want of talent, or discretion, yet his selfish heart would wish his country sunk in everlasting degradation, lest his inefficiency for the task should be established by the success of others. A very hateful character, certainly, but, I am sorry to say, by no means rare. Envy, always associated with meanness of soul, always detestable, is never so detestable as when it shows itself here. Be it your care, my young friend, and I tender you this as my parting advice, if you find this base and baleful passion, which the poet calls the eldest born of hell, if you find it creeping into your heart, be it your care to banish it at once and forever, for, if once it nestle there, farewell to all the good which nature has enabled you to do, and to your peace into the bargain. It has pleased God to make an unequal distribution of talent, of industry, of perseverance, of a capacity to labor, of all the qualities that give men distinction. We have not been our own makers, it is no fault in you that nature has placed him above you, and, surely, it is no fault in him, and would you punish him on account, and only on account, of his preeminence. If you have read this book you will startle with horror at the thought, you will, as to public matters, act with zeal and with good humor, though the place you occupy be far removed from the first, you will support with the best of your abilities others, who, from whatever circumstance, may happen to take the lead, you will not suffer even the consciousness and the certainty of your own superior talents to urge you to do anything which might by possibility be injurious to your country's cause. You will be forbearing under the aggressions of ignorance, conceit, arrogance, and even the blackest of ingratitude supra, if by resenting these you endanger the general good, and, above all things, you will have the justice to bear in mind, that the country which gave you birth, is, to the last hour of your capability, entitled to your exertions in her behalf, and that you ought not, by acts of commission or of omission, to visit upon her the wrongs which may have been inflicted on you by the envy and malice of individuals. Love of one's native soil is a feeling which nature has implanted in the human breast, and that has always been peculiarly strong in the breasts of Englishmen. God has given us a country of which to be proud, and that freedom, greatness, and renown, which were handed down to us by our wise and brave forefathers, bid us perish to the last man, rather than suffer the land of their graves to become a land of slavery, impotence, and dishonor. In the words with which I concluded my English grammar, which I addressed to my son James, I conclude my advice to you. With English and French on your tongue and in your pen, you have a resource, not
Be just, be industrious, be sober, and be happy, and the hope that these effects will, in some degree, have been caused by this little work, will add to the happiness of your friend and humble servant, W.M. Cobbett. Kensington, TH August. Discover Free EDU City would like to thank Microsoft's Zero Desktop English in Balboca. This way to Microsoft.com. Used with permission from Microsoft for school-related projects.